Today we're explaining 17 insane One Piece theories that'll make your head spin. You'll find out exactly what Luffy's secret dream is which has been hinted at many times throughout the story. You'll see why Inu could have the most overpowered devil fruit, the space space fruits. And I'll even convince you that Blackbeard will be One Piece's final villain, even after Emu. But before we dive in, I just want to say thank you for every single person who supported us throughout the last two years. Consider this a two year celebration because we began focusing on taking YouTube seriously in early 2020 where I teamed up with Wizard of Wars. Together, our goal was always to bring you the best One Piece videos possible. This year, we finally reached our goal of 50,000 subscribers, and all of our success is thanks to you guys. So whether you've been here since the very beginning, or you just discovered our channel, thank you genuinely from the bottom of my heart. This channel has impacted our lives in so many positive ways, and every single like, every comment, every ounce of support is truly appreciated. Now, think of this video as a video that you could put on in your Watch Later playlist, and always come back to any time you're in the mood for a good One Piece theory. Go ahead and put this video on in the background while you're working or at the gym or even when you're about to sleep. And I know it's already a very long video, but Wizard of Wars will be dropping a separate part 2 video with his best theories. So make sure that you subscribe and hit that bell like Luffy and Skype here for part 2. Blackbeard's goal is to mirroring but also contrasting Luffy's dream in a crazy way. By the end of this video, you'll know what I just said as well as both Luffy and Blackbeard's dreams. Yes, you read the title right, Luffy will team up with Blackbeard. This is the One Piece team up no one's expecting, and trust me, I know it sounds crazy, but today I'll explain how and why Luffy and Blackbeard will defeat Emu together, how the entire One Piece story has been setting this up, and I promise that by the end of the video, it will all make sense. Before we jump in, leave a like, these videos take a ton of time, research, and hard work to make, and it really does go a long way to help us out. So first off, let's look at Blackbeard himself. He's a man who's always been the opposite yet the same to Luffy. Of course, it sounds crazy for these two to team up because in Luffy and Blackbeard's very first meeting, we see their vast differences. Luffy being disgusted by Blackbeard's favorite mock town cherry pies and Blackbeard being disgusted by Luffy's favorite drinks. Also, I just want to point out how funny it is that Oda in a SBS once said how Luffy's least favorite food are cherry pies, but specifically the ones that Blackbeard liked. And so yeah, it is clear that they're opposite, but one crucial piece of interaction is their similarities. Blackbeard and Luffy are so opposite and so different, yet also so eerily similar, making Blackbeard Luffy's greatest foil. You know, right when they drink and eat these drinks and pies, they begin competing with each other immediately over who will buy more food, showing their very competitive, childish, and petty nature. I mean, Blackbeard is shown many times laughing in the face of Joy Boy, and despite this, Luffy just stands there silently. It feels like these two are over grown pirate children who were always destined to fight. But then again, Blackbeard believes in ambition, he believes in dreams, it was Blackbeard who said dreams never die. Something that we've never had to take for granted with Luffy, a man who always believes in his dreams and continuously achieves what people like Bellamy would claim was impossible. And then it was Blackbeard of all people who believed in Luffy and believes in the great pirate mysteries like the One Piece. It was Blackbeard who was so genuinely hyped and excited when he met Luffy again in Impel Down, saying you did visit the Sky Island, I was right, it did exist. So how do we get past Luffy and Blackbeard's pride? I think the answer is a lot more simple than we realize. But before I reveal this, make sure you subscribe if you're not already. I've been working on a massive Wano review, analyzing and giving my thoughts on the entire arc. It's already a 50 plus page script and I haven't even mentioned Zoro vs King or Gear 5 yet. So if you like long in-depth content, you're not gonna want to miss that. And so hit that bell like Luffy and Skypea to be notified every time we drop. A while ago, I made an entire video about Blackbeard and Luffy Luffy being two sides of the same coin, both representing freedom, but Luffy being the symbol of liberation as the warrior of liberation sun god Nika, and Blackbeard being a symbol of anarchy with absolute chaos and destruction ensuing through his Yami Yami Nomi, the darkness fruit, and the Guda Guda Nomi, the quake powers. And so in this context, teaming together, Luffy putting his pride aside to defeat the world government, Emu who upholds the celestial dragons foundations and liberates the world from corruption from 800 years of deception. I think it really rests on Luffy because we've seen time and time again how selfless Luffy is, always saving others. Even if he says he doesn't want the recognition as a hero, he's truly only doing it from the goodness of his heart. But then if we look at the chaos that ensues symbolized through Blackbeard, he is someone seeking power. 
But with Blackbeard, we've even seen him have the balls to ask the world government to make Hachinosu a pirate kingdom, and references this as his dream, implying his ultimate dream is to be the king of a pirate kingdom. But then remember what Shang said to teach about Whitebeard? He mentions Blackbeard's ambition that he'll never stop, a man always chasing bigger and greater goals. So if being a pirate king, an actual ruler of his own nation is the first step, his ultimate ambition would be to conquer the entire world, sitting upon the throne atop the world and create a full-on anarchy era. Blackbeard once said, it's time for my era, and his era would be destruction, destroying the current system, chaos and darkness, but also true piracy, a full-on pirate era flipping the world entirely upside down. This is Teach's motivation to defeat Emu, while Luffy is the opposite of Teach, saying that he doesn't want to actually conquer anything, he just wants to be the freest man on the sea. If we consider the dynamic between Teach and Luffy, we can assume their ambitions are both grand, they're both wild dreams, similar yet different. I believe Luffy and Blackbeard both share the same dream, to create a pirate paradise, a kingdom of pirates, the difference would be their vision for the kingdom, as well as their interpretation of the title of the king of the pirates. <laughs> If Luffy is compared to Roger, and we know Roger said that he wished he could see Joy Boy Zero, and we know he was so excited for Joy Boy to return, that means Luffy as a new Joy Boy will have to recreate this era as the modern day Joy Boy. And then we could look at Blackbeard closer to the modern day Zebek instead of Roger. And remember, Rock's D. Zebek's ultimate goal was to become king of the world. And this could imply that Zebek learned the truth about Emu and the throne and wanted it for himself, since he was described as the man who attacked the world government like a terrorist organization with his powerful crew. So that could be the similar motivation for Blackbeard going to war with Emu in the very end of the series. But now let's go back to Luffy. But first, make sure you like the video if you've enjoyed it so far. So Luffy already established his tendencies and willingness to attack the Celestial Dragons. I mean, he straight up pummeled Charlotte at Sabaody, and he was disgusted with the Celestial Dragons even before that. We know that Emu and the Godose killed King Cobra, who is Vivi's father and a friend of the Straw Hats crew. And Luffy's taken down Doflamingo in a faded battle against the gods. And let's not forget about how Zoro was willing to slice up Charlos even before. And Zoro points out that if Luffy didn't punch him, he would have. Then there's the Straw Hat Grand Fleet, Sai and Leo in their Luffy element, announcing to the world that we just murdered a Celestial Dragon, and that's on game. Paralleling Luffy's infamous punch at Sabaody and taking it up a notch further. How Sai and Leo have a stronger punch than Luffy? I mean, yeah, don't ask me. But anyways, since this was also during an attack from his father's organization of revolutionaries against the world government and the Celestial Dragons attacking Marijua, I could see the world seeing this as a coordinated attack from both. But the biggest foreshadowing to Luffy charging into Marijua was right before Egghead, where Luffy shows he was ready to charge head first before even knowing what happened with Vivi. The only reason he didn't was because Zoro stopped it with some of the dumbest Zoro logic I've ever heard. Attacking Luffy where it hurts bringing up Ace's death and for some reason making the dumbest comparison putting Ace a powerful commander compared to the weak Princess Vivi. Anyways, Zoro's idiotic logic aside, my point is that Luffy's charge will be an aggressive charge with the entire Grand Fleet at his side, and many other allies as well. Once Sabo tells Luffy about what really happened at the Reverie, this will launch the chaotic invasion that was foreshadowed before Egghead, especially if Vivi becomes a straw hat. I personally I don't think Vivi can join the revolutionary since Sabu is seen as the man who killed Cobra to the world. He's accepted the role as Flame Emperor despite not caring too much about it. He's willing to take on the fame and become a symbol for the world. And in that case, Vivi joining up with Sabu would not be a great look for the movement. In a way, it's beneficial for the revolutionary's movement with the world believing Sabu really killed Cobra. And plus Vivi, she's really a straw hat already in our hearts, so her joining just kind of feels right. With Emu hunting her down and sending out search parties for her, there's no way she survived with Morgans. So maybe Emu really does capture Vivi and this is what triggers Luffy to attack. Or maybe simply by Vivi, Sabo, and Luffy all reuniting and learning the truth about what happened, this could be what sparks their attack. Now going back to Blackbeard again, we know his decisions are a lot more carefully planned than Luffy charging headfirst into Marijua. You know, with Blackbeard tactically planning crazy devastating losses for the world government, he also has Kuzan in his crew so this could do serious damage for the world government. Because I'm sure the former admiral knows so many secrets and the 
ins and outs of Marijua and the world government as a whole. So combining Kuzan's knowledge with stuff like Shiryu's invisibility powers and stealthing their way into Marijua, we have an insane great stealth operation here. And that would be also cool getting a stealth operation from Blackbeard's side, the complete opposite of Luffy charging in head first. I mean, even Luffy back in the Jaya arc stealthily snuck into the world lore meeting. Blackbeard and Luffy are two sides of the same coin. And most importantly, both Will of D members of this era who are fated to go up against the world government and the celestial dragon specifically. And with Blackbeard also sharing the D initial, we can assume he'll play a big role in the final war and the downfall of the celestial dragon since they're both the natural enemies of the gods. And I really love this idea of Blackbeard and Luffy and maybe even Monkey D Dragon, these D members charging into Marijua, bringing down the downfall of the world. Because back in Marijua, these are terrifying boogeyman like figures. And so on this day, could you imagine that terrifying prophecy finally being brought into reality? As they see these two absolute psychos laughing with a loud crazy Z ha ha and the other with a confident ha ha ha. It would just be so great to see the celestial dragons crying and cowarding in fear as their childhood horror stories are now being brought and fully realized in real time. I mean this would have to be traumatizing like no other situation could. After taking out the fodder celestial dragons and the world government's fodder armies, with stuff like Conqueror's Hockey and Blackbeard's Crazy Devil Fruit Hacks, the Holy Knights and the Admirals and the Gorosei all stand in the way. You know, Fujitora made a joke about turning the Celestial Dragons into dinosaurs, pulling out a meteor out the sky and launching it into Marijua's battlefield during the Reverie. But in this situation where Marijua is being invaded at this scale, I don't think the Admirals will hold back. Fujitora can really go all out, fighting against the pirates but simultaneously aiding in the destruction of the Holy Land. And you also know that Prejudice Greenbow is going to be heated. So there's no chance that he's not going to be unleashing against all of these pirates. I would really love to see Sanji and Zoro wipe the floor with these old men because by that time I suspect they'll be much stronger than the admirals. Since Zoro's final fight will be against someone like Mihawk who I personally rank a lot higher than someone like Fujitora for example. Now I don't want to get too far into power scaling especially with these next characters like the Holy Knights and the Godose because we really haven't seen much of them. But let's just be real they're going to be powerful. And actually once we get to see a little bit more of the Go to say, I do want to make an entire video on how strong the Go to say are, so subscribe for that. But one thing I really want to see are the revolutionaries specifically taking on the Holy Knights. You know, maybe Shanks fights Figurelin, and then we get like a Kizar versus Ben Beckman matchup that we've all been wanting to see since Marine Ford. <laughs> But once we reach the Godose, I've always wanted to see Dragon solo them even for just a brief moment. I just think the idea of Dragon the Revolutionary 1v5ing the One Piece's equivalent of the Illuminati would be the hardest moment ever. But if we're being for real here, Zoro and Sanji could also help out here, especially with that swordsman Godose who just seems like a perfect fight for Zoro. And then there's also Sabo who's likely going to be facing the Godose or the Holy Knights, really either one. And how I'd even love to see Monkey D Garb in this fight against the Godose. Old man versus old man giving a helping hand to dragon plus we just know how much guard pays the celestial dragons and being a d member it just seems like something that could happen towards the climax of the war against the celestial dragons but then there's also fleet admiral sakazuki also known as akainu and oh boy akainu is someone who everyone wants a piece of kuzan sabo luffy dragon and garp and the list just continuously goes on and on so let me know in the comments who do you think will fight akainu in his final moments of the series i'll let the comment section pick this one but i would wouldn't be surprised if multiple characters get to clash with this man because think about all the personal and emotional damage he's caused throughout the story. While all of this is going on, it allows Luffy to push towards the main event, Luffy versus Emu. So Luffy will fight Emu in this destined clash, Joy Boy an eternal figure. You know, here a look once said, when does a man die? A man dies when he's forgotten. If the spirit of Joy Boy and the will of D is carried for hundreds of years, culminating to this one final fight. It could explain why the Celestial Dragons fear the D-Clan so much, since their philosophy could be inherited will, never dying and carrying on the ideals and legacy of the previous generations, accomplishing the dreams that those of the past could not achieve. Luffy is the man Roger and the entire D-Clan have been waiting to reawaken the spirit and legend of Joy Boy. And I love how the D-Clan, even with their own people not knowing the meaning of their names, never died, showing how the will of D is truly immortalized as long as there's people to kill 
carry on their will. It's really a poetic ending to the Destin clash against Emu, since the spirit of Joy Boy, the man Emu fears most, is still alive after all these years. You see, when you look at Joy Boy, he's immortal, but so is Emu, he's literally immortal. And it's such a great foil to Luffy as Joy Boy since Emu is forgotten. In the shadows, someone who's literally immortal, however no one even knows about his existence. Emu was wiped away from the world who no one knows exist. In other words, Emu, someone who is literally immortal but not immortalized. And then Luffy, someone who's not physically and literally immortal but someone immortalized throughout history, representing immortality in a much more metaphorical sense as Joy Boy, as someone who carries on the will of D for generations. What amazing storytelling Oda's crafted between these two characters. And to make it hit even harder, even Emu is still holding onto that giant straw hat, proving that Joy Boy really has never truly died because, once again, he's never been forgotten. Even Emu can never forget Joy Boy, the truth of Joy Boy's legend and legacy, and he fears the day Joy Boy returns. I mean, let's be real here, Joy Boy actually lives rent-free forever in Emu's head. Luffy being this white, bright, hopeful symbol of liberation, and Emu being this dark, evil, mysterious, demonic figure also makes for a perfect contrast. I love how Sabo even describes Emu and the energy coming from the throne room as absolutely sinister, evil, and essentially the demonic presence. It's so crazy to have this twist where the people running the entire world are these demons, these monsters, and those who are hailed as gods, truly exposing them for the demons they are. And it really makes me wonder about the message Oda is sending here. Is Oda really telling us more about our real world, making a statement on the states of elite rulers who pull the strings from the shadows? Maybe in Oda's opinion, these people are truly evil, like Emu in the Gorose, making world-changing decisions from the shadows all along. With the Gorose being the One Piece's Illuminati, I wouldn't be surprised if this is one message you could take from One Piece's final saga. Another thing I love about Luffy versus Emu is Luffy's pure-hearted childish nature versus Emu's evil corruption. They really cancel each other out, but ultimately Luffy's powerful hockey presence could hold his own even against the most evil of opponents, which I think is another great message for the Shonen series. You know, if Luffy is Joy Boy, this childlike boy, it would be creepy as hell if Emu was an immortal child. And to contrast to Joy Boy, many have speculated that Emu has been a female for years now. Now, I'm not 100% sold on this, you know, Oda has shown us more feminine designs for male characters like Cavendish, for example, so maybe Emu will be a male with more feminine qualities like Cavendish. But I do see how Emu could potentially be a woman as well. Personally, I'm leaning more towards a figure that transcends human gender completely. Someone that really transcends humanity altogether as well. Truly a demon. Or maybe some kind of being that was created during the void century. And that would really make more sense because the Godose worship Emu really like a godly figure. Someone a lot more alien or futuristic. Or I guess in One Piece's case, more ancient. I also think that it would be perfect to see Luffy versus Emu because we know one thing Luffy hates is cowards. And it seems Emu is the biggest coward in the world. I mean, he's afraid to die, so there alone, that's already one thing. And ever since the beginning of the story, he genuinely hated that Shanks looked like a coward against the Mountain Bandits. In the very first chapter, we see Luffy just absolutely cannot stand cowards. He genuinely hates Kobe's cowardice and tells him straight up to his face that you are crybaby coward. Same with Wimpy Oshi. I mean, the list just really never ends with this guy. <laughs> Luffy does not tolerate cowards. In fact, he inspires cowards to become more brave. I mean, even Nami, who is not even that strong, had the balls to believe in Luffy's greatness and say that he would become the pirate king to Oti's face. Really an act of bravery and confidence. And if we think about what Emu's been doing for hundreds of years, hiding away history, ruling from the shadows, eliminating those who come even close to the truth, and remaining unknown to the entire world. In Luffy's eyes, I'ma tell you straight up, these are all acts of the world's greatest coward. All acts determined through fear. Fear of the truth being exposed. Fear of dying. Fear of going back to a time like Joy Boy's era. And fear of facing the entire world. And because this is what Luffy hates more than anything, on top of this natural hatred for the celestial dragons, he will not allow Emu to run this world. The contrast of Luffy's white rubbery powers against Emu's shadowy arrows will also be one of the coolest action sequences. You know, before it was revealed that Lelucia was not directly Emu's powers, we actually predicted that way back. And we had the exact same logic and thinking as Dragon. You know, why did they never use this before? We even said Vegapunk was the one who created this. And I like this a lot more because it makes more sense for the story, but also it makes
makes it where emu is not just completely broken and so one thing i want to ask you in the comments is how do you think emu will fight what do you think his powers will be and so with everything i've just told you this leads me to the biggest reason that i even came up for the idea of luffy and blackbeard teaming up emu has to die there's just no way we get this far into the story having this figure who's immortal and continue to live but luffy doesn't kill or at least he's not someone who we've ever seen kill unless kaido is dead which is possible we know that luffy does not murder anyone with the intention of killing oda once stated in a sbs that the reason for this was that luffy lets people live because he's giving them another chance to chase dreams but emu i'm assuming has already accomplished his dreams but still i don't think luffy will kill emu and so this brings me to blackbeard because blackbeard quite frankly is someone who we've seen kill his own brother i mean this guy killed the man who took him in as an orphan so simply if it furthers his ambition and desires blackbeard will absolutely kill emu and just like luffy is the complete opposite of emu of course blackbeard would be a lot more similar to emu the theme of darkness the history of them both scheming and conniving the idea of blackbeard remaining in the shadows of whitebeard until the right time to strike and emu hiding in the shadows for hundreds of years plotting in the ambition of true power they both want the throne for themselves to become king of the world it would be interesting if emu already achieved his dream 800 years ago especially since emu's name mu also has a connection to the meaning dreams so it makes you wonder what was emu's dream was it really to just create the world that we're currently witnessing today the dream and ambition to become king of the world and create this world government an organization to demonize pirates going back to blackbeard and emu's similarities the most terrifying aspect to all of this is how perfect emu's devil fruit powers seem to fit with blackbeard as he's already the man of darkness with the one fruit he's always wanted the yummy yummy nomi which he claimed was the most powerful fruit you know emu seems to have shadows as a main core component to his powers so what if the shadows are similar to how luffy's zone fruit has the elements of rubber we know there's already a shadow fruit and mori and emu have so many parallels for example the giant creepy castle the giant freezer that exact same sequence and scene walking into the freezer both carrying luffy and then now they both have these shadow powers so it would make a lot of sense that emu just had a much better devil fruit compared to moria's an upgraded and enhanced version of the shadow shadow nomi or maybe you know the shadows being the element of some kind of mythical zone a demonic monster or you know i talked to sai and he explained to me that he believes emu could have been the devil devil fruit which honestly is just such a cool idea and could explain the presence that we saw coming from emu that sabo mentioned also blackbeard getting a mythical zone fruit will give him one of each three types of fruits a logia a paramecia and a zone but whatever this fruit is the point is that blackbeard's yami yami no me pair but they would be too perfect but also ridiculously overpowered and completely broken and so i think you see where i'm going with this i cannot see luffy killing emu even if he is the most evil person to exist in the one piece world so i think luffy would defeat emu but not fully end him if you know what i mean and this is where blackbeard steps in similarly to marine ford we've seen blackbeard wait for the perfect opportunity to strike he even took whitebeard's fruit after he attacked him at his weakest point after whitebeard fought at kainu and the entire marine's forces blackbeard here would be acting in his true nature that we've seen so far someone who takes advantage of luffy doing all the dirty work for him and then to skyrocket in strength and power he finally fully finishes off emu and takes this power for himself <laughs> Oda said, we're going to find the One Piece at the very end of One Piece. And this is how this could play out. Because now it's time for Luffy to overcome his true greatest enemy. Not Emu, but the only other D member who can truly challenge him for the title of the King of the Pirates. While they both race for the One Piece. And that is Marshall D. Teach. <laughs> You might be thinking, isn't this a video about Luffy and Blackbeard teaming up? And yeah, it is, but let's be real. As much as Luffy and Blackbeard could take down the world government and Celestial Dragons together, they're also destined to fight at some point. We've talked about the similarities, but we cannot ignore their stark contrast. I mean, the whole point of Blackbeard really is a foil to Luffy, and I would argue one of the greatest foils in fiction. And so do you really think Luffy's just gonna sit around and let this evil monster of a man, Blackbeard, conquer the world and mold it to its liking? Wrong. Luffy has dreams of his own. He has his greatest ambitions, but now Blackbeard is the biggest enemy standing in his way. And the exciting thing about standing at the very top is that the P gets smaller because there's really only room for one. I know you thought this was an emu video, but it really started as a Luffy and Blackbeard video and so really only right to end it that way. Many fans believe emu will be Luffy's final antagonist of the entire One Piece story, but with the way things are heading, it's looking as if the world government is next on Luffy's list of enemies. And I know Oda could change his mind and I know that he said things before 
before that didn't happen in the story but if we're going to take out his word for it where he says the one piece and lap two will be at the very end of the story then we can see the ending of one piece playing out way differently than many fans expect as it seems that many fans expect luffy finding the one piece to be the catalyst itself that sparks their attack towards marijua and so now that you understand this and how i've already explained how i believe blackbeard and luffy will team up against emu let me tell you how i think the final phase and the actual ending of one piece will take place and i'm gonna call this the one piece saga a final battle for one piece buggy said that they could race to search for the one piece without fighting the yonko crews but honestly at some point these yonko crews will have to phase and it seems like oda really loves the idea of this battle royale i could even see blackbeard defeating shanks as they're overwhelming him with this third new devil fruit but let's also think about what happens if blackbeard defeats emu takes the throne for himself and takes over the entire world government blackbeard would have a true empire on his hands his fleet would be essentially whatever remains of the world government plus his own crews and any other allies that his fleet has gathered up to this point he'd be ruling out of fear there'd be so many kingdoms following his orders and this is where kuzan's dream comes in because i think i've actually figured out what kuzan's dream has been since the very beginning of the story but first if you want to help support our channel by going above and beyond one way to contribute to us going full time on youtube is by dropping any donation amount with a super thanks comment we've been getting a lot more of these lately and i can't express how grateful i am that we get to make one piece theories for you and make a living off doing this seriously thanks for all the love and constant support i believe kuzan was so upset by sakazuki defeating him because i believe kuzan was always aiming for the seat of fleet admiral for his entire marine career he was recommended for this position by sengoku and garb but i think deep down it's always been his ambition and that's why he left the marines not only because he didn't want to take part in sakazuki's form of justice but also because his dream was stolen from him when he lost that 10 day battle i mean sakazuki sent this man to spiral into a sad alcoholic state late nights drinking at bars and thinking nothing about his fat l you can see just how important this fight was to him and how it shattered him at his core kuzan seems like a lazy man but this was that one time when he truly went all out for something so what exactly is kuzan's dream i believe kuzan's dream was to always become fleet admiral or more specifically to rise to the top of the marine ranks and change the marines by molding it to follow his sense of justice i explain all of this much more in depth in my kuzan analysis where we dive into what his motivations goals and belief system is and why kuzan's dream aligns with blackbeard's goal is to conquer the world as he would be the man who would lead this new army of marines if we think about akainu he's already done something similar as jinbei states the marines have never been as tenacious or as powerful as they are under akainu's leadership of absolute and thorough justice so with blackbeard conquering the world let's say kuzan is now the new leader of the army or whatever it's left of it this is now true wealth fame and power for the blackbeard pirates but just in a different way than we envisioned for luffy and this could also be where we see luffy's allies activated for his grand fleet with many new additions like the kuja warriors the alabasta kingdom a new marine faction under kobe and a marine to oppose the blackbeard's rulership and many other characters that we love like yamato the wano samurai and the list just goes on and on luffy has accumulated many allies over the years as he's liberated countless people and came in clutch to save the day multiple times and this would also be rewarding since the world might not even know of the extent of luffy's actions for example the alabasta event was brushed under the rug as a marine victory stopping crocodile when in reality alabasta's people and some people like smoker know the truth so now this becomes an all-out war for the title of the king of the pirates luffy and his countless allies versus the blackbeard's empire and whoever wins can accomplish their dream of creating a true pirate kingdom to their liking it's time for some one piece theories because of one piece's decade-long mysteries and tendency to drop clues and hints foreshadowing reveals years in advance one piece theories have become a core part of the one piece community we all love a good one piece theory some of us like a more plausible theory that seems so likely and jam-packed with foreshadowing and evidence that it feels like whoever came up with it has oda's leaked script in their back pocket others are so wacky insane ridiculous and completely out there but somehow still make you think you know what it's just so crazy that it could be true and as you can tell by some of our hours of theory videos on our channel we love one piece theories as well we love making them we love watching them and we love discussing them you know i know this might sound corny but the one thing about making a one piece youtube channel that i love even more than theories is the friends i've made along the way of course you guys but also so many amazing one piece content creators and this is where i came up with an idea what if i did one or sized mega collab where i reach out and get one piece creators to each present one theory to create the greatest one piece theory video ever so without further ado i present to you 10 insane one piece theories featuring the best one piece theorist this first theory comes from a very special guest an amazing energy and positive light 
on the entire One Piece community. Every time I've spoken with her, she's always been so kind. And when it comes to theories, she's one of the most underrated in the One Piece community. So let's check out what Joy Girl has cooked up for us. The Gorosei and Imu have been the source for many a speculation over the years, especially when it comes to their strength and abilities. But with recent reveals hinting at the nature of their insane powers, there has never been a more perfect time to wonder what sort of abilities these scary figures are hiding. Chapter 1085 in particular, sparking a number of theories such as that Imu can either control ink or shadows, or the reveal of all the Gorosei's planetary names in chapter 1086, leading some to believe this will mean Imu represents the Earth. But I have another idea in mind. Hello my Nakamotachi, this is Joy Girl, and my latest theory is that Imu has the space base fruit. We've recently discovered that Imu refers to themselves in third person. The term Mu meaning void, emptiness, or nothing. And in my opinion, one way that this could be interpreted is that Imu represents the void, but by that, I mean Imu represents the vast expanse of outer space, which after all, is an almost perfect vacuum, nearly void of matter. Let's take a look at that word, vacuum, shall we? Because I think this is the most perfect way to describe what we witnessed during the scuffle at Marajoie. Sabo goes for the attack, his flames making a beeline towards Imu, only for his flames to quickly disappear, almost as if Imu devoured them. And well, if Imu's ability is in fact space-related, thereby meaning he is a near-perfect vacuum, devouring Sabo's flames sounds just about right. The incredible low pressure and absence of oxygen means that most elements and organisms, including fire, cannot survive in space, which would be fitting for an evil guy like Imu, who is increasingly giving final boss. In fact, in a world like One Piece where we have countless elemental based abilities, a power inspired by space seems to be the perfect way to rule over all those abilities. This would also obviously mean that the planetary theme we have with the Gorosei and the ancient weapons is still relevant, or even Luffy's sun god <laughs> devil fruit. And here's where things get really interesting. While outer space can be a very ominous, overwhelming force that not much else can overcome or survive, something that is able to withstand the extreme environments of outer space and is an important element used for aerospace inventions is rubber. In fact, a refinement of synthetic rubber was a big factor in making it possible for humans to reach the moon, meaning that Imu's natural enemy would be none other than Monkey D. Luffy with his Gomu Gomu no Mi. And if we're to look at it from a space perspective, Luffy's devil fruit as sun god Nika is also relevant, because the sun is the brightest natural object in our solar system, providing light against the dark, limitless expanse of space. Meaning that as the holder of a devil fruit that has both the elastic properties of rubber and an awakened form of the sun god Nika, Luffy definitely would be the biggest threat against Imu and their space-related abilities. And isn't that a new way to consider what the Gorosei meant when they said that Luffy has the most ridiculous power in the world. But that's it from me. We'll see how long it takes for Imu's power to be fully revealed. Thank you so much, Joy Girl. I really do like that theory. And I know, I know you said Imu is giving final boss energy, but I can't help but to wonder how crazy it would be if Blabbeard got his hands on this space space fruit as his third and final devil fruit, taking it from Imu and pairing it with his yami yami no me. Because that would be busted. But regardless, I love the idea of a space fruit and it just makes sense for it to be in the hands of someone as powerful like Emu. Up next we have an amazing friend of the channel. A lot of you guys don't know this but I've known this man since very very early in his YouTube journey and he actually edited for me when he first got started. I'm forever grateful to him because quite frankly his editing is fire. I consider him a friend, someone I can always go to advice for on YouTube related topics and someone who has a great mind when it comes to One Piece theories. And it's been amazing seeing his channel grow from less than a thousand subscribers to where he's at now. I present to you Dak Sake. The theory that I'm going to talk about is why Pluton is a mole. If you haven't heard this before, then you're probably wondering how that can even be true when it was said to be a battleship capable of destroying an island in a single blast. But the truth is that a ship is anything that can get you island to island. I mean, just as San Juan Wolf, whose epithet is literally the colossal battleship. He is a giant who ate the huge, huge fruit 
which allows him to walk on the bottom of the ocean somehow, thus earning him that name. Plus, Sukiyaki said that Pluton was sleeping under Wano, which hints right away that Pluton should be a living thing. But why a mole? Well, one of, if not the best way to travel in One Piece is by digging underground. You get to avoid all the crazy weather as well as anyone sailing on the sea. We saw this during Gadatsu's cover story with a giant mole named the Boss of the Earth, whose name in and of itself could be a foreshadowing for the god of the underworld, Pluton. But Gadatsu was able to ride this mole from Ukari Island to Alabasta by digging underground. Taurus even used the tunnels afterward because Ukari had hot springs there and people wanted to visit, and this eliminated the need to worry about traveling over the open seas. But what's interesting about this mole is that his helmet had Mount Fuji on it in front of a traditional Japanese sun, the same one that you would see on the Red Rising Sun flag. And the fact that Mount Fuji is there is really interesting because, like I mentioned earlier, Earlier, Pluton is currently sitting under Wano, currently sitting under what's really called the Mole Port, or Mogura Port in Japanese. This is the port that was deep beneath Wano that helps ships avoid going up the waterfall. And if you think about it, this port must be the oldest one out of all of them, because we know that Wano flooded over time forcing them to build settlements up above that we saw throughout the arc. So that port that's down below was probably needed first in order to take supplies, ships, people, etc. up to those new settlements to build the other ones in the first place. I wouldn't be shocked if they just named the port after the giant creature beneath them, the one who seemingly necessitated the walls being put up in the first place. Now, do I think it's as simple as just some kind of mole? I mean, it could be, but I think at a minimum it would be a modified mole. Either a ship with a mole devil fruit, or maybe a mole that was just modified like Laboon was. Both of these ideas kind of end up at the same point, but it's just two different ways of going about it. Because for it to be a ship, people would need to board it somehow so they can go island to island. But Gadatsu was able to do that by just jumping inside that mole's helmet. So it could be as simple as that too. I even think there's a good chance that Pluton dug tunnels throughout the world a long time ago, providing a network to travel through that's faster and safer than sailing on the sea and maybe that even had a role in how the Poneglyphs were spread throughout the world. If you want to hear more about these ideas, I do have a few videos on my channel, but the last thing I want to say is subscribe to Preach. Shout out to Deck, man. I love the theory and I can't wait to see if it comes true. All right, so this next theory comes from a man who goes by Mr. Bushido. He was actually the first I remember on our channel and I've even collabed with him a few times on theory videos. He has a bunch of interesting ideas, so shout out to him. He's been amazing and I'll be presenting this one for him as he doesn't have a YouTube channel. So this theory revolves around the idea that God Valley is One Piece's version of the Garden of Eden. We know from Kuma that the Bible exists in One Piece and many religious references throughout the entire story. A valley is a natural garden which is not produced by man, and Eden is God's territory. Now if we take the rule of three, a literary device that groups three separate things together, in one piece we already have the Adam tree and the Eve tree, two trees that are both tied to the Garden of Eden in the Bible where the story of Adam and Eve takes place. This was the story where they were the first human to aid the sinning fruit from a tree of knowledge committing the first sin. So with an Adam and Eve tree and assuming there could be one more tree with a religious connection in one piece to fulfill the rule of three what would the third tree be but well, what about an eden tree that was at god valley and tying it back to the fruit in the story what if this eden tree was the tree where devil fruits originate from or what if this is a tree that held many powerful and specifically godly fruits like mythical zones like kaido's fruit which we know that he ate at god valley that day or what if whitebeard acquired the godly power of the good of good Anomi and marco's phoenix fruit which he gave to his first mate later on maybe even luffy and Blackbeard's Nika and Yami Yami no Mi were both on this Eden tree at that one point. It's interesting that Garland Figurlin was also stated to be the king and judge of God Valley. And in the official viz, it specifically states that Figurlin was a dominating figure who distinguished himself at God Valley. But why Figurlin is so important here is because when we break down his name, it means land of figs, Figurlin. And this is another reference to Eden since the land of figs is the Garden of Eden. We can know this because fig leaves is a famous idiom that means covering up something embarrassing and this is once again going back to the story of Adam and Eve because they use fig leaves to cover up their private parts and nudity from embarrassment. 
and fig leaves are actually common and known throughout the world and is used to hide shame. Mr. Bushido explains that he believes all devil fruits once existed at God Valley. We know Roxy Zabek had a goal of conquering the world and becoming king. And we know God Valley was an event that was this huge like heist operation. And so maybe these devil fruits are what the Rox pirates were after. What if Roxy Zabek was one of the first people outside the world government to obtain a devil fruit? And after finding out about this Eden tree, he began to plan his attack directly against the world government. And this theory takes an even crazier turn with Mr. Bushido explaining the possible importance of slaves, which we know were at God Valley alongside celestial dragons. He explains how the celestial dragons may have used slaves to tend and grow these fruits. And if this theory is true, it would also explain why Garb was forced to defend celestial dragons and their slaves. Fighting alongside Figalin, because if someone as powerful as the rocks pirates got a hold of all these devil fruits, it would have been an absolute disaster. They would have way too much power and influence over the world. It would just be nuts if all the rocks pirates except Big Mom and Rox got their fruits at God Valley. And I'm assuming Rox was sort of essentially the previous pirate king before Roger and from what we saw in the anime, it seems his fleet was massive. It's also interesting if we consider Blackbeard as the modern day Zebek, like how Luffy will be the modern day Roger. And since we know Blackbeard is a devil fruit connoisseur going after specific devil fruits, it would be really interesting if Zebek also had the similar ambition and lust for powerful devil fruits as well. And I just want to add that this would be a really cool contrast if the Rocks Pirates all had Devil Fruits and then Roger, Rayleigh, Garland, Figurland, and Garb did not have Devil Fruits. Essentially, everyone who fought against them did not have fruits. Now, the one thing I disagree with here is that I don't believe the world government was hoarding every Devil Fruit here. Because we know the world government had been trying to get their hands on the Nika Fruit, which had always been avoiding them. And we also know that Big Mom already had her own Devil Fruit. And so I think with a small tweak that God Valley had many godly and powerful Devil Fruits being hidden here, it still fits with this theory and would be such a piratey story for Zabek and his crew. Overall, shout out to Mr. Bushido, I love this theory and many of these ideas. So the first person I actually asked for this video was of course the Wizard of Wars. You know, some people don't know this, but this channel is actually two people, Preach and Wizard of Wars. I seriously couldn't do this YouTube thing without him and it allows us to hold each other accountable and continue the YouTube grind together. He's a great friend and also an amazing elite tier 1 piece theorist, so I just can't wait to hear what he's cooked up for us. One of the biggest debates upon the power scaling community of One Piece is whether Mihawk does or does not have Conqueror's Hockey. Whichever the answer is, it will truly be able to tell us if he's on the same level of Shanks or not. I personally believe that he does have it and I know that that isn't too much of a complex theory or anything. However, the reasons why I believe it may surprise you since it seems Oda already told us the answer to this question back in the East Blue Saga. However, before I explain that, let me first tell you why people think he doesn't have it. So one of the main reasons people think Mihawk doesn't have Conqueror's Hockey is because he's a complete solo act. We know Mihawk for being the guy that doesn't have a single crew member and if we take a look at Conqueror's Hockey users, one of their main abilities is to be very likable and very good leaders. They tend to be the person who gathers people around and brings people together to be led by them. My argument for this with Mihawk is the fact that we don't really know if people don't like him. Like what if he doesn't have any crew members simply because he likes to roam freely by himself? Maybe he declines anyone that tries to join him because he simply likes it that way. Now another reason reason people also say they think he isn't a conqueror is because they think he has no ambition or motivation since he joined the warlords to be left alone and to live freely. Yet again, I'd counter this argument with the fact that he actually does have ambitions and actually arguably one of the greatest ambitions in the story which is to not only become but also remain the strongest swordsman in the world. I feel like his dream has already been accomplished which is to be the world's strongest swordsman which is why he seems to come off as lazy or undriven. He currently doesn't really need to prove himself to anyone so he doesn't. And so now that I explained why people believe this, now let me tell you how Oda already confirmed Mihawk is a conqueror back in Baratier. So in chapter 48, Gin from the Don Creek Pirate says that Mihawk has piercing hawk eyes, eyes that could kill with a glance. Now isn't this pretty much exactly what Conqueror's Hockey does? Don't Conqueror's Hockey users have eyes that could kill with a glance when they use Conquerors? For example, when Shanks uses Conqueror's Hockey on the Sea King of Fusha Village, he has eyes that could kill with a glance and scares off the Sea King with his glance alone. When Ray Lee uses Conqueror's Hockey, we 
we see Oda draw a panel of his eye that kills with a glance since he knocks out an entire area of fodder with his glare. Luffy does the same sort of thing in Fishman Island and knowing this, we could only assume that Gin described Mihawk as this because he witnessed his intense glance or glare that seemed to kill the entire Don Creek fleet. Let me know what you guys think about this description of Mihawk in the comments and now another reason I know he's a conqueror and on the level of guys like Shanks and Kaido is simply because he wields Yoru around. Just by its design, I know Yoru is probably the most powerful sword in the entire world. If it's not number one, then it has to at least be top three and with this, I assume that Mihawk has to have conquerors hockey just to be able to use it. The reason for this is because we see in the Wano arc that great blades can see into the swordsman and that the best blades only choose the best swordsman who best suits it. We see that Enma chose Zoro to test him and knowing this, we could only assume that the same exact thing happened to Mihawk and Yoru. Knowing that Zoro needed a bare minimum of conquerors hockey to be able to wield Enma around to his own will, Mihawk had to have had a lot more than just that to be able to wield Yoru around. The reason I think this is because we saw what Enma was doing to Zoro during the King fight when it almost killed him and remember, Enma is only a great grade blade. Imagine how much hockey a supreme grade blade and specifically this supreme grade blade drains from you and imagine how much willpower and strength you need to be able to wield one effortlessly. With this, I'd say that when Yoru chose Mihawk, he was on the level of strength of the Yonko. Mihawk had to be a mastered Conqueror's Hockey user in order to conquer such a blade. Well, Oris, that's definitely going to piss off the Shanks fanboys. And by the way, make sure you subscribe to our channel because Wizard of Voice is doing his face reveal and live reactions to chapters at 50,000 subscribers. And if you enjoyed the video so far, make sure you hit the like button. Up next, we have Hidden Island, someone who I really haven't got much of a chance to talk to yet, but he's someone who's really inspired me lately as someone who's given back in the best way possible. Recently, he's had me on his channel where he did a great job setting up and hosting an amazing One Piece charity event, raising thousands of dollars towards fighting cancer and he also likes making a one piece theory video so let's check out what he's cooked up for us today so i don't have any big major mind-blowing theories but i do have a smaller one uh that's probably going to be appropriate considering Elbaf is coming up soon. And this theory is about Usopp. It's basically about what's going to happen to Usopp by the end of the story. And the theory is basically this, that Usopp is essentially walking backwards in Nolan's footsteps. He is the inverse of Mont Blanc Noland. And whereas Noland was framed as a liar, he was a hero. He was a genuine hero and a brave warrior of the sea who was framed as a liar. We have now Usopp, who is is truly a liar who is going to have this metamorphosis and become a brave warrior of the sea or maybe he will always be a liar and by the end of the story he's going to be remembered as a brave warrior of the sea maybe the, the tall tales of Usopp will be told and people won't be able to discern whether or not they were true uh, just like with Mont Blanc Nolan where people thought he was a liar even though that couldn't be further from the truth uh, so it's going to be the inversion of Mont Blanc Nolan and I believe this means that Usopp is also going to be getting a storybook of his own but why do I think that's going to happen well basically the idea goes like this love him or hate him oda has a very clear intention with usopp's character he designed this character visually as a reference to pinocchio a very popular children's story about lying uh he referenced the boy who cried wolf in, in usopp's backstory he referenced the wolf in sheep's clothing as well through uh, Captain Kuro. And what's interesting about those two stories is that those also are part of a greater story, uh, or rather a greater subject, which would be Aesop's fables. So Aesop was a real guy who told stories back in the day. And a lot of those stories that you may recognize as like standard children's stories today, they were told long ago in ancient Greece by this man, Aesop. And that is who Usopp is based off of. So we have Aesop's fables. We have Usopp. Usopp wants to go to Elbaf, which is fables spelled backwards. I mean, the story is kind of being laid out for us, and I think the conclusion this is all supposed to lead to is that Usopp is going to have a storybook of his own. How is he going to become a brave warrior of the sea? He's going to get his own storybook, just like Mont Blanc Nolan did, because we have all these real-life fictional characters that are like these fictional liars that Usopp references in his design and in his story, and then Oda chooses to do something very interesting uh, and he introduces his own liar. He brings his own fictional liar character to the table. Mont Blanc Noland is basically the Pinocchio or the boy who cried wolf for the people of the One Piece world. They don't have Aesop's fables. They only have Usopp. And 
they only have Noland, and these are uh, Oda's versions of those stories. And Noland is his original liar's tale, used to tell children to to stay wary of liars and to not lie themselves, or else they'll be punished or whatever. You know, the standard fare, the typical type of story of this kind. I think Usopp's going to get his own story, and I think it's through that story that he's going to be immortalized as a brave warrior of the sea. Even though we who followed him through the whole adventure, we know what Usopp was really like. Just like we who also followed Nolan's adventure, we know what Nolan was really like. It may not be perfectly accurate to what the storybooks say, but it's the message that's left behind, I think, that uh, is going to impact us the most, and I think that it's the most important part of it. And Nolan's message was unfortunately tarnished. It was He was used as a, a lesson to teach people the wrongs of lying and and his story was changed to kind of fit this narrative that Nolan was a bad guy. And I think that Usopp is going to live in his shoes, except he's going to do the opposite. He's actually going to have a successful story. He's going to kind of fulfill the legacy that Nolan should have left behind. And Usopp's going to do it maybe with his own tall tales. Maybe the stories actually aren't going to be true. Uh, but at the end of the day, he's going to set a role model for people in the future for how to lie properly. What is a good liar, you know? How do you lie in a way that helps people? That, I think, is Usopp's greatest characteristic, Usopp being a noble liar. And that's why I would recommend you check out my newest theory, Usopp's Fables, The Power of a Noble Liar. I do think it is his best character trait. I think that's what Oda's going for. And I do think that at the end of the story, Usopp's going to have his very own picture book, like Vicky the Viking or whatever, and he's going to be the main character in that, in, you know, some Elbaf warrior who did a great deed and saved a bunch of people and some amazing story about some hero named Usopp. Once again, big thanks to Hidden Island for joining this theory mega collab, and I'll say that's probably the greatest Usopp theory I've ever heard. Alright, so this next theory comes from Joe School's theories on Twitter. I'll be presenting it for him, but make sure to go give I him like a follow this. over there for great One Piece theories. I'll leave the link in the description. Chapters 1085 and 1086 have recently made references back to the Obi Obi Nomi, the meaning of the initial D, and the subject of the checkered fate. Today we'll be focusing on the checkered fate, what it means, who it applies to, and what it will lead to. It would naturally seem like Law is a character who this applies to most, as it was introduced back in chapter 798 to a conversation between Sengoku and Law about Corazon. However, the recent dialogue in chapter 1086 tells us otherwise. It's actually Sabo who is at the center of this plot, so let's jump right into it. In chapter 1086, the Gorosei are speculating and theorizing on the checkered fate as one of them says, yeah, another one, the D always follow a checkered fate. From this alone, we can begin to understand that the Checker fate connects directly to the meaning and purpose of the D Clan, but does that mean that Sabo is really a D Clan member? That answer lies in the wording. It said that Sabo has the checkered fate, while well, it said that the D Clan follows the checkered fate, and this would mean that those who have the checkered fate are effectively individuals that those with the initial D seem to always end up following. I believe the significance of the Sa Debo flashback is not meant to be taken literally that Sabo is a member of the D Clan, but to indicate that it was originally possible for the leaders of the D Clan members to initiate new members, and it's implied that this is how Nefertari Lily also became a Will of D member as a parallel to Sabo. And now if we look at Sabo and Lily, they both came from a very high nobility status, but left it to join Joy Boy in the D clan. We know Sabo was friends with Luffy, and I'm assuming that Lily was also friends with Joy Boy. And Joe and I have discussed this idea, but we both agree that this scene is basically foretelling and foreshadowing that Sabo will eventually join the D clan as well similar to Lily, and through this we'll also find out what that checker fate is. Is. Personally, I believe that Sabo is already a D member, but I really love Joe's idea that this was only foreshadowing to Sabo becoming a D member at the end of One Piece. So if Sabo has the checker fate and characters like Law with the initial D always follow the checker fate, what does that really mean? The best indication that we have comes from another piece of dialogue from chapter 1085, when Emu was answering Cobra's questions about the mystery of his ancestor Nefertari Lily. It was explained that the D is the moniker or the title of the ancient enemy of the Celestial Dragons. Many people will already have noticed that this is a callback to the scene from Lost Flashback between him and Corazon, where Corazon explains that those with the D are God's natural enemy. Emu then goes on to explain that although the initial D has begun to appear more and often again, those who bear the initial D no longer understand the meaning of their own name. The word meaning comes up here both in Checker Fate's concept and the mystery surrounding the true history and the meaning of the initial D, and it's likely to be a hint that those two concepts are actually one and the same. The meaning of the Checker Fate may also be the 
those who bear will be responsible for guiding the D-Clan to learn the true history and rediscovering their name. And how could he accomplish this? Doesn't the One Piece have to be found before the truth can be learned? Not necessarily. In chapter 218, we flash back to Robin speaking with Cobra about the true history and there was supposedly the real pony glyph that would reveal the truth. It was this that originally led Cobra to wanting to question the Godosei about the pony glyphs. Much later during Whole Cake Island in chapter 846, we learned that there are 9 of these real pony glyphs and together they combine to reveal the truth. And so far we have confirmation of at least 4 of these 9 real pony glyphs, but around half of them remain to be found. And that is likely to become Sabo's main quest. In pursuing this, he would naturally end up crossing paths with Robin and Law, who both already seek this truth for their own shared dream. So Sabo's main role going forward will be to likely become a guide for members of the D-Clan such as Luffy, Law, Vivi, and to discover the truth of their name. And with Cobra's final words bringing up Vivi and Luffy having the D, and telling Sabo to tell them the truth about their connection, it seems like Sabo could be the one to bring Luffy and Vivi together. If the checkered fate is defined by those who are always surrounded by those who bear the initial D, then Robin surely can share this fate as well. Because throughout her life, Robin has been affected by Jaguar D. Sao, Monkey D. Luffy, Nefertari D. Cobra, Monkey D. Dragon, Trafalgar D. Water Law, and then also a friend of Sabo. It is no coincidence that Robin is known by the Revolutionary Army as the Flame of the Revolution, the one who's inspired the events that will eventually lead to the downfall of the world government. And this will mean that it's also not a coincidence that Sabo recently used this same phrase, the Flames of Revolution, in chapter 1083. The fact that Robin and Sabo share the association with a checkered fate and the Flames of Revolution most likely means that their main role could be what leads to an alliance among the remnants of the D-Clan to fulfill and rediscover their shared objective. This will essentially be the final stage of revolution, the foretold storm. As Law tells us again in chapter 729 that the D will always bring a storm. You see, when I talked to Joe and discussed this earlier, we agreed that it seems that Sabo essentially is destined to follow the example set by Lily and to enable the D-Clan to fulfill the task that's left in the letter. Overall, it seems like Sabo's checkered fate means that he's destined to lead the D-Clan towards the true history and rediscovering the meaning of the initial D because Sabo shares this fate with characters like Robin and together they both represent the flames of the revolution. Nico Robin we know why she's the flame as the burning of Ohara but also Sabo being a more symbolic and literal sense of the flame with his flame fruits. Guys make sure that you go and check out Joe on Twitter. He's always supported me and my channel since very early on and he's my personal favorite Twitter theorist always coming up with evidence to back up his takes and theories. Next up we have someone who I've spoken to many times and you know what I love about this person is that we could debate a theory or idea or any One Piece topic and he doesn't take it personal, we keep it civil, we always keep it moving, we always have a great conversation. Someone who appreciates an in-depth discussion where we can both poke holes at each other's ideas and usually ends up making the theory better because we both find counter arguments or ways around the point we both bring up. It's always intellectually stimulating and just so fun talking to this person about One Piece. And so I'm excited to present to you par vision this secret one piece power might have been hidden within a devil fruit awakening so the opiop no me that law has is one of the most versatile fruits in the sense that it just feels like you can do anything with it regardless of what has actually been shown especially now that law has demonstrated the awakening for his fruit where he's able to use kroom which so far involves him creating a room bubble but applying it to his sword and thereafter the sword can extend and phase through objects then if he uses shock v-ray he shoots an electric surge through the blade affecting anything he pierced i think rather Rather than all of these things being all a part of his devil fruit ability, there's actually three separate things going on. I'm not going to touch on the gamma knife shock V-Ray side of things, but if you're familiar with my channel and my hockey theories, it's self-explanatory. The two things I want to separate out was the phasing and sword extension. See what I think makes the most sense is Law's Kroom is creating a room where anything inside the bubble can phase through objects outside of the bubble. That would be a very understandable extension of Law's normal paramecia abilities, being able to extend his sword through the same ability sounds weird, especially because most of Law's OPOP abilities relate to medical procedures, and sword enlargement isn't exactly something that exists. You could explain the sword extension through another power being highlighted right now, Cursed Swords. Law has the Kikoku, an unknown grade blade that was confirmed to be cursed in the SBS. And if you've seen my previous videos, then you know what I'm getting at here. I think cursed blades are blades with special properties, like how the Enma can forcefully exude its user's hockey, but also the Sandai can Tetsu was set to cut more than it was intended. The Shusui had a similar thing that was subtly mentioned in that it felt heavy to Zoro and said that in order to properly wield it, he needed to master it. And then we get to Zombie Ryuma talking about how the Shusui would be satisfied with Zoro as its master, which in the context of what Kozuburo said 
would mean that the Shusui probably accepts Zoro. Thereafter, he just had to bend it to his will. So the heaviness that Ryuma accessed is something that Zoro was also able to access. And I know that the Shusui is not considered a cursed blade, but technically neither is the Enma. And it might be due to the fact that its wielders didn't die because of the blade itself. And so now going back to Law's Kikoku, I think through some means it's able to extend based off of Law's will because he had mastered the Kikoku. Which you're probably wondering, wait, if that was the case, why hasn't he done this before? Well, it wouldn't really benefit Law to be swinging around a massive sword. As far as cursed blades go, imagine if the blade just randomly extended during a battle. That would definitely be a way to get the user killed. So the reason why Law is finally using it is because it's in tandem with his awakening, which is perfect for his ability because his ability makes it so that the sword is rendered essentially weightless regardless of its size, because it's now in a state that allows it to phase through all physical matter. But at the same time, because of Law's combination of abilities here, he is able to use the sword and his awakening to the maximum potential. And all of this makes perfect sense to be something Oda continues to expand on as he has been doing with swords in the background, where it will most likely come together in the last saga when we reach supreme grade cursed blades like the Shodai Katetsu and other sword users like Mihawk and the Holy Knights like Figarlin Garling, further increasing the difficulty and complexity of Zoro's path towards the world's strongest swordsman, something I've discussed in my Zoro, Mihawk, and Holy Knight theories. I really like the idea that maybe the sword could sense that Law had the potential to master his Devil Fruit Awakening and therefore master the blade itself and utilize it to its full potential. It's a fire theory and I never even knew that Law's sword was a cursed blade until now. Big shout out to Parvision, go check him out. Rock's review, I'm a huge fan of his shorts on YouTube and his energy in his videos is always on point. Another person who's always shown love to us, always been very welcoming and open to collabs, so let's check out what he's cooked up for us here. Hello Preach and other YouTubers who are probably doing a way better job than me. Sorry, but I'm gonna talk about two theories. One of them, I came up with it as soon as I could have came up with it, and the other one, I did not came up with it. I'm gonna start from number two. This theory is clearly not mine because this is actually very smart. It's about the One Piece itself, and probably most of you already heard about it. You see, there is a famous prophecy that one day Luffy will destroy Fishman Island, and I believe that's true. This theory goes on to say that one day, after Luffy destroyed Imsama and the world government, he shall destroy the Red Line itself. Before doing this, he's gonna allow everybody from the Fishman Island go inside of the giant ship Noah and save all of them from the ultimate destruction. And after that, he's gonna destroy the Red Line, and since Fishman Island is under the Red Line, the prophecy will come true, and Fishman Island will be destroyed by the hand of Luffy. But after the Red Line is destroyed, all the four oceans of One Piece world, North, South, West and East, will come together. This will create an ocean that every type of fish in the world exists. This is gonna be all blue and One Piece itself. The moral of One Piece's story is a struggle between freedom and authority. Destruction of the Red Line and Four Seas coming together is the perfect symbolism for the final act of One Piece's story. And now let's talk about my own theory. If you know me and my channel, you know that I am a firm believer in Conqueror's Hockey Ultimate Supremacy. And I definitely believe that Oda is not done giving us the hype of this power. And to prove this, let's go back to chapter 10, 10. After years of waiting, Zoro finally used Asura and gave the ultimate scar to Kaido. Have you ever wondered what the hell is Asura? I mean, it's not really fair to assume. This is a type of power that only and only Zoro can use it, as if Oda created this power only for the sake of Zoro. No, this should be part of the bigger magic system. What if the final form of Conquer Saki is awakening a demon or a god inside you? And if this be true, we can have a lot of badass final attack and mythology from all around the world in One Piece. Maybe all the top gods of One Piece have one hidden god in them. Asura is a glimpse of the final form of power in One Piece world, and I believe going by evidence, this can actually make perfect sense. Because after all, only a Conqueror hockey based attack can give an ultimate scar to Kaido. So am I really delusional? 
Probably yes. Listen, Rox, that secondary was legit, man. Pretty dang good because, you know, I'm a Zoro stand boy, so I gotta say, you've got me insanely hyped for this Demon Osh or a hockey form to come true. And to all my Sanji fans, yeah, Sanji's not beating that form. This next creator has the most recognizable and distinct voice in all of YouTube history. Sometimes I just throw him on and listen to his videos like it's a podcast. We haven't spoken much privately, but he's someone who I looked up to as I was coming up in the YouTube scene as I watched him grow at a rapid rate. And that is Vin Lin D. Dragons fight for freedom, revolution. I can't wait to see the things he has done and potentially get an explanation as to why he abandoned his son as a child. Assumed since Luffy doesn't seem to recognize his own father's face. Dragon appears to have not been around for the vast majority of Luffy's life. Very similar then to Ace's relationship with his own father, Roger. Even more curious given Dragon was also at Roger's execution. But for those that like to claim Dragon is a bad father, I'd like to go over a shocking idea I introduced in the past in a video that may or may not be on the channel any longer. That Monkey D. Dragon, for all his faults as a man or a father, has actually been watching over his son Luffy all this time. I can sum it up by saying this. Just as Luffy is the sun, shining down and spreading light wherever he goes, the bringer of dawn. Just as Imu might be Mother Nature and the very sea itself, the very world, the earth. Dragon is the wind. He is everywhere, all at once. During a pull-down, chapter 539, around the onset of the Marine Ford War, Ivanko tells us that Dragon is pulling the strings behind all the revolutionaries and likely revolutions around the world. Just as the wind is everywhere. Aside from marveling at Luffy's similar willpower to his father, Luffy tells Ivanko that he was born in East Blue. This takes us to a flashback of Ivankov and Dragon. We see Ivanko say to Dragon, Whenever the wind blows, wherever you are, you're always facing the same way. And Dragon responds by saying in a dismissive fashion, whether hiding something or not, that he's never noticed that himself. While well, Ivankov suggests it could be Dragon's animal instinct, and I'd say it's Dragon's fatherly instinct, as Ivankov asks Dragon if his home is in that direction. The direction Dragon is always facing when the wind blows, that perhaps he has a family in the eastern seas, East Blue. But the conversation ends as Dragon seems awfully protective of his past and doesn't want to comment further. This takes us to a connection I made for Chapter 1, that we were in fact introduced to Monkey D. Dragon for the very first time in Chapter 1, not in Chapter 100 as some might believe. After Roger's execution, we go to another page, a small seaport, where we see Shank's pirate ship guided to a small peaceful village by the wind, the east wind that is blowing. Could it be that Dragon has always been watching over his son? The east wind we see during chapter one is the same east wind that Ivanko said Dragon is always facing. If Dragon is the wind, could he not be anywhere he wants to be? Or if you can combine observation hockey with your devil fruit as Anel did with his lightning logia to observe an entire island during Skypea, could Monkey D. Dragon combine his observation hockey with the wind to see events across the world? Wherever the wind blows, Dragon is there. And so Dragon has always been by Luffy's side. He's always watched over his son. And the fact that Oda placed the east wind by Shanks Jolly Roger in this panel here, the fact that Shanks and Roger are shown side by side in this other panel here on the screen during Roger's execution, I wonder what sort of relationship these two men have. Shanks and Dragon, one a father figure, the other Luffy's biological father. Luffy is very similar to both of these men. And so Dragon is the wind, he has always been watching over his son. We see this in chapter 99, where it seems like a bolt of lightning from a sudden change in weather saves Luffy. Perhaps Dragon brought a storm, or it really was just a lucky storm. But Dragon does save Luffy from Smoker, and it can't be a coincidence he just so happened to be at Logetown, can it, the same day as Luffy. That Dragon just so happened to run into Luffy and Smoker. And thereafter, a gust of wind blows, and a storm carries Luffy and the Straw Hats on their way. A journey that Dragon seems to approve of, since he questions what right anyone has to stop another from setting sail, from being free. Since Dragon says the day will eventually come when he and his son Luffy meet again, and given Dragon's current importance and reintroduction to the storyline via the destruction of Lucia Kingdom and Vegapunk's flashback with him and Ohara, I think that day is finally here. As we see from chapter 1078, 
that another war is about to start. The force heading to Egghead Island now is said to be on the same scale as a war. The way the scene is depicted is strikingly similar to Marine Ford, the narrator's proclamation that the conclusion of the Egghead Incident will shock the world in a way no one has imagined, and that the Egghead Incident will change the world, just as Dragon said he would one day do. Dragon's growing relevance and parallels to Marine Ford that are reinforced by Chapter 1080 and Garp's entrance to Beehive Island being similar to how Luffy fell from that ship in the sky during Marine Ford when going to rescue Ace, as we see Garp descend or jump from the ship that is flying in the air somehow, down upon Beehive Island with his galactic punch. In Chapter 539, Ivanka even hinted at the destruction Dragon would bring to Marine Ford if his son was ever in danger the combined wrath of Whitebeard and Dragon, though Dragon never showed. Now with Luffy in danger once again on Egghead Island, Oda's doing this for a reason, I believe, and I think that reason is a legendary introduction of Dragon, as he finally makes his move. The legend begins as chapter 100. When will the legend arrive? Dragon either arriving like Shanks did during Marine Ford out of nowhere, or Luffy being saved again by a bolt of lightning, or like Dragon wants it did to save Luffy from Smoker. Or maybe Dragon arriving like Whitebeard. Imagine if Dragon's ship can also fly, completing the trifecta of three monkey D's falling from the sky, if Dragon really can control the wind. Or imagine a massive storm approaching Egghead Island, since the D will always bring another storm. Imagine if the Pirate King Goldie Roger really was saved from the Golden Lion Shiki's fleet by a storm created out of nowhere by Dragon. Even if it wasn't Dragon, imagine if Dragon summons a storm to destroy all the marines and government ships currently surrounding Egghead Island. Imagine if Dragon is about to usher in the greatest storm we have yet seen in the story. But as usual, we will have to wait and see. And I actually love this theory, I also have a similar idea but a little different, that dragon represents a storm and not the wind in One Piece. But after you explain everything, I really could see it being just specifically the wind. And after watching this theory, it really just got me truly excited to finally see Monkey D dragon in the final saga. And shout out to Vinland D, make sure that you go and check him out. This next dude is a really humble guy, you know, I've gotten to speak to him multiple times, on stream, off stream. I like how he's willing to learn and ask questions to bigger creators, and if you know me, you know I love talking about anything regarding YouTube. So when this guy first hit me up asking for advice, we had a great conversation and he's always been great to me ever since. This man specializes in One Piece theories, so let's hear what Den Den Kushi has for us. Yo, yo, it's Den Den Kushi. You know what it is. We're up here with Preach, smashing the theories. So let's get straight into it. The first clue to the location of the valley is in its name. The definition of the word valley is a low area of land between hills or mountains, typically with a river or stream flowing through it. This describes the only picture of God Valley we seen. The word valley originates from Nordic myth, something we know Oda is tied to the story many times. When we look at what the word originally was, we discover something very interesting. It's a ford, spelled F-J-O-R-D, again describing a deep, narrow, elongated sea or lake with steep land on three sides. If you watch someone say ford on TV, sometimes the subtitles will still use this spelling. The English version of this word is ford, so F-J-O-R-D without the J. The definition of the word has warped over time, now being a ford is a shallow place in a river or a stream allowing one to walk or drive across. Where can we find the word ford in One Piece? Marine ford. So if valley is ford, then what about the god part of god valley? Well, for starters, Kuma was at Marine ford and he held a bible there. Luffy falls from the heavens to join the fight, a reference to descending from the heaven. Of course, Luffy was present with the song of Nika fruit and Whitebeard was present with the potential earth god fruit. Another interesting example of a god tied to Marine ford is currently in the story we have the egghead incident. 38 years before that we had the God Valley incident, and 38 years before that we had the incident with Mother Carmel freeing the Giants in 866. During this incident, Carmel infiltrates the Giants as Sister Carmel, a nun. The sun shines down on her, giving off a divine presence, and she discusses a message from the heaven. Despite the fact we get the impression from the surroundings, this is Marineford, it's never actually explicitly stated to be. This could be a big clue that at the time Marineford was going by a different name. The God Valley incident has other connections to Marine Ford, through the characters that were present at the summit. This ties to Inherited Will and the way Oda has historical events in the story reenact themselves 
for example, how Joy Boy Nolan and Luffy all free Tontatas every 400 years. At the Summit War, we had Whitebeard, Gar, Buggy, Shanks, Rogers inherit a Luffy, Zebex inherit a Blackbeard, and Kaido was said to have tried to attend also. These characters were all either at God Valley or have inherited the will of someone who was present there at one point. The whole war seems to be a runback of the God Valley incident. For example, four would-be Yonko were present at God Valley and four would-be Yonko were at the Summit War. Kobe went on to become a hero of the Marines, as we know, and Garp got that exact same name from the God Valley incident. We can also find clues in the landscape too, except for Wano, like pillars in the corner, Marine Ford is stated to be completely made out of bricks and steel, suggesting almost all of the natural features that were native to the island are now gone. In addition to this, we see this crescent moon shape as the port at Marine Ford. This matches our new friend Garling, whose hair design is also a crescent. We also see the depiction of a dark clouded sky present in both Marine Ford and the God Valley incident, and the incident in which Carmel freed the giants too. We also heard families lived on Marineford, which is another connection, as celestial dragons had slaves there and so likely also had their own families there. Slavery is another connection between Marineford and God Valley. The triangle made by Annie's lobby in Peldown and Marineford mirrors the triangular trade of the 6th century. This was the trade route used by the slaving industry in real life, and the Taraya current which controls the water inside the Gates of Justice is inspired by the trade winds. These winds enabled ships to travel much faster within the triangle. We also have the Oxloid Bell or Oxbell. This was found on Marineford and was used to ring farewell to the passing year and bring in the new year. It's heavily inspired by the real life Lutine Bell. Here's an open statement at the top of the Lutine Insurance webpage. These guys have a bad reputation for insuring the slave industry, so the Oxbell is definitely a nod to this slavery bell by Oda. Now, we know there were slaves at the God Valley incident, but if you're familiar with Denden theories, you'll know I strongly believe God Valley is where slaves were taken to be experimented on, particularly experiments dealing with lifespan and extended life. This is looking ever more likely with Darling looking like Kurei. This is where it gets wild though. Firstly, during the war, Sengoku appeared relatively calm about what was happening at Marineford and didn't seem to mind people fighting. However, as soon as Blackbeard started destroying the island itself, Sengoku freaked out and rushed to stop it happening. He says a couple red flags also, the strangest of which is, you don't know what you're doing when Blackbeard starts wrecking the ground. Mixed with his reaction, this makes for a suspicious panel for sure. Furthermore, when Akaino is smashed into the ground by Whitebeard, it's later shown he finds a tunnel underneath Marineford. This suggests there is something below Marineford itself, which I think are the ruins of God Valley, similar to what we've seen in Wano, Alabaster, and Water Seven. So, in conclusion, I think that during the God Valley incident, the island was leveled. In its rubble, the world government built Marineford. All that's left of God Valley are the four pillars of the corners of the island, and its name was changed to ensure the name would never appear on maps again. Anywho, dudes and dudettes, always a pleasure. Huge love to pre for picking this up drop a comment about what worked what didn't and i'll catch you over at den den um sub to preach do all that stuff show them the love peace great theory and i love all the connections you pointed out and after going in with an open mind i do think it's possible that marine ford is god valley at the very least i'm intrigued to see how marine ford will further parallel god valley when we learn more about the incident but guys make sure you go check out den den kushi he's a smaller creator he's a smaller channel but if you like what he said here today go to his channel show him some love and make sure you subscribe Alright, so this next guest is someone who is a true blessing in the One Piece community. I have the absolute highest of praises for this man because he's the greatest streamer in the community. You can tell this dude does everything he does purely out of love for the game. His passion, his excitement, his genuine hype, it's all so refreshing. Such a positive and kind voice in the community and anytime there's a new chapter, he's my go-to reaction streamer because his energy is goaded. A true legend and that is the GOAT, King Recon. Ever since the phenomenal, game-changing chapter, chapter 967 dropped, and we were finally treated to that wonderful panel of Roger and his entire crew laughing as they saw whatever it was that was before them that we know as the Wumpies. Ever since we got that, I haven't been able to stop thinking about how the Straw Hats are going to react once we get to Laugh Tale. And the reason for that is because really in Sub already stated that perhaps the Straw Hats are going to be able to come up with a different answer than they did. And I wonder if it starts 
with the way that they react to the events of the void century because obviously we have certain people within our crew uh, such as robin and now luffy that are going to have direct connections to the individuals in the past so i wonder i'm going to assume that oda wants to recreate that iconic panel and create a parallel with the entire crew laughing in joy as they uh, experience uh, Joy Boy's story, right? But what about if they don't? What about if we don't get a, a recreation of that panel and instead their reaction is something completely different? And that is something that was brought to my attention from Yamato reacting to Luffy's dream because once Yamato figured out what Luffy's dream was, Ace's first thing was, oh, don't laugh at that. And Yamato was like, yo, I would never laugh at such a thing. So I wonder if such a thing would play out here again, where maybe Luffy, instead of laughing, he would be like, how could I possibly laugh at something like that? Whether it be because it's a tragic tale or because, you know, perhaps something so insane was said that you know everybody started laughing like yo this guy is crazy right but maybe luffy and him will be on the same wavelength and you're like no i'm not gonna laugh at him that's my dream too or maybe you know the uh the other straw hats will look at luffy and be like yo doesn't that have something to do with your dream as well because i've always had the assumption especially after chapter 10 uh, 1060 that we might get a bigger clue towards luffy's dream based on whatever we get in the void century so the reaction to what the one piece is by the straw hats is something that i'm very very interested in because it feels like the way that they respond to the void century the way that they respond to the the one piece treasure uh the events that take place on laugh tale that is going to uh, like whitebeard said lead into what turns the entire world upside down really bringing up the possibility that they could come up with a different answer than they did what exactly does that mean right whatever that means i think we're gonna see the threads of that i mean i'm sure that the entire course of the journey is going to be the reason why they come up with a different answer but in particular, the way they respond to that voice entry flashback, it might not be the parallel that we're all expecting, as awesome as that would be. Who knows? But I just wanted to present that scenario because I, th I think it's very, very interesting for the Straw Hats to have a different conclusion or at least a different reaction to the events of the void century than that of roger which potentially is the reason why oda decided to show us the roger uh flashback first and how they react to the one piece so whenever we see what takes place with the straw hats potentially it is going to be something different of course this is going to be a monumental thing that is going to be a very joyous occasion you know and uh, the 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 quote-unquote end of this legendary adventure so of course because it's one piece uh, we're expecting it to be uh, not only just a legendary moment, but a very happy and and, uh, and and incredible scene with the entire crew all rejoicing and you know living and and, and um and uh, remembering and reminiscing on multiple different things. But I'm not gonna throw out the possibility that they react, even if it's just a little bit differently, to the events of that flashback. Listen, Recon, as a fan and as a fellow content creator, that was great. I really do think we could see a different reaction, since even Rayleigh said maybe the Straw Hats will come to a different conclusion. I think Robin is really the key because she's the most knowledgeable about history, and I feel like she could be someone who decodes a different hidden layer in the Pony Glyph's message. With her vast knowledge and as a prodigy, this will be a big moment climaxing all of her life's work, especially because Rayleigh told that to her specifically. And as a huge Robin fan, I'm all for seeing her interpretation and view on last. Too. So before I present my own One Piece theory, I just want to give a huge thanks and appreciation to everyone who participated in this collab video. This is really what One Piece is all about. Community coming together and having a fun time discussing the series that we all love so much. So make sure you go subscribe to their channels and show them some love. I'll leave the links to everyone in the description.
So the theory that I'll be presenting is a Skypea theory. Skypea was an arc that was so secluded from the rest of the world, being in the sky. And because of this, the characters in the Skypean culture have never really made a return to One Piece's story, unlike other arcs. But the biggest travesty to come from this is Dios. Dios are lost to Skypea, and they were so cool. <laughs> Being one of Skypea's own unique technology, the house were never really expanded on too much. And after Usopp used them in a couple of fights against Luffy and Perona, we never saw them again. But if you remember, Dials were absolutely broken. I mean, Wiper killed NL with the insane power of the reject dial. That was until NL literally kickstarted his own heart, flexing his godly power. If NL wasn't a broken Logia, he would have been done for. Wiper even says how the reject dial's power was so great that even he himself could die from using it. But the biggest question I have from all of this is who on earth created this mysterious technology? Where did the dial technology come from and will it ever return? Why are they only found in Skypea? In chapter 257, Gonfall speaks about the power of destruction that will be used from the powerful dial technology. He explains how a simple impact dial if used properly is enough to kill an average person. Legends tell of other amazing dials wielded by ancient warriors of the Sky Island that are far more powerful from this one. And one example he gives is the reject dial that Wiper used which Gonfo claims is 10 times more powerful than the impact dial. And the dials in this chapter are even compared to military weapons. Now in One Piece when something is called ancient, this also gets me thinking back to the Void Century. So is it possible that the dials were created during the Void Century era? A time when technology was so advanced. And so it got me thinking what if Devil Fruits are the successors to the dials? Making dials very early creations to what eventually would become Devil Fruits the ability to embody your desires through eating these perfected fruits. For years now, I've been saying that devil fruits were actually created by scientists during the Void Century, a time when technology was more advanced. And then this theory became a lot more plausible when Vegapunk explained that the ancient kingdom was a highly advanced society through futuristic technology that's been lost to history. So looking at the different dials, flame dials could potentially allow you to shoot and breathe fire by holding something specific and unleashing it when the time is right. The milky dial allows you to fly shooting air through the sky as we see Gadatsu attach these to the bottom of his shoes and shoot up in the sky like a rocket. The lamp and flash dials release light in both a controlled and explosive outburst. I could also see these become devil fruits in the future like Ace's flame fruit, Kizaru's light fruit, or Shiki's float fruit. And I know this may seem like a bit of a reach, but if we think about the shells that are tied to dials and many of these shells have a similar devil fruit like spiral look to them, maybe the shells themselves inspired the spiral design for devil fruits. Now what intrigues me is the raw potential of the dials. We can assume that impact dials was only one of these ancient dials that the warriors used, since it was the only one example we got from Gonfo, and this implies there was many many more. So with how powerful the impact dial was, imagine the other dials that could have existed 800 years ago, and how many of these could have been even leagues stronger than the impact dial. You know, back in the days of the ancient kingdom, things just seemed to be absolutely massive. I mean, we have Zunisha, a giant elephant, Shirahoshi, a giant giant mermaid princess ancient weapon, there's the sea kings, giant sea creatures who've survived the downfall of the ancient kingdom, and there's also giants and the only race of ancient giants who once existed during that era, and whatever the hell Ors and his family lineage was. And speaking of the ancient giants, did you know that the ancient giants once existed in Jaya? 400 years ago, we can clearly see this massive giant Oni, which looks something like a aura sized beast on the ancient map of Jai, which was at least 400 years old. And the reason I bring this up is because could you imagine how powerful a giant dial could be if given to an ancient giant? It could possibly have the power to potentially wipe out entire towns. These would have been true military weapons, ancient giants already being so naturally powerful, so they could withstand something like a dial. And we know Pluton was stated to have the power to one shot an island. So so I wonder what if Pluton has these giant dial-like cannons attached to it? Or maybe once Luffy reaches Laugh Tail, the crew discovers some giant cannons that excites Frankie and Usopp. We brought up this idea before in the Laugh's Tail video, but after rereading Skypea recently, it really made me wonder about the insane ancient war during the Void Century and how crazy it could have been. We've also seen how dials are so effective against enemies who can't comprehend
him what they are. For example, like in Usopp's fight against Perona. So imagine this being implemented into an actual large scale army of D Clan members back in the day against the Celestial Dragons. At the end of the day, Dials are way more mysterious than even Devil Fruits, so I really wish we get to see more of them. I want to see new, more powerful Dials and get explanations for how they work and how they're created. And maybe, just maybe, we'll see them one day if we visit another Sky Island during the post time skip era. And that island could be God Valley. What if I told you Edward Weevil was actually a failed Mads experiment, a failed attempt in cloning the world's strongest man, Whitebeard? Today, I'm going to tell you the heartbreaking story of Whitebeard, Weevil, and Miss Backen. I've spent the last 72 hours diving deep into this mystery, and it's finally time to expose everything. Let's start off by asking, who is Miss Backen? Backen is a 76-year-old woman, a former pirate, and she's also short. Odo, what is up with you making these old people shrink into these goblin elf-shaped figures? Here's my my theory for Miss Backen. She was once the scientist of the Rock's crew, similar to Frankie for the Straw Hats or Queen for the Beast Pirates. And keep this in the back of your mind for now, as it will be important later. In Chapter 1072, we received huge, shocking revelations. Stussy from ZB0 is actually a clone of Miss Buckingham Stussy, a former member of the Rock's Pirates. With all this cloning going on, legends like the Rock's crew are now involved, and you know what this means, right? Blackbeard vs. Rock, Zoro is a clone of Ryuma, and Luffy is a clone of Roger? All jokes aside, I really do think Miss Buckingham Stussy is actually Miss Backen or Buckin, depending on how you pronounce it, and by the end of this video, you'll understand exactly why. With Buckin and Buckingham sounding so similar, we have a first clue. They both had blonde hair, and finally, they were both members of the Rock's crew. This was implied when Marco stated in Chapter 909 that Miss Backen or Weevil's mother was on the same crew as Whitebeard close to 40 years ago, and what was going on nearly 40 years ago? That's right, the God Valley Incident. Once the God God Valley incident was revealed in chapter 957, the picture became a lot more clear that 40 years ago these two pirates shared some kind of history together. I know an argument against back in Stussy is the size comparison, but let's be real, if Oda could turn the masculine Yakuza Basi Okoto into a shriveled up Yoda form, then I'm sure he could do the same with a seductive Stussy where we see that Miss Backen now looks like a ball of crumpled paper right before you say Kobe. She is almost like 80 to be fair, and I think Oda just does this to exaggerate the features of his old characters. Plus, if these are two separate characters, that would mean that both Miss Bakken and Miss Buckingham Stussy were likely both on the Rock's Pirates, with Whitebeard sailing the seas around the same time, or even weirder, at separate times. So is Bakken a second cloned model of the original Stussy, or even completely separate characters entirely? Maybe they're sisters? Sure, I guess all of these options are possible, but for now so this doesn't get too confusing, and to make this video a lot more interesting than it would be otherwise, I'm going to make an educated hypothesis that Miss Bakken Bagging and Buckingham Stussy are indeed one and the same, and I'm just going to refer as the old lady that we saw with Weevil as Miss Bagging, and I'm going to refer to Stussy, the Unit 1 clone of Miss Buckingham, as simply just Stussy. All of this got my mind racing, because what does this revelation mean for Weevil? Does this mean that Whitebeard was truly Weevil's father, or even crazier, is Weevil a failed Frankenstein-like experiment gone wrong? A failure to clone the strongest man, Edward Newgate, a greedy Miss Bagging, aiming to create a power powerful and obedient child for her own personal gains. Soon enough though, you'll realize that Edward Weevil is the biggest clue tying Stussy and Backen together as the same character. But before I tell you why Weevil is a failed Mads clone of Whitebeard, make sure that you subscribe if you have not already. YouTube's notifications have been glitching out lately, so turn them off and then turn them back on and let me know if that fixes any issues. We have plenty of videos planned including theories like this, I have a Prime Kobe video in the works, Wizard of Wars is working on a mega theory if I've ever seen one. So trust me, you're gonna want to hit that bell like Luffy and Skypiea to be notified every time a new video is uploaded. At first glance, Weevil does look like Whitebeard a bit. The iconic long white mustache, that long blonde hair, and to be fair, that long blonde hair could also have came from Stussy or Miss Backen. But when you take a closer look, it's not hard to see that something is off here. Weevil looks more like a parody of a How to Train Your Dragon character rather than the masculine force of nature that is Whitebeard. If we're being 100% honest, Weevil looks a lot more like the result of Whitebeard and Queen doing the fusion dance. He's fat, he looks like a straight up bumbling idiot, and he has stitches and scars almost as if he's a thriller bark zombie. In fact, I would even go as far to say that he resembles many similarities to Mordia's Ors giant who had been transformed from the inside out. Weevil's personality seems so one node simple, and bland that I just can't look at Whitebeard and then look at Weevil without thinking that there's something seriously wrong here. And speaking of Weevil looking like Queen, it would be kind of interesting if Queen, who was a mad scientist alongside Vegapunk, once helped
to create Weevil. We could even throw in Judge here who specializes in cloning. We now know for a fact that Stussy has some past connection to the Mads with the reveal that they used her to create the first successful Mads clone. With Stussy turning on CP0 and helping out Vegapunk, it makes me wonder if we're going to see Weevil and Bakken before the end of the Egghead arc. And as wrong as this sounds, it makes Miss Bakken a lurking legend. Weevil is like a Chimera science freak, a monster that should have never been brought into this world in the first place. The experiment would have taken place before Stussy was created, and you have to imagine that it must have taken years to master the cloning technology that Judge and Vegapunk now possess. And with testing and experiments comes failures, many failed tests that came before the final result was achieved. You may see Vegapunk as this quirky, fun ally to Luffy as he's about to join up with the Straw Hats and Bonnie, but to me, Vegapunk is a lot more like a heartless, evil man, someone who's created child soldier slaves who are sold off to the government and forced into battle. We see they have personalities of their own, but imagine being brought into the world with the sole reason to fight, obey, and die. It's a sick twist of reality, but just because it's Vegapunk and just because he knows about the Void Century, he's cool with Kuma, he tells the Straw Hats about Ohara, he knows Sao, he's a fun, Einstein quirky man, so therefore we see him as a good guy. But creating a monstrosity like Weevil would really be right on brand with Vegapunk's character, as well as the entire mad scientist group. I mean, the name Mads implies that they all fit the crazy scientist trope. Vegapunk might look good in comparison to Caesar, Judge, and Queen, but that's not really all that hard to do. He's maybe the least evil of the four, but that doesn't mean he isn't a messed up guy. And with the reveal that Stussy is the first successful clone, I just want to point out some very subtle foreshadowing from Oda. During the Whole Cake Island events, we see Stussy and Big Mom speaking on casual terms, and it's mind-blowing going back and seeing this because Big Mom is seeing an old crewmate in Stussy, and this is also especially interesting from Big Mom's point of view when you consider how trippy this would be and it makes me reevaluate the entire context of Stussy being invited to the wedding. And speaking of the devil in the details, in chapter 1070's cover story we get to see what seems like the mad science group in their earliest years. We see Caesar, Judge, Queen, and even Vegapunk and they all look very young. And there's one mysterious figure whose face is not shown. Remember how I said that Miss Bakken might have been the scientist on the Rock's crew? Well, this mysterious mad member with the stockings and the hair, it does seem like this is the original Stussy. It's likely that Miss Bakken actually has this vampire devil bad fruit because it would have been part of Miss Bakken's lineage factor. And seriously guys, if I see one more sim saying something like Stussy can suck my blood anytime, you guys are down bad. But I guess Whitebeard, he might have also agreed with you in the distant past. Now I'm going to reveal to you the biggest tragedy, something so heartbreaking, something about Whitebeard that will make you see him in an entirely new light. But before that, consider leaving a super thanks in the comments of one of your hottest One Piece takes. Each super thanks will have a chance to be featured in our next video and check out our Patreon as well. Our dream is to go full time on YouTube but we need your help to make that come true. We'll make sure all the money raised through Patreon and super things go towards making our channel even better and getting out more videos on a consistent basis. It's still strange to me that the entire theme surrounding Whitebeard's character is family. Even when he set out to sea, he was made fun of by the other pirates for searching for his treasure which was a family. This was the thing that he always wanted since a young boy. To most pirates seeking gold and riches and fame, Whitebeard was just an orphan, a poor child without ever knowing his mother or father. So what makes this Weevil situation all the more heartbreaking is a few different possibilities. It's possible that Whitebeard just can't have children meaning that he's infertile. And this would be horrible as it would mean the man with the dream of a family was prevented from this reality through pure biological dysfunction. A harsh truth that he would have to come to grasp with over time and this could be a reason for Whitebeard adopting so many young orphans. It might have been quite literally his only way of starting a family that he's always dreamed of. But another tragic possibility would be that Backins left Whitebeard and took their child Weevil without ever saying a word to Whitebeard. But where this really gets dark is that in chapter 909, Marco confirmed that Whitebeard never had a family, even though he knows a Miss Backin. And so isn't it strange that Weevil only showed up after Whitebeard's death? This is the most suspicious aspect to Weevil, Whitebeard, and Miss Backin's relationship because why couldn't Miss Backins have introduced Weevil to Whitebeard sometime before when he was one of the most notorious pirates in the world. Out of every One Piece character, it doesn't make any sense that Whitebeard of all people would be a deadbeat dad, abandoning his own biological child and instead adopting dozens of hopeless children without raising his own. Whitebeard was someone who lived and died for his family and sons. And so Miss Backins, assuming that he was loaded with riches and treasure, but real ones of the Whitebeard pirates closest to Newgate know that he was pumping all of his money into his own hometown and spending the rest on booze. You can tell that she is straight up a gold digging
She even admits this in saying, what's the use in revenge? It won't get you a single berry. Money is what matters. To be fair to Baggins, she is a pirate and so this could have been seen as stereotypically piratey greed and the dream of striking it rich. But from what Oda is showing us, it seems like money and greed is all she cares about, a core part of her character as it's one of the first things we see of her. Could it be a subversion similar to Nami who we know isn't necessarily greedy with the straw hat pirates? Well, maybe. But at the moment, it's not looking good for the former Rocks pirate who seemingly hit herself and Whitebeard's so-called son from the world. Also, isn't it strange that Weevil is 35 years old, but the Rock's pirates split up after they were disbanded and defeated at God Valley, which happened 38 years ago. I guess it is possible that Whitebeard and Backends were in love, and so maybe they could have been together for a few years after, but it's just hard to judge without the full context of what actually went down at God Valley. It seems like all the members of the Rock's crew completely split up, but with the context that Whitebeard went into his prime a few years after the God Valley incident, I honestly don't think that he was just settling down with Ms. Baggin and instead he must have been fighting some of his most powerful battles to reach his prime. When we think of how Hockey and Devil Fruit Awakenings work, it's likely that this was the time when Wipey was fighting legends like Sengoku, Roger, or Garp as they were sailing across searching the new world and these were the people who could have pushed Whitebeard without the rocks at his side to his fullest potential. This was also most likely the era when he started his own crew and began adopting young orphans like Marco and Jozu so he had to become more powerful and can continue to train if he was going to protect these young weak children and become their father. And when we look at how young everyone looked in the Mad Science cover story, it's actually possible that the Mad Science group existed around the same time that Weevil was created as if he truly is a failed clone experiment from 35 years ago. Another reason though why I believe that Weevil is a failed clone similar to the Seraphim creations is because Weevil's personality is lacking so damn hard to the point where it seems like he's stuck in the mind of a whiny child. I mean maybe Weevil is legitimately suffering from something like missing chromosomes or some kind of mental blockage here as it could have been one of the first trials at cloning. I don't know, it just seems like he has so many mental downsides compared to Whitebeard and it just would explain why Weevil is the way he is. He's physically said to be a beast, even resembling a young Whitebeard in this aspect. From what we've seen, he doesn't even have a crew but he does have his mother right by his side. The best way that I could describe Weevil is an overgrown man-child. No matter which way I look at the Weevil back in scenario, it's heartbreaking for Whitebeard because in one situation, Miss Backing attempted to recreate Whitebeard for her own selfish power and greed and failed, creating an abomination of a science experiment. But if you look at this through the lens of Weevil actually being Whitebeard's son, it's arguably even more tragic to think that the one thing Whitebeard dreamed of, which was a family, was ripped out of his life. And so then he started a crew with the intention of adopting his children to fill this lonely void. And even if Whitebeard never knew about Weevil, even this scenario paints Miss Backings as the villain. I can't see a way where Whitebeard wins here and the same goes for Weevil. He's either a scientific monstrosity or he's been lied to and deceived by his own mother never being able to meet his father. And what's even more insane is the fact that now Weevil is essentially become a bounty hunter chasing down the remnant Whitebeard pirates one by one hoping to find a lead on a grand treasure that doesn't even exist. It's tragic in every sense you could think of for everyone involved here. The Weevil tragedy is that he truly believes that he is Whitebeard's son now as he even compared his facial hair but what he never knew is that his mother, Miss Backin, had been manipulating right in front of his eyes the entire time. If you liked anything I said here, like the video to get it out to as many people as possible. Yes, and and even are all going to join Cross Guild, and if this is true, Buggy might just become Pirate King. By the end of this video, you'll know the names I just censored, and I can guarantee at least one of these will surprise you. So over the last couple of weeks, my mind has been obsessed with Buggy D Clown. I can't stop thinking about Cross Guild, and how Buggy's speech in Chapter 1082 is my new favorite speech in One Piece. And as the hype calmed down, eventually I began to wonder more and more about who will join Cross Guild. How will Buggy get his hands on the pony glyphs and ultimately become Pirate King. And that's exactly what I'll be answering here today. Because after days and days of research and letting my mind run wild, I realized that Oda is planning one of the greatest side plots in One Piece history. And I can't wait to show how this cross skill story will all play out. So leave a like, it really helps the video out, and let's dive into Buggy D Clown's Road to the One Piece.
For starters, let's ask ourselves who will join Cross Guild. We already know that Buggy, Meowk, and Crocodile are the main three members. And don't forget this legendary new recruit who took out a Vice Admiral. But if Buggy's going to rise to the top, he needs more members. He'll need power and he'll need intel. He'll need someone who can translate pony glyphs. And more importantly, he'll need a musician. Because as someone who was once on Roger's ship, he knows better than anyone that you can't reach the One Piece without singing your heart out to some Bing socket. And by the end of the video, we'll answer all of these positions. So first things first, the most obvious, plausible, and exciting characters who will be joining Cross Guild. But to understand these first three members, I had to explain a very important moment in Cross Guild's history. During Roger's execution, we see the former warlords witnessing the legendary death of Goldie Roger. Of course, this is why Buggy's speech hit us so hard, since not only was he once on Roger's crew and missed a chance to see Laugh Tail, but Mihawk and Croc were also there. I believe Buggy in this moment reminded them of Roger that day, and that's why Mihawk looked so surprised because after all of these years, he's forgotten his desire to seek out the One Piece. But what's really interesting about this callback is that if you look back to the panel where Oda showed us this execution, once again, showing us the young warlords were all there. And we see five pirates. And in the middle next to each other, there are the three cross guild captains, Buggy, Croc, and Mihawk. So was this foreshadowing that they would eventually join and create cross guild? Since after all, chapter 1082, Buggy's speech had many references to the Roger execution. And we even see his fight that day with Shanks. And isn't it weird that Buggy isn't one of the last ones shown? Instead, this panel shows Doflamingo, Shanks, and Dragon as the last one shown. Dragon is kind of strange but we probably just need more context and Shanks is understandable but Dofi? I mean that's strange if we're taking order of importance since Roger and Ace are the very last ones shown so why would Dofi be put closer to the end over Buggy? And so maybe Buggy was actually placed before Dofi because Oda wanted to foreshadow these main three cross guild members in the middle together. And then I began to wonder what if we expand this panel? We already know Buggy, Meowk, and Croc are in cross guild but what if everyone on this panel together would eventually team up to find the One Piece. On the right side we have Delphi, and on the left side we have Moria. And the more and more I thought about it, the more I researched, the more I realized I was onto something big here. Based off that panel, the first character to consider is Moria joining. And we already have the perfect setup to this being Perona. Maybe it's just me, but I loved Mihawk and Perona's dynamic more than Moria and Perona. I can't wait to see Perona reunite with Mihawk and with Moria fitting the warlord status of the cross guild captains, why not bring another warlord into the group? Moria's crew is kind of pointless now, it's really just him and Perona, so I could even see a scenario where Perona goes directly to cross guild looking to speak to her former master Mihawk for help. And I don't think Mihawk would refuse, for one he does seem to have a soft spot for Perona just like he does with Zoro. But also, her devil fruit powers are kind of broken. If you remember during Thriller Bark, Perona absolutely destroyed everyone in the Straw Hat crew except for Usopp. I know it's just a gag, but her ghostly abilities could be great for what I'm going to be talking about in the next section of this video, which is an Impel Down 2.0 situation, as she can take out a bunch of fodder with ease. And then there's Moria, whose devil fruit is honestly even more ridiculous. Commanding an army of zombies is still kind of ridiculous if used right. And I've always seen Moria as another buggy. He's a little stronger, he's just as weird, and I've always seen Moria to Kaido kind of like what Buggy is to Shanks. And Moria does also have a strange design resembling an evil clown with his giant clown shoes and strangely shaped body, so I'm thinking him and Buggy would get along perfectly. And okay, I I'll be honest, I just really love Perona, and even if I don't like Moria, I do just want her to join just for her. Now I mentioned an Impel Down 2.0 situation, and that comes from the idea that Croc and Buggy already broke out of Impel Down previously, so what if they do it again? Think about how legendary Buggy would become, known as the only person to cause multiple Impel Down breakouts. And this could actually lead to a gag where people start thinking Buggy is the legendary Sun God Warrior Nika. We actually made an entire video about this before, where we explain how most of the world may see Buggy as Nika when the story is over, with Luffy not wanting the title or recognition as the hero, and with Buggy taking credit for things like cross skill, we can see how this could happen. I'll leave a link in the description for this theory, but this Impel Down 2.0 situation would further that idea. So while Mori and Perona are dealing with the fodder at the lower levels, then we have Mihawk, Crocodile, and maybe even Buggy continuing to push higher, higher, and higher. 
We could even see Croc or Mihawk versus Magellan, which would be a really cool fight. And finally reaching the furthest levels of Impel Down. This is how we reach our next important member to join Cross Guild. But before that, subscribe and hit that bell like Luffy and Skypea to be notified every time we drop a video. We have a massive Wano review and analysis coming out in June, and a few massive theory videos. Trust me, you're not gonna want to miss these videos. <laughs> Doflamingo is known as the Joker, so he fits perfectly in this alliance with Buggy D Clown. I mean, could you imagine how perfect it would be to see Buggy speak to Dofi saying, Join me, Joker? Or him saying, Joker in the Clown, it's time to team up. But an even better scene that I would love to see is Croc breaking Doflamingo out of his cell and impel down. If you remember all the way back to Marine 4, we get a clash between Dofi and Croc, with Doflamingo asking Croc to join him. So it will be such a cool moment to see the tables turning if Croc goes over to Dofi's cell as he's now the one asking Dofi to join him. It would be wild if that Marine Ford moment all the way back then was foreshadowing to an alliance between the two. Oi, oi, maniaro. We know Dofi was interested in teaming up with Croc at one point, and if he's breaking him out of prison alongside Croc's skill, why would he say no? It seems from their interactions at Marineford that Doflamingo and Croc know each other at least decently well. Maybe just from their warlord status, but maybe it goes deeper as they both came up during the same era. They could even be rivals of sorts, so I'd love to see more interactions between the two. Dofi would also be a really important character for Croc's skill for many reasons, like power and intel. I know Dofi can just some slag for losing to Luffy and being kind of irrelevant and locked in a cell ever since. But if we really think about it, the birdcage was broken, a Yonko level feat if we're being for real. I mean, not even Fujitora could get through it. Now, I'm not saying Dofi is a Yonko level character, but let's be real, if not even Fuji, Sabo, or Zora could cut through his birdcage, that bruise this man was way stronger than we realized while he was also fighting Lon Luffy at that time. I believe he was expending a lot more hockey and energy than we think on that birdcage. Power wise, I still have him over Crocodile, and I know it's a hot take, but I think he's even stronger than someone like Queen. His Devil Fruit is so much fun, and don't forget, he still has Conqueror Izaki. But aside from power, Dofi is also very smart. He has an absurd amount of intel as well. From his celestial dragon connections to his connections to multiple Yonko crews and evil scientists like Caesar and more. Dofi has knowledge on things like the sacred treasure of Mary Zoa, and even valuable devil fruits like Law's Opi Opi Nomi being worth 5 billion berry bounties and its awakened hidden powers. Doflamingo could potentially bring in Caesar the Clown, the Neo Mads, and shout out to Mr. Bushido for bringing up the Neo Mads to me. I didn't think it could fit until I realized Doflamingo is very likely a candidate. Think about it, if we now have Buggy D Clown, Dofi the Joker, and Caesar Clown, three notorious clown figures all in one group. When Mihawk and Croc talk about power and furthering their influence through a military force, Germa already has a clone army so that could also fit in there. And who knows what kind of crazy new inventions the Neo Mads could come up with. Dofi also has his former crew which are extremely loyal, and let's remember how ridiculous Sugar's Devil Fruit was. His Doflamingo family additions to Cross Guild aren't all amazing, but I I can't help feeling like Giola and guys like Treble just fit the evil but goofy vibe with Cross Guild. Doflamingo being the string that ties these guys together makes him actually crucial for the Yonko crew. But there's still the biggest reason why I believe Doflamingo is the perfect fit to join Cross Guild and that's because Doflamingo is the former king of the underworld. With Doflamingo taken down and putting Impel down, Buggy's influence has risen as he's taken over Doflamingo's former role as king of the underworld. And Doflamingo having this reputation fits perfectly as he knows how to deal with these types of people and he has respect as essentially a former narco kingpin and he has so many ties in the underworld that we may not even know of yet. He can help him find arm dealers for Buggy's men and he has the respect from these criminals as he's one of the greatest criminals ever. And let's say Buggy does save Dofi from Impel Down this also leads me to my next question which is Buggy is racing the lap to find the One Piece but even if he did get his hands on all four pony glyphs he would need someone who could read them and transcribe the message. 
as far as we know, there isn't anyone already on Boogie's crew who can do this. And so, what if one of the reasons they go to Impo Down is in search of a criminal who had this ability? We know reading Ponyglyphs is a crime, so it's very possible that some pirates or scholars were sent to Impo Down in the past after researching the ancient text. Another way this could play out is through Dofi. Like I mentioned earlier, he seems to have many connections, information on taboo subjects, and important people. So maybe Dofi knows someone in Impo Down, or someone in general, and then Cross Guild's next move would be to go after these potential Ponyglyph readers. In the process of Impel Down 2, we may see Weevil captured and imprisoned. As another warlord, it's possible Cross Guild pulls him alongside and joins them. He's muscle, he's pure strength, and what is the future of Weevil's character? I'm not as confident as Weevil joining Cross Guild like with Perona, Moria, and Dofi, but it's just another idea to consider. And another character I want to mention quickly here, and a reason why I love the idea of another Impel Down situation is that because Bonchan will be freed and become the final straw hat. A lot of One Piece fans may not realize this, but Bonchan is actually still alive. It was revealed in a cover page on chapter 666 when we see him still alive in Impel Down. And I don't think Bonchan will join the Cross Guild. Instead, I'm expecting him to end up escaping during this event. He also knows Buggy as Buggy saw the sacrifice that allowed them to make it out of Impel Down at the very end. So I think he returns and sees Bonchan once again, and he will respect his decision and thank him for what he did that day. And Bonchan knowing the ins and outs of Impel Down could even help Buggy escape for the second time. I think Bonchan will turn down Buggy as it's possible he'll want to search for the revolutionaries with the remaining hidden members of Impel Down level 5.5. I'm sure not too many people would be upset with Bonchan becoming a Straw Hat, but even if he doesn't, he could also become a revolutionary or even join the Straw Hat Grand Fleet. Plus, I'm sure Sanji would love to have Bonchan around as he could bring his strange pervy fantasies to reality. I believe Dragon and Luffy might have already been allied by this point in the story, so it's also possible that he could just meet up with both of them while they're allying together, both father and son. Because remember, he was also connected to Ivanka. And if Kraska was to invade and pull down and successfully free the remaining prisoners, it makes you wonder what happens to Magellan? Would he join the world government or would he possibly join Buggy? I know this sounds also absurd and it is, but it does seem Magellan is on his own and he doesn't follow any rules. He isn't friendly with pirates or marines. And even Doflamingo jokes about Magellan saving him from Emu and the Godose killing him. And now that I think about it, it would be really cool if coincidentally Buggy and Cross Guild saved Doflamingo right before he's about to be assassinated. Now did you ever wonder what happened to the rest of the level 6 Impel Down escapees that Blackbeard freed during the Impel Down arc? Well the Godose and Sengoku sure did. It stated that the Godose didn't spread this information to the public, meaning there's a bunch of the world's most dangerous criminals and pirates roaming freely around the One Piece world. This could be where we get introduced to a few new powerful characters who join Cross Guild. With Buggy already being known as the man who freed these other prisoners and many of his fanboys being previous Impel Down escapees, we might see this trend reoccur with more powerful members. We're yet to hear anything about these other level 6 members, but since Cross Guild is recruiting, I wouldn't be shocked if some of the former prisoners currently in Cross Guild might have even known some of them in the past. Think about Crocodile and Mr. One, or Daz Bones. Croc was in prison in level 6, while Daz Bone, his right hand man, was only placed in level 4. So there's a potential that there's crewmates in Buggy's crew already who know these level 6 escapees and they could lead us to their whereabouts. And now moving on from Impo Down, there's two other members for Cross Guild that I really would love to join. They'd be perfect fits as they're already bounty hunters. Some of you have may already guessed it, but before that make sure to like the video because we worked really hard on this and it really does help us out. And these two bounty hunters that I'm talking about are Zoro's bros, Johnny and Yosaku. You know we haven't seen these bros since the East Blue Saga. They would be the ones who say stuff like Zoro bro or Sister Nami. But with Zoro now a retired bounty hunter and now a straw hat heading for the One Piece, it would be hilarious if these two jokers ended up with the actual joker, a literal clown, Buggy. Joni and Yasuku were Zoro's bounty hunting buddies, so they have experience in this field. And if you remember, they actually did come across Mihawk in Zoro's battle with Mihawk when he first met his future apprentice at the Barantia. They know the immense skill and strength that Mihawk possesses, so this might be another reason to team up with a cross guild. I kind of just want this one to happen, you know, they're not too strong and they can really only fight off fodder and go after weaker bounties, but I just kind of love their goofiness and I think it'd be a perfect fit for Cross Guild and Buggy. Because you know, we've already spoken of these powerful and important pirates like Doflamingo, but at the end of the day, Cross Guild is the most fun and exciting things and these two passed a vibe check. Buggy and Luffy are bound to cross paths eventually, and it would be so funny for Zoro and his old bros to run into each other in this way. Oda loves bringing back the OG, so I can't wait to see if he pulls the trigger on these bounty hunting brothers. Another connection that Buggy has is his connections to the Ron 
Roger Pirates. Is it possible that someone like Scopper Caban joins Buggy? I used to think Rayleigh would ally with him, but now that I think about it, he fits way more with Luffy or Shanks. We haven't seen many of their former Roger Pirates, but if Buggy was able to bring them together under the Cross Guild, it would only expand his legend across the world. It could be really funny seeing a newspaper that says Yonko Buggy is now the leader of the former Roger Pirates, with Morgan typing up Buggy comparing him to Roger. And now I have one final really wacky and ridiculous option for who could join Buggy's Cross Guild, and that's the Beast Pirates. <laughs> Okay, hold up, and hear what? me out. I promise it's not what you think, but you'll understand soon enough. And I want you to join me on this journey because I'm going to take you through what I think could be the greatest cover story in One Piece history. I mentioned some of these original ideas in my One Piece 1082 Everything You Miss video, and by the way, subscribe for those. You guys seem to be loving that series, and they're honestly just so fun to make. So in chapter 1082, Buggy makes a speech which shows us Cross Guild will be aiming for the One Piece. But what's so perfect about this is how they could gather some of these pony glyphs. I think Mihawk and Crocodile are severely underestimating Buggy's charisma and connections. For example, the first goal should be to gather the Royal Pony Glyphs, and where does Cross Guild start? Well, after they visit Impo Town, how about a journey to Wano Kuni? As wild as this sounds to Mihawk and Crocodile, Buggy knows Momonosuke, the new Shogun of Wano. If you remember, Odin and Momo were on Buggy's crew with Roger all those years ago. Except to Momo, he might actually remember Buggy since it was that long ago in his mind. And let's just be real here, who's gonna forget this phase. And Buggy also knows from his trips on Roger's crew to Wano that this land holds one of the four main road pony glyphs. Cross Guild journeys to Wano, and this could be the second part of a long Cross Guild cover story after Impel Down. And aside from Buggy knowing Momo, he was also a crew member of Wano's beloved Odin. It would be really funny if Cross Guild invades the country and we have a little scuffle between Miyok and Yamato, who is now the guardian deity of Wano. Miyok has to fight someone powerful, so I just thought Yamato would be the best fight for him. And then it could be really funny if the next chapter's cover story is the Yonko, Buggy, and Yamato having a fun piratey conversation about Ace, Luffy, and of course, Yamato is in amazement at all the stories Buggy's telling her about his days with Odin, and also all his journeys and adventures with the pirate king, Goldie Roger, who she learned about all through Odin's journals. We know Yamato loves Odin, so who knows, maybe she even recognizes Buggy as Odin even wrote about him and Shang since he considered them little brothers. I just think it would be so cool to see, so Oda, I really hope that he does this. And just from this one interaction, Buggy could be accepted and loved by the two most important figures of Wano, Momonosuke and Yamato. And by gaining their trust, getting that first row pony glyph might actually be a lot easier than Croc and Mihawk think. And the most hilarious part about all of this is that it would prove Buggy right when he told Mihawk, we don't need power and we don't need to fight the Yonko. It's a race to the pony glyphs, a race to laugh till in the One Piece. I just find this idea hilarious since it's not Mihawk's strain that helps him get their first pony glyph, instead it's Buggy charisma and absurd connections. Plus it would be really Really cool to see Mihawk interacting with the land of swordsmen and samurai as the scabbards and other powerful samurai look at Mihawk as some kind of sword god. And also remember how I said Buggy needs someone who can read pony glyphs? Well, what if Momo and Sukiyaki actually know someone who can help him? Or they can give them information and point Buggy in the right direction to a new island to find someone who can since the Kozugi are people who can read pony glyphs, they might know of a clan in the distance that knows how to do this. And since the cross guild is now speed running their road to laugh tail, could you imagine if one of the scabbards or Momo gives Buggy a Viver card to Zoe. Buggy can bring up how he also knows Dog and Cat and once visited Zoe during their travels to laugh to. Man, that would just be so funny to see Croc and Mihawk's reaction to Buggy getting handed directions to Zunisha who you can only find through a Viver card. Since Buggy might mention he's looking for these pony glyphs to honor Roger's legacy and see the One Piece for himself, Momonosuke or Raizo or someone within the scabbards knowing the pony glyph is hidden there might be the ones to give him the Viver card. And then Mihawk and Croc would just be even in more shock realizing how easy it's been so far with Buggy leading them to find these pony glyphs. Buggy's so great at getting along with people, being social and charismatic as we've seen when he threw a party with Ace. And we've also seen with the men who follow him to the ends of the world. Buggy's just a likable guy. He's just got a certain energy around him similar to Luffy where he draws in people. But now finally arriving at Zo, Mihawk and Croc might be amazed that this giant elephant actually exists. And even more amazed at how nonchalantly Buggy acts like it's no big deal to him since he's seen it before. And once again, 
again. Seeing the rogue Ponyglyph and Buggy being friendly with the Minx, I think Meowth and Croc might actually start to believe in Buggy. I mean, he's already taken them to Wano to get a Ponyglyph and now Zoe. But on the way to Wano and Zoe, there's one character who I think fits perfectly with Cross Guild, and that is Scratch Man Apu. We never knew what happened to Apu after Wano, but I've had a theory for a while that Apu would be one to create the new Beast Pirates. And this comes from the idea that Apu would take in the numbers. We know he loves them so much and they love him. He's got this mutual strange bond with the Onis, and Apu could even bring along other Beast Pirates like the Smile Eaters and other miscellaneous characters from Wano that have nowhere to go after Kaido was defeated. It seems like Apu's role is uncertain to the future of the story. And like I mentioned with Buggy wanting to get a musician on his crew, and as annoying as Apu is, as much as I dislike him, I think he would be the perfect fit for Buggy's cross guild since we know every circus needs its party music. He's also just so goofy and wacky looking that I think he just instantly fits in Buggy's crew. So my prediction is that somewhere along this journey, we'll get a couple of Apu cover stories meeting Buggy in the cross guild. Alright, so I already told you who I think will join cross guild, but now I'll tell you some names that I don't think will join. First, I see many people saying Law will join, but one big reason that I don't think Law will join is because Doflamingo, or second most likely big name to join cross guild aside from Perona. And so if this is the case, there's no way I can see Law wanting to be on the same crew as Doflamingo. Another I don't think is likely is Boa Hancock. I know she's a warlord, but I see Boa joining Luffy's Grand Fleet at the end of the series, because she's as loyal to Luffy as Barto is, and she's already one of Luffy's biggest allies. Boa is so in love with Luffy that joining another Yonko crew would be like backstabbing her love for the Straw Hat Pirate. And so now that we know Buggy will have an absolutely stacked crew comparable to Shanks, Blackbeard, and the Straw Hats, let's ask, where does this lead us? I think after acquiring the Pony Glyphs and the World Government, already acknowledging the problems with Cross Guild, they're gonna have a similar scenario to what the Straw Hats are facing at Aiken. Not this extreme, but I would love to see Mihawk face an Admiral, maybe Green Bull or Fujitora. I remember on the OPU podcast, we spoke about Mihawk's potential backstory. We know he became powerful by having Shanks as a rival and having a legendary fight against him, but Mihawk is known previously to being a warlord as the marine hunter as we learn from crocodile so it makes you wonder mihawk had to have other huge fights besides shanks so what if during his rise to fame he defeated the previous world strongest swordsman who was an admiral at the time also i just realized this but it's even better comparing zora to mihawk as they both started out as bounty hunters anyways mihawk defeating an admiral in his past would be such a cool lore review and adding to his title and reputation as the marine hunter we know mihawk is strong enough to do this but it would be even cooler if this is actually how mihawk became a warlord. By defeating an admiral, the world government offered him the position of the warlord to have peace and freedom. They had to make a deal with Mihawk because he just took out one of their strongest fighters as he became a real problem for the organization. And shout out to OPU, we do have One Piece stream over there every Friday, so do me a favor and go subscribe to One Piece University. Now if Mihawk really did fight an admiral in his past, it makes you wonder about the future. The moment Crossco was created, my first thought was which marine is Mihawk going to go after? And I came to the conclusion that Oda would have to show us some of Mihawk's ability abilities and power before Zoro. So what if we see Mihawk fight Admiral Fujitora or Admiral Green Bull who are both swordsmen but also have amazing devil fruits? And let me know in the comments which fight would you rather see, Mihawk versus Fuji or Mihawk versus Green Bull? And after this, Cross Guild type would be at an all time high, giving Mihawk his big moment in the crew and the entire world would have their eyes on this bounty hunting crew after Mihawk skyrockets into fame again. And this would be Buggy's chance to go after the One Piece. I said that Buggy might have been right about going and looking for the treasure, the pony glyphs and finding the One Piece. But I think Mihawk saying that we're not going to fight Luffy, Shanks, and Blackbeard to carry you to the top was definitely foreshadowing that Cross Guild would eventually run into a Yonko crew. And it would be really cool if it was the Red Hair Pirates. Because now we could see the longest awaited rematch between Mihawk and Shanks that everyone wants. And the Straw Hats versus Cross Guild would also be amazing because you could get Buggy versus Usopp being an all time amazing fight. And also of course Zoro versus Mihawk. I think what's most likely is that we're going to have the true pirate battle royale at Elbaf, Lodestar, or even Laugh 2. I made an entire video about this 6 months ago when Oda confirmed this battle royale, insane matchups for the final saga, but at some point, the Yonko crews will have to face as they all head towards the One Piece. The One Piece! The One Piece is real! So to summarize, Cross Guild will now have Dovi, Perona, Moria, Weevil, Apu, and the new Beast Pirates. More and put down prisoners, these are the Clown, the Neo Mads, and the remaining level 6 prisoners who escaped the first and put down. And don't forget Joni and Yosuku, and probably some new bounty hunters as well, some new badass characters that we've never even heard of. I think they will be introduced in the future to join Cross Guild. But do you think this new and improved Cross Guild is enough to make Buggy Pirate King? Honestly, I think it just might be. Did you know that if you look real closely, 
on the giant golden bill of Shandora, you'll see a monkey. But not just any monkey, a monkey with a straw hat. I know that gave me chills down my spine. Goosebumps. Especially since it was Monkey D. Luffy who rang the bell during Skype U. You see, when I discovered this groundbreaking detail hidden in plain sight, I thought to myself, was this awesome crazy coincidence? Or what are the chances that whoever created the bell in the ancient past knew that Straw Hat Luffy, or in other words, Joy Boy, would one day strike the bell of Shandora? And now that I've gathered your attention, keep this in the back of your mind for now until the end of the video, because it will all make sense soon enough as I show you how Oda has already told us how the One Piece story ends. And this video is going to contain massive spoilers, spoilers to the end of One Piece, spoilers to the entire history and importance of the Monkey D family. But hold on, before I get ahead of myself, we have to start out from the very beginning, because after rereading Skypea and researching the Monkey D family for months, I think I've discovered the truth about Luffy's ancestors. Today I'll tell you why the Monkey D family is the most feared, most powerful, and most important family in the entire One Piece world. I'll explain their connection to the former Joy Boy, and I'll tell you why they are worshipped by Shandora. I'll reveal how Dragon's goals are tied to Luffy's, the revolutionary and the future pirate king. I'll reveal many secrets on the will of D. I'll reveal Oda's entire inspiration and plan for these two characters. So stick around to the end of the video to have your mind blown as I reveal everything there's to know about Luffy and his infamous Monkey D family. Let's start out with the basics. What do we already know about the will of D and its cryptic meaning? The most crucial and important information we have on the middle initial D is that it's being passed on and that those of the D clan oppose the gods or the celestial dragon. Whether because of a faded future or an ancient history or maybe a bit of both, this makes the will of D members and the celestial dragon's natural enemy. Even Emu states how the D clan were once the past enemy of the celestial dragons, referring to the void century time. But the most mysterious thing that Emu tells us is that the current D members don't know the meaning of the initial or the importance it holds. This is strange and implies that Emu and the celestial dragons wiped out the D clan during a void century in some kind of war. I mean, even Lily, Cobra, and the Nefertaris don't know the meaning of the D, which is also strange, but we'll come back to this later in the video because it'll all lead us into the theory that the Monkey D family is the only remaining family of the D clan who have existed since the Void Century. So yeah, it'll all make sense, but just keep it in the back of your mind for now. Essentially, whatever the D represents, it's been suppressed. It's been erased just like Sun God Nikafru has been erased from the world. Celestial Dragon translates to Heavenly Gods, with Celestial relating to Heavens and Dragons being the closest thing to gods according to Oda because he mentions this in the opening page of One Piece Volume 13. He also asks, I wonder what would happen if you eat them. Now this is kind of a separate idea, but I always wondered, is it possible that Celestial Dragons actually ate the dragons during the Void Century as some kind of ritual, which allowed them, at least in their mind, to become gods? I mean, dragons seem to have gone extinct in the One Piece world, and considering that ancient giants like Zunisha, Sea Kings, and Poseidon all seem to be tied to the ancient kingdom and Joy Boy, it makes me believe that dragons were once also tamed by the D clan and allies of them as well. We know Celestial Dragons had heavy fascination in dragons as well, as Brownbeard mentioned this during the Punk Hazard R. So I think it would be really cool if Monkey D Dragon actually found one of the remaining dragons from the Void Century that survived the Celestial Dragon's extinction, since we know these giant creatures like Zunisha and the Sea Kings can live for hundreds of years. Or maybe that giant egg on Roger's ship actually was a dragon, and Monkey D Dragon found it years later. And we actually have an entire separate theory on this as well, where we explain how Dragon found Uranus, which was in this egg. So I'll leave that video in the description if you're interested. Now going back to the D clan, we also know that the D clan members are feared by celestial dragons and are raised to fear them. I believe this has to do with a prophecy that the D will always bring a storm and that this storm will destroy the celestial dragons. And trust me, this storm prophecy is much more important than we ever imagined because I think I finally deciphered this storm phrase and its importance to the One Piece story, which predicts the events of the end of One Piece. But before you understand what that means, we have to analyze each of the monkey family members one by one and show how important each one of them is to the end of One Piece and the will of D as a whole. We're also going to be focusing heavily on Dragon here and he's arguably just as important to this entire theory as Luffy. But before that, if you could quickly leave a like, it really helps the video. We need your help to reach our goal of 2,000 likes on this video and I have full faith that we'll reach it. The monkey family is just built different. Of course, from a physical perspective, Garb's name is literally Garb D. Fist, one of the greatest greatest nicknames in fiction. His upper body is that of a monstrous man and he once went toe to toe with Goldie Roger, another legendary pirate in his younger days. He's arguably the greatest marine to ever live. And you may call it his nature being passed down to the Monkey D family and the D clan, but he despises the celestial dragons. And this was the main reason he would not 
not rise to the Admiral ranks because he hated the thought of even serving directly under them. Personality wise, Garp is a completely insane person. Garp does what he wants when he wants and has the mindset of a true giga chat. If Garp wants to do something, no one is going to tell him no. And so if he really wants the demise of the celestial dragons that he's been holding on to deep down for decades, what happens when these deep rooted feelings rise? Well, keep that in mind because I believe Garp will aid in the downfall of the celestial dragons despite being a marine. And that's because dragons specifically remind us how the revolutionary's army's enemy is a celestial dragon and not the marines. If Garp is a sword member or someone who is the inspiration for sword as a free spirited marine, Garp could go down as not only the greatest marine ever, but someone who sparks a civil war and true change with his influence and inspiration. Garp was said to be one of the big motivating reasons that people are so excited to join the marines. They truly look up to him as a hero and I believe that many people within the marines will follow his lead like Smoker, Kobe, and many others. And this is Garp's role in the final saga as a D member and someone who will go down in history as an extremely pivotal factor in the change the world sees. He is the one man with the sway to add fuel to Dragon's revolution. And speaking of Dragon, Dragon is also built different. Sure, he's a booger picking nose digger, but I think most people will agree that Dragon is likely a top 5 strongest character in One Piece, at least in the current timeline. And that's a fair assumption to make since after all he's related to both Garp and Luffy who are both truly superhuman. Dragon just like Garp despises the celestial dragon rule and even goes a step further to carry on Ohara's will and start an army that will lead a revolution which directly opposes them. He didn't sell his soul to the world government like Vegapunk. Instead only someone with dragon's willpower, dedication, patience, and perseverance could do what dragon made his entire life's goal about. A man on a mission with the bigger picture always in the back of his mind like he's little baby. A man who's ready to face the entire world. He started with the freedom fighters but he's now made his life's work a revolution to dive head first into a war with the celestial dragons. And even though dragon once stated that he hates war, the celestial dragons are a group that's angered him to the point of no return. And I just love how it was most likely celestial dragons who made him change his perspective on war, making them the exception to his personal feelings. Is dragon a hypocrite? It's possible, but even more possible that he has changed a lot throughout the years and discovered the true horrors of the void century and many disgusting truths about the celestial dragons and their corrupted power. It's more likely that he's disgusted by the corruption, deception, and lies. And now we know that dragon's instincts and intuition is right because according to his right hand man Sabo, the Gorosei and Emu are demons with a demonic and evil aura, a sinister energy, with Sabo even describing these shadows who run the world as hell at the top of the world. After all, Ivan Cup states how he believes Emu is an immortal being with all this information like the information on the holy knights and Sabo now knowing the truth about Emu and the Gorosei, this is all leading to a revolution that will change the entire world. Sabo may be the face of this militarized movement but Dragon is the revolution itself. He's the core of the entire organization. We've already seen Shane but I'm so excited for Dragon since Oda once stated that if he had to make a side series of any character it would be on Garp or Dragon's life. It implies Oda already has an interesting story to tell for both these characters. Most likely including their past and their backstories. Their own hero journeys and I'd love to see Garp's rise through the marines but for Dragon I'd love to see what drove him completely off the deep end. Because with Garp it's amazing how we could see God Valley and Roger and Whitebeard rocks these a bit but with Dragon and how insane his go and drive is I feel like this guy had to have some truly traumatizing moments for him to abandon Luffy and to become the world's worst criminal and sowing the world a glimpse of change. Maybe Luffy's mother or Dragon's mother is involved in a tragedy that impacts both Garp and Dragon to hate the celestial dragons. Obviously this idea is all speculation but it is very mysterious that we've never even heard of Luffy's mother once in the entire story and if she is dead that would explain a lot since no one ever really brings her up as she's someone who's already passed in a tragic event. It's different with Dragon as Garp tells Luffy about his father at Water 7 because he's still alive. Dragon more than anyone believes in inherited will as he is introduced with a Goldie Roger quote speaking on freedom, inherited will, and dreams. These things cannot be stopped. Inherited will, one's dreams, the ebb and flow of the ages. As long as people hunger for freedom, these things cannot be stopped. Remember how I mentioned how I believe there's a prophecy that the D-Clan will eventually defeat the Celestial Dragons? Well, this aligns with this quote, inherited will or the will of D being passed on for generations which continues the will to face the gods. Then there's dreams, dreams to become the Pirate King, dreams to create a revolution, Luffy and Dragon's dreams directly opposing the world government, the prophecy being only a matter of time before the day comes and all of this is leading to what Luffy and Dragon both want most, freedom. And that's why at the very end of this quote, Dragon 
Adams as a pirate, eh? Not a bad idea, in reference to his son Luffy. And remember, earlier I specifically stated that this prophecy states that the D will bring a storm. Well, this storm is something that's been referenced time and time again. Corazon explains to Law how every time a new D rises out the shadows out of history, an elderly celestial dragon at Marijua says the same saying, the D will always cause another storm. Or in some translations, the D will bring a storm. Now you may be wondering, well, why is this so important? Why does it matter so much when we're talking about dragon? And why has it been passed on with other D mids like the myth that the evil D members will eat the kids if they misbehave? Well, what if I told you this is all so important? What if I told you that dragon himself is the storm? His revolution being the very storm the celestial dragons fear. So we should really start calling him Dragon D Storm at this point. Just like Luffy is a prophetic figure in his own right as the new Joy Boy, someone who was predicted and prophesied by the Shandorans to return and ring the bell. I believe Dragon represents the storm. And this is where you can see that that monkey on that golden bell with a straw hat is so key to this theory, as it may just be another easter egg. But as also as Rayleigh says, there's no coincidence in this world. Now do you see why I believe that Dragon is the storm? Well, it gets even better. Because for decades, people have been theorizing that Dragon would have some kind of wind or Logia-based fruit. Maybe even a mythical creature who's tied to these elements. Essentially, the theory stems from the idea that it was Dragon who created the lightning at Logtown, saving Luffy from being executed. Sanji even asked Zoro, do you believe in God? Because of how insanely lucky this was. Even Luffy acknowledging his luck. We know the dragon was there at Logtown, so it's extremely likely he'd save his own son, and that this is the luck that dragon was referring to as he was extremely lucky that dragon was nearby during this arc, instead of natural lightning saving his life. It's interesting because if this is true, it means that he's been keeping tabs on Luffy since he knew lightning wouldn't hurt Luffy since he's rubber. He may have asked Garp or Shanks about Luffy at some point in the past, learning about him eating the Nika fruit. But I think you see where I'm going with this. Dragon himself is the storm in both the literal and metaphorical sense. I believe Dragon possesses the storm storm fruit, or at least something that fully gives him the power of storms, where he can literally become the storm itself, fully embodying the godly power, and this would be a completely broken fruit, either a mythical zone or a special logia. Smoker says that the last time he saw Dragon was at Lawtown during Roger's execution, where he disappeared into thin air like lightning. <laughs> But in the anime, they make it much more obvious that these winds, these small tornadoes, are Dragon's power. When Dragon goes back to his hometown and saves Sabo, he put out a fire with wind. And in the manga during Law Town, we see him targeting the wind specifically at Marines, allowing Luffy to escape. It's almost as he literally and symbolically is bringing a storm with him wherever he goes. What do you think Dragon's devil fruit is? Personally, I'm going with the storm storm fruit, the ultimate logia. Many elements in one. Rain, water, windy gusts, ice, hail, snow, tornadoes was lightning. This really isn't all that crazy when you think about Big Mom doing these types of things with Prometheus and Hera, and even Kaido having fire blasts, lightning, dragon twisters, tornadoes, and flame clouds. And I like to think that Dragon's signature move, or at least one of them, would be something playing around the theme of Dragon Twister, since, well, he's Dragon, but he can also create these tornadoes. And Dragon may not be a Yonko, but his power will be that of a Yonko as the father of Luffy. And so when the Celestial Dragons say that the D will bring a storm, what a better way for Dragon to arrive at Marijua then with a giant storm, striking fear into the hearts of all celestial dragons as they cry in fear at this day of godly reckoning, especially since the celestial dragons have been shown to be extremely superstitious. The prophecy is so known, and this will make it where dragon is really the key to celestial dragons downfall. We already can see this through the revolution, but this story is becoming even more grand in scale since tying back to the theme of inherited will. This storm has been building up for hundreds of years and it's finally ready to be unleashed. The storm is a symbol of all those D members who have come before him. Everyone in the world who's dealt with pain, slavery, suffering, and the horrible effects of the world government's rule. And this is the real reason Oda is saving Dragon for the end game of One Piece. If you've ever seen Dragon Ball, you'll know that when they summon the dragon, giant dark clouds surround the world. And this is because Shenlong is inspired by a dragon who was known for storms, and I can't think of a more badass way that dragon can enter whenever we see him. We already saw this happen both times in Lawtown during Roger's execution and 
happened during Lawtown, where a dark storm comes in as Dragon enters. And it could be something so terrifying, with lightning shooting straight out the sky and targeting specific enemies. I just cannot wait to see Dragon go all out for the first time, as his Loki of power may be able to change the entire weather and environment into a giant powerful storm. All of this puts Dragon significant as a D member up there with the likes of even Joy Boy himself. And speaking of Luffy, let's jump into his character. Luffy is someone who, just like his father and grandfather, despises Celestial Dragon. When we talk about being built different, Luffy is the ultimate example. He's speedrunning the new world, he's already surpassed Kaido at least solely in terms of hockey. He's also mastered his Devil Fruit, awakening it, and as far as physically, he's the toughest teenager the One Piece world has ever seen. Despite Luffy only being 19, he's already liberated multiple nations from corruption and piracy, and he's already become a Yonko. To put in perspective, Shanks was still in his 30s when he earned that title as an emperor. Luffy is now strong enough to defeat 99% of the One Piece verse with ease, and his story isn't even over yet. And while we haven't seen it yet, Straw Hat Luffy or Joy Boy is the future Pirate King. Luffy has always clearly been a superhuman, after being raised alongside Ace with his grandfather Garn, but his mind has also grown into that of a true king, someone who speaks his mind no matter what the circumstance is, someone who shows no fear against the most powerful and evil pirates like Big Mom and Kaido. If he sees something is wrong, he'll do what he can to change it and deal with the consequences after. He's happy and joyful when things are as he believes they should be, and so Luffy's spirit is truly unbreakable, as this was the entire point of his battle with Kaido. Someone who never gives up, someone who always bounces back, a symbol that people believe in because he creates miracles time and time again doing the impossible. In Wano, it's revealed that Luffy is Joy Boy, an actual sun god, and the warrior of liberation who's been erased from history by the world government. Many of the celestial dragons like Charlos are weak, gross, and pathetic people. These are people who have no physical authority to act this way. For someone like Luffy or Garp, it's their natural instinct to fight people if they disagree with them. And Luffy's made it clear that the thing he hates the most is cowards. Ever since he was a child, he hated Shanks when he thought that he was a coward, all those mountain bounties to spit on him and disrespect him. He hated Kobe because of how much of a crybaby loser he was at first, and he just doesn't like Shirahoshi for the same reason as well. But one thing about Luffy is that he also hates when you take away people's freedom, and so the Celestial Dragons are the ultimate combination of both. Charlos, a coward loser who robs people of their freedom. We've seen Luffy time and time again understand that if he wants to force his will and change upon the world, he's gonna have to do it with his fizz. Pretty much every single time Luffy saves another nation, it's never through negotiation. Instead, it's by brute force blowing up the entire situation completely. So it's only natural for the members of the Monkey D family to despise the disgusting celestial dragons who can't even fight for their beliefs. They can't even fight for their ideologies or even their lifestyle. Everything is handed to them on a silver platter, and people like Luffy and Garp are expected to not do anything simply because of their holy status and traditions. And so what we can see here is that the Monkey D family shows two trends. They're simply just built different. And number two, they're destined to face celestial dragons. And this brings us into the inevitable straw hat and revolutionary alliance. Oda's already showed his alliances before, but for this one, he's set the stage completely, like a chessboard, and the way the pieces have been moved around and set up for Luffy and Dragon's alliance is quite amazing when you look at everything pointing in this direction. First off, we have Nico Robin, the flame or light of the revolution. While to the world, Nico Robin is a demon child, shunned and wanted for simply existence, and Dragon was the one person who always sought after her. For decades after his friend Professor Clover had paired in Ohara, he would spend the next years looking for Nico Robin, who carried on the will of Ohara. And this once again goes back to Roger's quote, inherited wills, dreams, the ebb and flow of the ages. As long as people pursue freedom, these things will never cease to exist. With Dragon carrying on Ohara's will and Robin being both a revolutionary and a straw hat, this is the first place of evidence that tells me it's only a matter of time before the army unites with the straw hats. It's also interesting to think that Robin has spent more time with the revolutionaries than Luffy and the straw hat pirates. So Robin is truly integral to both crews. She is the key to exposing the true history to the world. Luffy wants to find the One Piece, while Dragon wants to expose the Celestial Dragons and learn the truth. And Robin can help out both as a centerpiece. Next we have Sabo, Luffy's brother, saved by Dragon of the Revolution. It almost seems like fate. At this point, I truly believe that Sabo has the will of D, just like the Godose speculated in chapter 1086. Sabo's already friends with Nigo Robin, and so with a relationship like this, it's really only a matter of time before we now see the relationship between father and son come together. And speaking of Sabo, Luffy still doesn't know what happened at the reverie. He was so ready to charge into Marijua and help Vivi before Zoro stepped in. And so ultimately, I see this moment as simply foreshadowing a great setup for Luffy to eventually invade Marijua. Because when he actually learns about the truth about Vivi,
Luffy and Cobra from Sabo, or the world government and Celestial Dragons do something even crazier to piss him off. The first time Luffy came across the Celestial Dragon, he was disgusted, and despite the warnings not to do anything, he just couldn't resist punching Charlos in the face at the slave auction in Zabaody. It was a natural instinct and reaction, a natural disgust at this pathetic false god. And so at a certain point, Luffy's not going to care what people tell him, he's just going to run straight into Marijua and go at their head. Luffy is also now a Yonko, and being a Yonko means that when the world government attacks Luffy at Akehead, they are declaring war against him and his entire crew and the abundance of allies that he has. So tying in the declaration of war and the element of Vivi and Cobra who are his friends, after finally knowing the truth, it'll be finally time to charge into Marijua and continue this war that the world government has already started. You have to think about it this way, Vivi's already essentially a straw hat and Emu's leading his forces to find Vivi. We know Luffy takes you messing with his friends extremely personal, like in Water 7 and Enos Lobby, so I think people expect the straw hats need to visit Laugh Tale and see the One Piece first to spark the invasion of Marijua after learning the truth. But knowing Luffy's nature, he doesn't need any type of information on the history of the world government to charge into Marijua. I'm not saying it has to happen in a certain way, but I'm just saying we should keep an open mind because Oda has already stated that the One Piece will be at the very end of the series. All Luffy needs to attack the Celestial Dragons is a reason to help his friends and find a good fight. We already have an example of Luffy declaring war and it was just to save Robin. And now seeing Sai and Leo murder Charlos and scream for everyone to hear that's on game, that's on Straw High Grand Fleet. We're seeing more and more hints pointing towards Luffy versus the world government being set up to face. Cobra's dying words to Sabo was to tell Luffy and Vivi that they are members of the D clan. So this is another way that Oda has set up Sabo and Dragon to meet up with Luffy and Vivi. And this is because I believe that Vivi will rejoin the Straw Hat Pirates. Because in our heart, she's essentially already a Straw Hat. And she's not strong, so Luffy will have to protect her. Another way to tie Luffy and Dragon into an alliance is through Bonnie, as she could also be involved here. Now becoming Luffy's ally during Egghead and this entire Buster Call situation. And with Kuma being a revolutionary, there's another reason for both parties to meet up. I'm also pretty sure that Bonnie has met Dragon at some point similar to how she met Vegapunk before, and I like to think that Kuma was the former right hand man to Dragon, before Sabo and before he left the army to become a warlord and join Vegapunk. I could see Bonnie becoming a revolutionary, following in the footsteps of her father, once he understands the truth about Kuma and Vegapunk's history. And since Sabo helped to save Kuma from Marijua during the reverie, she now trusts the revolutionaries more than ever. So I really do think that Bonnie will join the revolutionaries because as Kuma's daughter, she'll be welcomed in with open arms. But how will this all play out? How will Bonnie join the revolutionaries? Well, this leads me to my biggest prediction for the finale of Egghead. I think the start of Luffy and Dragon's alliance will be at the very end of Egghead when Luffy finally meets his father. Dragon will show up at the very end, similar to how Shanks did during Marine Force. Everyone always wonders, how on earth did the red-haired pirates get their so fast at the perfect timing at the very last second as Shanks clashes with the Kainu. Shanks is a Yago and he's fast and he was booking it across the world. But if anyone's faster than Shanks it may be Dragon, the Storm Logia, the man as fast as lightning and wind itself. Dragon pulling up to Egghead bringing an entire storm with him would be the most hype scene ever and arguably more hype than Shanks moment at Marine Force. He could arrive at the very tail end right on time to help Luffy and his old friend Vegapunk escape. There's been a great foreshadowing to this as well. For example during Egghead we get a significant amount of hints of Monkey D Dragon being involved with this arc. First, Vegapunk has Shaka talking to Dragon early in the arc, telling him that he will die soon. Next, we see Dragon and Vegapunk's mini flashback to Ohara. Third, there's Kuma who's also tying both. Since the revolutionaries are already at war with the world government, I could even see Dragon show up simply to face his enemy here head on. And I also think it's possible that we see a Holy Knight alongside Saturn. Once Dragon arrives at the scene to finish off the escape, the way I see Luffy meeting his father for the first time playing out is with Luffy and Dragon both picking their nose. Then they clash and we finally get to see Dragon's Devil Fruit revealed in text after 25 years. While Dragon might be a lot more serious in nature especially compared to Joy Boy, the Straw Hats and Revolutionaries will see their own similarities. You have to remember, Luffy's idea of an alliance is so much different from an actual idea of an alliance. For him, it's just someone that's his friend. For example, we saw with Law, it had completely different ideas of an alliance but it all worked out in the end, and the same could be said for him and Sabo if they teamed up. In Luffy's eyes, Ivankov, Sabo, Nico Robin, even Kuma, they're all like friends to him. Now, at one point, when Luffy and Dragon do invade Marijua and take down the Celestial Dragons, I always envisioned a scene where Luffy, Garp, and Dragon are standing up against the five Godose facing them together. But eventually, I think that Luffy will have to move on to Emu or Blackbeard, and that will leave Garp or Dragon to face against the Godose, or maybe even both together. Eventually, I expect that Sabo and Zoro will also join in on the fight 
fight. Zoro to face the Gandhi Venus Judo Godose and Sabo to get a rematch that he deserves as well. Finally being able to go all out in a fair 1v1, not against Emu and 5 Godose at the same time. The idea of Garp facing a Godose will just be so hype, getting the old man versus old man matchup. And then my final pick to face one of the final Godose members would be Law or Rayleigh. Or maybe Dragon ends up defeating two Godose at once, which would be extremely hype. This alliance could restore the monkey family to the throne. It's like Doflamingo says, who's good and evil always flips back and forth. It's possible the D-Clan and Celestial Dragons have a history of fighting for power. At one point, the Marines may have been seen as the enemies in comparison to the pirates because in Wano, we even see them compare the pirates and marines together. But I can see Luffy either restoring the D-Clan to the leaders of the new world that he creates, or even better, Luffy as Joy Boy may even finish off this entire cycle completely. Where Luffy might differ from the previous Joy Boys that he could be the final person to make a new era without prophecy, creating a new future without a cycle, which fits the themes of freedom and piracy with Luffy being the key to a future that is a new uncharted adventure completely. The one thing on my wish list for the final saga is that Bonnie ages up garb into his prime because even if it's only for a single fight against a Godose or against a Kainu, that would just be incredible. Because seeing Prime Luffy, Prime Dragon, and Prime Garb all fighting together, a prime trio of the world's most powerful fighters will honestly be the greatest moment ever. Please Oda, just please let Bonnie use her powers on an old man like Garb so we can see the Garb D fist in action. And Garb is the one guy who's always bringing up his past glory days, the man who's always constantly bragging about his prime. So there's no one more fitting to give this moment to than the old hero. And this would also be so hype as it could be the key to the moment which inspires all those marines to switch sides and join him. Like I mentioned earlier, starting a civil war. If the marines knew that Prime Garb had returned, they'd hop on the bandwagon just for the simple fact of believing in this man's greatness. Wipeer once mentioned a great war that was to come one day, and there's no doubt in my mind that this war will be led by Luffy, Dragon, and Garb. Father and sons, three generals of the Monkey D family, immortalizing the Monkey D family's name into history once again as bringers of needed change. Oh, while I'm truly excited to see the Monkey D fam go ape and impact the future in a powerful way, what's just as important is this family's legendary past. So what is it that makes this family so special in the first place? How are all three of these men complete ghosts in their own right? What is their family's history? Well, it's time to reveal everything. You see, I believe that the Monkey D family is of a royal bloodline. We're talking about One Piece here, and in One Piece, kings and conquerors are usually determined by strength. It's in their nature to go against a celestial dragon. So is this a curse of some kind, something all Will of D members subconsciously succumb to, or you could argue this reaction also has something to do with their conquering kingly nature. But ultimately, for the Monkey D fam specifically, I think it's a bit of both. Just like Charlos and the Celestial Dragons are clinging to the very narrow history of the world, and clinging to the traditions and descendants of the gods despite being weak, the other side could be true for Luffy and his family's history being erased from the world, with the Monkey D family holding up their customs through their powerful actions and their insane nature instead of using laws, traditions, and status during the era of Celestial Dragons. That makes these these men true pillars of revolution. And this all leads to the secret Chandor history of the Monkey D family and why they're so important and connected to Joy Boy. And some of this I guarantee you would have never even imagined being possible. Most people might say that Luffy comes from a lineage of Joy Boy's ancestors and I do think it's possible but I actually don't think it's the case and you'll understand why soon enough. But before getting to that, we need to go over the inspiration for the Monkey D family. <laughs> Alright, so it's clear that Oda was inspired by many things for Luffy's character, Dragon Ball, Sun Wukong, and Hanuman. Because let's just say that Joy Boy was a Monkey D family member, just like the Go D family, you would think the world government would go through the entire world to eradicate this family line. And when they shown back up again with Garb, Luffy, and Dragon, you would think they would also go after them. And this leads me into Oda's inspiration for Luffy's character, Dragon Ball, Sun Wukong, and Hanuman. Looking back at the very early chapters of One Piece, there's clear similarities to early OG Dragon Ball. But even more so focusing on Luffy as his name is Monkey D. Luffy, it's clear that he was inspired by the origins of Goku at least a little, as Goku was shown in Jump's iconic Monkey Boy. But going even deeper, Dragon Ball at least before it was about alien invasions and fighting gods of destruction was a simple parody gag manga of Journey to the West. So Luffy was inspired by Goku and Goku was inspired by Sun Wukong. As One Piece progressed, we begin to see a lot more of how Oda began to be inspired by both. And Sun Wukong is notoriously compared to Luffy because just like 
that Monkey D. Luffy is well becoming Pirate King, Sun Wukong was known as the Monkey King. In One Piece, we had the D Clan or the Enemy of the Gods, but in Journey to the West, Monkey King Sun Wukong rivaled the gods in his own way. Sun Wukong is like a classic shonen story about reaching the highest highs and enlightenment. And in One Piece, I would say the Straw Hats are also seeking enlightenment in all in their own ways. And with their captain being Joy Boy, it wasn't more apparent than Luffy being enlightened when transforming into Gear 5. But arguably the most important is Hanuman, because he has the resemblance of a divine monkey god and is revered as the Wisdom King. The biggest connection with him and Luffy is that it ties them to essentially being monkey kings, but also the monkey family members of Hanuman, which is comparable to the entire Monkey D family line. And shout out to all the Indians that subscribed to me, because months ago I met up with the Indian One Piece community, and I have to say that experience was welcoming. Apparently Hanuman can shapeshift, he can change his form, and this reminds me of Luffy in Gear 5, or in all his Gear forms, but really specifically with Gear 5 as he battles with Kaido and goes into many different forms. For example, how Luffy can grow into a giant and even shrink into a chibi form. But it doesn't stop here, because Luffy's attack in Gear 5, the Badgering Gun is a reference to Hanuman meeting Monkey God Gun. And by the way, Badgering Gun is Luffy's best finisher in the entire series. Another little detail is that in the Hindu religions, many speculate that some of the inspiration for Zunisha comes from Gunisha, an elephant god. Now tying Hanuman back into the monkey family as a whole, Hanuman is the son of Vayu, the god of wind and air. And like we discussed earlier, Dragon has the storm fruit and wind powers. Hanuman once ate the sun, thinking it was a fruit, just like Luffy ate the sun god Nika fruit. And there's so much more evidence and great videos out there that explain Luffy's connections to Hanuman and Sun Wukong like Flying Panda, Revil, and Ohara. So I'll make sure to leave them in the description. So now that you've seen this, I think you can see where I'm really going with this, because the monkey family is definitely special because they are One Piece's versions of the monkey god family. And so special in fact that the Shandorans even believe that Joy Boy would be reborn into the family. And that just gives me goosebumps. Well, all of this means is that the ancient people could predict certain events through visions or prophecies. And this is even more important because we know Odin knew many prophecies about Joy Boy returning to Wano in exactly 20 years. So when looking at Shandora and its ancient text all around the city, unlike any other place in One Piece, it makes you wonder what other mysteries could have been foreshadowed or even completely solved by spending more time looking at the ancient artifacts. It seems these ancient artifacts tell more than just about the past, but also the future. Just like the Neptune family line is important as there's prophecies of a mermaid princess being reborn as Poseidon. I believe that even if Oda doesn't blatantly spell it out for us, we can put these pieces together to see that the Monkey D family is in a similar situation. And there's other characters that may be reincarnations that aren't really confirmed yet, like for example, maybe Vivi and Lily. And if you still think that fate, destiny, time travel, and prophecies ruin One Piece's story, well, I completely disagree because many correlate these things to Luffy not being free, but that's not the case at all. You see, there's a few ways to look at this. First, Luffy still had to become the man he is. Having the best genes isn't enough, and I would argue that Big Mom had the best genes for any human in One Piece. But then there's also the idea of seeing the future with Future Sight and Madame Charlie using a magical crystal ball. Well, what this means is that we may actually be witnessing Luffy's story play out in real time. And from our perspective, the story is continuously moving forward. But you see, in retrospect, if we look back at Luffy's adventures as one long story, but that's only from the point of view that we have with it being a weekly shonen series. You see, in retrospect, when we look back at Luffy's adventures one day as one long story that's already played out, viewing this story from the past or the future, it doesn't change the fact that Luffy had to do it. For example, if you're witnessing a specific event from the past, this means that this event already happened in the future, similarly to how an event already happened in the past when we look back at the past. People oftentimes try to separate time, but if you view it as one long timeline, we have to look at the past and the future times through a similar lens of history, whether it be a past history or a history in the future that Luffy's already accomplished. This way, Luffy still did everything himself, but there was just a few members who could see this. And I started believing this idea with One Piece when you consider how important the future is. And really, the future is only a further future's history. It just depends from where you're standing in time and where you look at it. The current timeline of One Piece is a future timeline's past. In other words, if Toki jumped 50 years into the future, she'd see Luffy's actions that we're currently witnessing as that future's history, as it would have already played out. But why Luffy is truly the chosen one to defy destiny is because he's already proven this in fights like with Katakuri. The entire point of Luffy's fight with Katakuri and Future Sight is that Luffy can change the future, because Luffy looks into the future and changes the future that Katakuri saw, which means that he changed it. And this was on a minuscule scale, but putting it on a much larger scale, and since Luffy is the main character, it means that Luffy still has the power to make drastic changes for the future. Rayleigh himself believes in Luffy because of this, and I think that even if Rayleigh knows what will happen because he saw the One Piece, the reason why Luffy is the man that Roger's waiting for 
powers because Luffy's will is so powerful that this is the man who can change fate and the future itself. And so it's possible that it's even Luffy's dream to become the pirate king or the freest man because his goal is to have full freedom one day, full control of his actions, and the ability to dictate his own fate fully. And that's why Gear 5 is so important to him becoming an enlightened being as he understands the cost of freedom and he understands the concept that freedom ain't free. Now, going back to the Monkey King idea, I'll finally reveal why the Monkey D family were the previous rulers of Shandora. You see, in One Piece, people worship gods, but with my theory that the Monkey D family are an ancient royalty, we have to ask ourselves, how did they become royalty in the first place? So a part of this can be from powerful wills and kingly nature. What if I told you that the Monkey D family are so recognized in the Void Century because they were the family that raised Joy Boy after taking him in as an orphan and raising him at a young age? Age. The Monkey D family was the one who transformed Joy Boy into a warrior of liberation. And because Joy Boy would go on to become such a legendary warrior, this gave Shandor a real royal status as Joy Boy would be known throughout the ancient kingdom as an orphan raised by this warrior family. And with Joy Boy being a sun god, it makes sense that the Monkey D family would be considered godly as well by the Shandorans. Oda's favorite trend is for important characters to be abandoned by their fathers and for their parents to die in a tragic backstory. So I don't see why the original Joy Boy story would be any different. Luffy never knew his father, same with Ace, and we can assume the same with Shanks as he was found in a treasure chest at God Valley. And there's Whitebeard's entire character which is adopting and raising young men that he finds like Marco, Blackbeard, and becoming their father. Nami never knew her family and then her adopted mother tragically dies. Robin never spent time with her father or mother and then her mother also dies. Usopp's father is still looking for milk at Elbeth. And then there's Zoro's parents who supposedly also died. And Sanji who ran away from his own bloodline and considers Zeph his true adopted father. Oda loves this storytelling device for whatever reason, and he has shown this reoccurring trend in the story of One Piece for adopted children raised by their non-biological parents. And so I believe that Shandor was once a lost relic which was once part of the ancient kingdom before it was separated. And this would also explain why there was so much gold there and why the city of Shandora has casual ancient kingdom style writings engraved in their buildings, in the very same language as the Ponyglyphs in chapter 272, because they're heavily connected to Joy Boy. And I think it's one of the most overlooked and crazy reveals that we got from Skypea. And we'll also be getting more into the gold and its importance at the very end of the video because there's more than you could have ever realized. If you know our Ors is Joy Boy theory, you'll know that there is so much evidence of Joy Boy being an ancient giant. And crazy enough in the Skypea arc, there's a map that shows a giant Oni on the map. But we never saw any kind of giants in the arc. With the map being at least 400 years old and maybe much older, it's possible that the giant is Joy Boy as he climbed up the giant beanstalk just like Jack in the Beanstalk stories. If you look at many of the ruins and the Vor statue, they resemble an oars like Beast. There seems to be an oars in the altar of Shandora in Nolan's flashback as well. Oda also gave us another hint to the monkey family being connected to Shandor. In the early Jaya arc, we see these two characters who are essentially monkey men, searching for Jaya with Nolan's ancestors. What a coincidence, these are the first characters that we meet in the Jaya arc, or the Skypea saga. As Rayleigh says it, no coincidences exist in this world. Is it possible that these monkey men are descendants of the Monkey D family, or somehow related, making them some of Luffy's long-lost cousins? Oda wants us to know about the importance of the symbolism of monkeys from the very beginning. In time back into the Joy Boy theories of Shandora, we even see Nika battling a snake on a golden hieroglyph. I personally believe it's Nika because we saw that Nika had a sword in his silhouette, so he may have fought one of the giant snakes that we know exist in Shandora at some point. And I guess it could be any warrior really, but considering these people worship the snake as a sun god, this might explain why, as it may have been lost in translation over time with this warrior being the true sun god. I also just think that the Monkey D family raising an orphan who was a previous joy boy during the Void Century would be perfect tying the entire story of One Piece together, with Luffy a Monkey D family member hundreds of years later being joy boy as well. It's also more interesting than the original joy boy simply being a member of the Monkey D family lineage directly. Similar to how Goku was being raised by a family that's not his race, the original joy boy may have had a similar backstory. And with Oris not being a Monkey D technically, it would explain why Luffy's family is not as feared and prosecuted with the Celestial Dragons and World Government. Instead, we see in arcs like Punk Hazard from Law to the World Government fears and seeks the power to resurrect and control the Oris Giants instead of facing them in battle. To me, it's almost too destined by fate and kind of boring if Luffy is the same bloodline as the original Joy Boy. Instead, if we look at the Oris Clan and the entire Oni race, I believe they were wiped out by the World Government during a Void Century War out of pure fear of another potential potential Joy Boy appearing one day. This would also explain why Kaido and Oni was so obsessed with Joy Boy and his Oni heritage, and maybe even why King believed his captain
tapped in was Joy Boy. And since Oris had the human fruit as the OG Joy Boy, it would also explain why the Straw Hat is so massive, as he would be a lot smaller in his human Nika fruit form, as we've seen that Luffy can enlarge and shrink his body into a giant or a chibi form. What if Go D. Roger and Rayleigh realized the importance of the Monkey D family when he saw Joy Boy at Laugh Tale? For example, Wizard of Voice once had a theory that tells the story of Laugh Tale, describing Joy Boy as a monkey. It would be a shocking twist when Luffy is laughing at the story and Robin and the other crew members are staring at Luffy with an insane look, as they realize that Luffy is the monkey, or in other words, Luffy is the Joy Boy that is on the story of Laugh Tale. And so maybe that's why Goldie Roger really wanted Monkey D. Garp to be the one to raise Ace. After all, Goldie Roger believed that maybe Ace could be Joy Boy since he said that Ace would be the one to find the One Piece. So Roger may have been trying to force a similar backstory to the original Joy Boy being raised by the Monkey D family. And tying everything back to Rayleigh, Roger is now dead, so maybe this is why Rayleigh believes that Luffy is Joy Boy because now he sees the bigger picture. He likes Luffy because he sees Luffy as someone who changes fate. Because since Rayleigh also knows about the future of Joy Boy and maybe also the connections and importance with the Monkey D family as well similar to Roger. Putting two and two together, after spending a few years with Luffy, he may have realized that Luffy truly is the man that Roger's waiting for. And there's even more evidence to prove that Rayleigh realized Luffy is Joy Boy because when Luffy first meets Rayleigh, the Dark King says, That had fits a fearless man like you, I've always wanted to meet you. Then in chapter 603, Rayleigh began reminiscing about the first time he met Goldie Roger. Roger calls their meeting a fated encounter of destiny. And it gets absolutely crazy when Rayleigh, after remembering this, says, maybe destiny goes on its plotting way. There's no coincidences in the world. Yet Luffy has grown into a man even more worthy of that hat than Roger. This is wild considering we would later see Roger and Rayleigh's journey to Laugh Tale through Odin's flashback. And in this flashback, they learn all about Joy Boy. And they learn about the future prophecies and both the past and future Joy Boys. And they learn about the original owner of the Straw Hat all those years ago. And we know this because we saw Emu staring at the giant Straw Hat in the freezer with Luffy's poster in his hand. And and then Luffy is now finally confirmed to be Joy Boy by Zunisha. So now when we look back at what Rayleigh says, even more worthy of that hat than Roger, you can see that Oda was foreshadowing and showing us that Rayleigh after his two years spent with Luffy fully believed that Luffy would surpass Roger and be even more deserving of that hat than his captain because he realized that Luffy is Joy Boy. <laughs> as Joy Boy is the true symbol of the Straw Hat. And what's even crazier is that Rayleigh talks about no coincidences existing, but Luffy is also known as Straw Hat. I mean, how much more perfect does it get? This dude is the Straw Hat Luffy, known throughout the entire world through this moniker. So of course he's more worthy than Roger and Shanks. I just wish that we could have seen Rayleigh's revelations and reactions to all of this. <laughs> Monkey D. Garp, who was respected by Goldie Roger, also seems to share a resemblance with the Shandian Chief as he has the dog hoodie in the very first appearance and even looks a lot like the design for the Chiefs when we see Wiper in the Sky Pier arc. So once again, maybe hinting at the Monkey D family possibly being an important family of this land. And it also makes you wonder, have Garp and Dragon ever been to Shandora? I mean, if Dragon can fly around or even become wind itself, I wouldn't be surprised if he went up there at one point. Especially considering his face tattoo feels very tribal and similar to the tattoo that we've seen on characters like Wiper. Really early on in the video, I explained how I believe the Monkey D family were the only family of the D clan to survive the purge of the D. Makes sense that most Ds were wiped out as they lost a war to the Celestial Dragons during a void century. But we can also see that if the Monkey D family were royal kings and godly figures of Shandor, that they also were almost wiped out. And we know this because in chapter 272, Robin explains how the city of Shandor was destroyed in a war. She says that the city's books were all burnt and the city history was erased. Well, what does this remind you of? That's right, the Void Century. Proving that Shandor's history was specifically important and erased by Celestial Dragons during the war against the Ancient Kingdom. Robin says that there's no doubt the city once fought against the enemy, and she theorized that the Golden City of Shandor was ruined in the service of protecting the Ponycliff. And she says at the height of its prosperity, insinuating that the Ancient Kingdom was extremely prosperous and a powerful kingdom. Now, the Monkey D fam, if anyone has a 
family of warriors with extremely powerful wills and resolve would be the one family to survive and keep Shandor alive. While many of the city was destroyed, we do still have it around. In chapter 1085, Emu mentions how the D once opposed the celestial dragons and speaks of the D as if they were eradicated. For example, Emu tells Cobra how none of these remaining D members know the true meaning of D and its importance. Well, this doesn't seem to really add up. For starters, why is Cobra asking Emu and the go to say about the D? This implies that Lily, who existed during the void century, even she didn't know the meaning of the D. Otherwise, she would have explained what it was in the letter that was passed down to Cobra. It very well could be that D is Dawn, and that's what she was trying to hint at in the letter. But if it's something so simple and obvious, why not just spell it out completely? And so this is where I begin to look deeper into this chapter, where I discovered something massive. You see, in this chapter, Oda gives us this funny little gag, Sa-Di-Bo, with Ace and Luffy giving Sabo the will of the initial. But what if I told you this was a major key? Because I believe that Sabo in this chapter was actually meant to very purposely parallel and symbolize Lily. You see, Sabo grew up with his brothers Luffy and Ace. However, Sabo was originally a member of a royal family. And this is the first parallel that I believe shows the similarities between Lily and Sabo who are both featured in this chapter. Lily was a royal member and who would have became a celestial dragon, while Sabo was also a royal member of a high status elite family. Sabo teaming up with two D members, Luffy and Ace. I believe Lily betrayed the celestial dragons after realizing that she chose the wrong side. After the world government wiped out the D clan and I'm assuming her friend, the great warrior of liberation, Joy Boy. The reason Emu suspected Lily of having the D was through her mistakes, releasing the pony glyphs of the entire world, intentionally betraying the celestial dragons. Now if we go back to Ace and Luffy making Sabo a D member, I've theorized that this scene is telling us that the will of D can be passed down to other people, but only by other D members. In the past there may have been some grand ritual or maybe it was as simple as a simple sake ritual, but regardless this theory became even more likely after chapter 1086, because even the Gorose are speculating that Sabo is a D member as he is naturally tied to many D members by fate. And so after Queen Lily realized that she chose the wrong side and regretted defeating Joy Boy, she met up with the few remaining D clan members who did survive the war. This is where the Monkey D family comes in, because I believe a surviving member of the Monkey D family inducted Lily and her lineage as a new family of the D clan to help carry on the clan's ideals. I believe they chose her after they realized that she truly stood with them, releasing the pony glyphs to the entire world. And a quick little side note, but I really do believe that Lily had the pawpaw fruits, and this was how she went missing after she disappeared in the blink of an eye through the pawpaw powers, and this was also how she dispersed the pony glyphs. In a literal and symbolic sense now, Lily is inheriting the will of D and carrying it on to the future generation. And after this, Lily and these few remaining D members may have chosen the next families to induct to the D clan. Like maybe Maybe she chose the Gold family and the Trafalgar family, looking for survivors who would honor Joy Boy's legacy. She may have spent her final days helping the D Clan as much as she could. This theory works on the premise that someone from the D Clan had to survive. And who better than a legendary Monkey D general, like an ancient Luffy or Garp like man? Or maybe the reason why no one knows the true meaning of the D is because the only survivor of the D Clan at that time was actually a young D member, like a young boy from the D Clan who didn't even know the truth about the meaning. Now see, if you think about it, if Luffy earns the title of king, it's very possible that the previous Joy Boy of the past was also a king. I've spoken about it for a couple years now, but I believe the ancient kingdom was a kingdom of pirates, and that would explain the gold that was in Shandora, because after all, what's a pirate paradise without a bunch of golden riches? Same way Wano was also most likely once allied or part of the ancient kingdom as the land of gold, and the place where the pony glyphs are written. I believe this pirate land was a place of freedom, and a place where people who seek liberty could exist, a pirate haven or pirate paradise. And so my theory that Luffy's dream is to create a pirate paradise was furthered when Blackbeard refers to a pirate kingdom as his dream. I think it was the hint that Blackbeard's dream is the same as Luffy's. A pirate paradise as well, but of course it would be a different vision for this pirate kingdom and I'll leave a link to where I talk about this more, about Blackbeard and Luffy's dream. I also believe that this was Roger's dream and Luffy's vision is closer to where Roger dreamed of where Blackbeard most likely has a similar vision for his kingdom as Zebek. That also adds to Roger saying that he wishes he could see Joy Boy Zero, as Roger is the most piratey character in the world as the Pirate King. But this Joy Boy era that he speaks of is both Luffy's new pirate era and the original Joy Boy Zero of the past, which is why Luffy is the man that Roger's waiting for. The land of pirates would be directly opposing the world government. The world government paints pirates as villains and evil devils for simply existing, because becoming a pirate is seeking freedom. As we explain through Roger's freedom quote when Dragon brings it up, he says, A, a pirate, not a 
bad idea. And this brings up another point, what exactly is the Jolly Roger? The Jolly Roger is the skull and crossbones, so what if Joy Boy was the one who created the first ever Jolly Roger? And then now every Jolly Roger that we see today is a pirate ritual that carries on Joy Boy's will. And if Joy Boy's Jolly Roger was the pirate flag, it may have been also the flag of the ancient kingdom. Lily says to bring back the flag of the dawn, which will make Luffy's straw hat Jolly Roger the new era's flag of the dawn. It's a very common theory that the original Joy Boy is where the straw hat originates from, as we see Emu looking at the giant straw hat in the freezer while holding Luffy's bounty poster. It's interesting because Alabaster's flag is also a sun flag. Also, I believe that Joy Boy is the dawn itself because Toki's quote during Wano says that you are the moon unaware of the dawn, and on this channel we believe that Wano is the moon and Luffy is the dawn. Wano being the moon as the clans of Wano have the moon in their name, but the Sukis like Kozuki and Amatsuki, and Hiyori being the moon princess. Luffy is the dawn because he's the sun god bringing back the era of dawn and light to Wano after these 20 years of darkness. And on a larger scale, you could expand this riddle to the entire world, because once Luffy becomes pirate king, and we see that pirate kingdom that Luffy always dreamed of, this will bring the dawn to the entire world. If Shanks and Luffy don't stop Blackbeard, he's going to destroy the world by getting his hands on by the end of this video, you'll know what I just censored. After researching, analyzing, and rereading every Shanks and Blackbeard chapter, I finally figured out Blackbeard's true goal and it's mind blowing. After putting all the pieces together, I finally know how Blackbeard and Shanks story ends with Oda foreshadowing a battle between them during Marineford. By the end of the video, you'll understand exactly what Blackbeard is after and why I'm now 100% sure that Shanks was speaking to the Godose about Teach. How a fight between Blackbeard and Shanks will change One Piece forever and stick around to the very end of the video for a crazy surprise that you're probably not expecting. But to understand how I fell down the rabbit hole in the first place, we need to start at chapter 1079 where it all hit me. In this chapter, we find out that Shanks has been searching for Blackbeard. Shanks specifically says, I was sure he'd show up in Wano, meaning that the only reason Shanks even showed up at Wano in the first place was to encounter Blackbeard and face him head on. Now, I really love that Oda adds in this little detail because now we can erase the notion that Oda was simply shoving Shanks into the end of Wano for pure film red promotion and it gives a reason for Shanks moves and actions and a real tangible reason for him making Admiral Greenbull poop his pants like a newborn in Pampers. I like Shanks' calculated side to him, especially when it comes to Blackbeard, as they have plenty of history together with Blackbeard scarring him years ago, and they are true enemies with Blackbeard implying during Marineford when he saw Shanks that they would eventually fight. Shanks even wanted Whitebeard to stop Ace from going after Blackbeard, which makes me wonder, just how long has Shanks been hunting down Blackbeard, and how does Blackbeard manage to continue continually escape Shanks. If you have any ideas, let me know in the comments. When Shanks went to meet with Newgate, he explained that Blackbeard's ambition was so great and his willpower was unimaginable. He warned Whitebeard that through sheer willpower, Blackbeard would aim for the sea of the Yonko, even if it meant removing Whitebeard. Shanks was correct in the sense that Blackbeard did seek out this Yonko's status as he soon became a Yonko after Marineford during the two-year time skip. But even more precise, Shanks was correct about Blackbeard coming after Whitebeard specifically as we see him perform some kind of black magic ritual after he commands his own crew to shoot down Whitebeard. And I always wondered, how did Blackbeard do this? How did he get the good of good Nomi for himself? I think it would be hilarious if Blackbeard just put out a pot of growing fruits, which transformed immediately into the good of good Nomi, and it was that simple. He even fought Marco and the Whitebeard pirates to finally become a Yonko, and when he got his Logia of fruit, he killed his own brother. Blackbeard is a complete menace, backstabbing not only his brothers, but also his own adopted father who he begged to let him on the ship. And this was the moment that I realized Blackbeard is pure evil, truly selfish, an unredeemable person. And Shanks was right, his ambition is truly endless, and his goal is to rise to the top, to create his own pirate paradise of anarchy and chaos, so he can live in a society where he isn't mocked for never showering. Blackbeard is consumed with the chaos of darkness, and this is symbolized by him being a Logia user of the darkness fruit, but he will also bring true destruction as his second trait is symbolized through his other devil fruit, the Guda Guda Nomi. Blackbeard is a true pirate, arguably the most piratey character in all of One Piece, and he's One Piece's take on the true pirate legend, Blackbeard in real life, or Edward Teach. If Blackbeard is chaos and destruction, Shanks is balance and stability. I discussed this more in detail in my greatest Shanks theory ever, that Shanks is able to reason with the Godose because he understands what they really want is a stable world, tranquility that isn't out of 
control and run by evil pirates. But Blackbeard and Luffy have both destroyed the stability of the One Piece world, so this can't be the only reason that Shanks and Blackbeard are at each other's necks. Luffy and Blackbeard simultaneously destroy the reputation of the Warlord system, and have both become newly fledged Yonko and some of the most powerful pirates with insane ambition. <laughs> And somehow, Shanks is caught in the middle of these two. Blackbeard is the opposite to Luffy, as is Foyo where he has very similar traits but a completely different perspective on life. The two cannot stand each other, and with Shanks liking Luffy so much, it only makes sense that he would despise Blackbeard. But the reason I bring this all up is because it almost seems like Shanks has been tied to Blackbeard as far back as we can remember. I mean, I'm sure Shanks was fighting Blackbeard even even all the way back when Roger and Whitebeard pirates fought for three days back in the Odin flashback. That was probably the first time they ever met, fighting non-stop. So to summarize the entire Shanks and Blackbeard timeline, they first met by fighting. Then the red-haired pirates had already had some beef because Blackbeard scarred Shanks. Then we see Shanks talk to Whitebeard about Blackbeard and warn him about his ambition. And in Marine Ford, Blackbeard brings up their destined clash. Finally, now in Wano, we see the trend continue once again with Shanks looking for Blackbeard and trying to confront him, saying he was sure he would have been in Wano, but putting all the pieces together, why am I now 100% sure that Shinx spoke to the Godosei about Blackbeard? Well, if we want to consider Shanks' statements on Blackbeard's ambition, we can assume that Shanks is onto Blackbeard because of his end goals and he wants to prevent Blackbeard's evil plans. Shanks went into Wano after speaking to the Godosei about this certain pirate, so we can assume whatever Blackbeard was planning on doing in Wano is what they were discussing. And what could the most evil, most ambitious man have to do with Wano? Well, when you put it this way, it's quite obvious and simple since during this time when Shanks arrived, it was also when we had just learned something insane. Because we had just found out that Wano was holding the ancient weapon Pluton. Yes, of course this all makes sense. Of course, Blackbeard's goal is to acquire Pluton. Pluton is intrinsically tied to Wano, and what could be more ambitious than this? But before I tell you more about Blackbeard and why he's going after Pluton, make sure to subscribe if you're not already. We have a bunch of power scaling videos coming soon, and plenty of theories involving Luffy and the history of the Monkey D family. So hit that bell like Luffy and Skypea to be notified and never miss a single video. The ancient weapon of the underworld is waiting to be awakened. I believe Shanks and the Godosei are so concerned with the idea of Blackbeard getting his hands on this doomsday weapon. But how did Shanks learn about this being Blackbeard's goal? Well, maybe Kuzan was the one who told him, as Kuzan is now working with Blackbeard. Hey, is it possible that Kuzan talked to Shanks about him going after the ancient weapons? We know Kuzan shows up and tells people things in person after traveling the perilous seas on his ice bike. So if he did tell Shanks, it wouldn't have been traced by Blackbeard. After all, his homie Sal is chilling on Elbath, which we now know is Shanks' territory. It's just one possibility, but it does seem Shanks has put a bit of time and energy into keeping tabs on Blackbeard, so it's likely his entire crew and maybe his entire fleet is keeping an eye and ear out for information on Blackbeard. The thing about Blackbeard that makes him such a concern for Shanks and why he even brought him up to the Godosei in the first place is because Shanks knows Blackbeard's true nature. He knows that Blackbeard is the one person who's crazy enough to get his hands on the ancient weapon. And even worse, he's insane enough to use it for evil and destruction. Shanks highlighting Blackbeard's ambition and hunger for chaos is the key here as Blackbeard would even consider using it against random islands and the world government itself. Which might be why Shanks thought it was important to speak to the Godosei about it. And here's an interesting idea. Idea. What if the world government also know about Pluton's existence in Wano? Maybe Shanks told them, but maybe they've always been researching and investigating Wano. In Water 7, we find out that the world government is seeking the ancient weapons. And similar to in Water 7, they send CP0 members to Wano to constantly deal with Kaido and Orochi in secret. These CP0 members may have been looking into Pluton. We saw them send world government ships, which were separate from Green Bull and the Marines in Chapter 1037 when we first see Zunisha come into Wano. So maybe they were planning on infiltrating Wano to look for Pluton all along. During the Water 7 saga, it was clearly stated by Frankie, Iceberg, and CP0 that Nico Robin had the power to reawaken Pluton. And just like I mentioned, CP0 and Wano investigating the weapon that we know the world government's after, we see a parallel to Ina's lobby where the orders are to eliminate Nico Robin. It seems out of place, it seems random now, but looking back at it, with this theory in mind, it all makes sense. Kaido announced they would go after the ancient weapon 
happens with the new Onigashima project. So is it possible that the world government was afraid of Luffy or even worse, Kaido winning and forcing Robin into this action? But more likely than all of these options, the world government wanted Nico Robin alive as Luffy orders them to capture her and they don't specify the kill. The world government and CP0 going after Nico Robin and Wano seems like a minute random detail because it was overshadowed and forgotten when Luffy transformed into Gear 5. After this, the world government quickly shifted their focus to Luffy. And when the Straw Hats already having Poseidon in Shirahoshi, Pluton being at Wano, it makes you wonder about Uranus. Is it possible that Shanks has Uranus and he's guarding it from anyone insane like Blackbeard? Another possibility could be Dragon. What if Dragon, who is now in a war with the world government, actually has Uranus? I mean, he's going to need some serious firepower. And he too was after Nico Robin for the longest time, calling her the light or the flame of the revolution. I wouldn't be surprised if he was actually interested in awakening the weapons and using them to destroy the celestial dragons. A while ago, I made a video on the Rocks Pirates and I speculated that Rocks got his hands on the ancient weapon Uranus and threatened to destroy the world government at God Valley. My headcanon was that he awakened it and found it at God Valley, but when the Rocks realized that they were going to lose, Zebek realized he didn't want to allow the world government to gain access to the weapon, so he commanded Whitebeard to destroy God Valley after either sinking it or shooting it up into the sky like a knockup stream, taking Uranus and Roxy Zebek with it. And maybe this is why Kaido sees Whitebeard as a traitor and a backstabber, because he doesn't have the full context of what actually happened. And with Blackbeard having many strange connections to Rocks, for example, he has the Will of D, the Saber of Zebek being his ship, he gathered a stacked crew of powerful pirates and making Hachi knows to his base, if I'm anywhere near right and saying Rocks had access to the ancient weapon, this might be how Blackbeard learned about the ancient weapons in the first place. Just like a drunk Whitebeard would tell stories about the gods referencing Lunarians, he may have also brought up the ancient weapons at one point. Even if these drunk memories aren't from God Valley, Roger did tell Whitebeard what he learned when he found the One Piece. We know Whitebeard didn't want to find the One Piece, and maybe part of this is specifically because he had no interest in the weapons and using them. We can see Blackbeard recognize Lunarians when he faced the Mihawk Seraphim, and you can see this almost instinctual shock and fear in their existence when noticing the white hair, the wings, and dark skin, proving he's heard the similar stories that Marco learned from Whitebeard. So maybe it's a stretch to assume that Blackbeard initially learned about the weapons from Whitebeard, but it's just one of the many possibilities that could have inspired him to seek the weapons out and see their power for himself since he was a child. Blackbeard is also a historian. In fact, Oda once said in the SBS that if Blackbeard wasn't a pirate in the real world, he'd be an archaeologist. Blackbeard is intrigued with history and enjoys studying it, but with him being so important, I would expect someone like him to be interested in the void century history. Pony glyphs, archaeology, just like Nico Robin and the Straw Hats have learned about Pluton from the Pony Glyphs, is it possible that Blackbeard simply learned about these weapons from traveling alongside the Whitebeard pirates and researching on his own? We already know Blackbeard is a Devil Fruit enthusiast, so there's one example of him being obsessed with these strange mysteries of the world. Blackbeard is a man with a plan to achieve his dreams. Just like he knew he wanted a very specific Devil Fruit, he might want a very specific ancient weapon. And Blackbeard would be the perfect person for Oda to choose to awaken the ancient weapon for many reasons. So is it possible that Blackbeard returns to Wano? Because now after confirming from Caribou that Pluton is there, I could see him invading Wano in a final war. This would also finally put Luffy directly against Blackbeard as well. Baby, that's what I've been waiting for. That's in a way where Luffy and Blackbeard are now in a war against each other. We know how much Luffy values his friends and him making Wano his territory makes it where Blackbeard attacking is an unforgivable attack against the Emperor. And it would be a good reason to set up Luffy versus Blackbeard from a plot perspective since we already have it set up from the character standpoint. Luffy wants to become but I think Blackbeard is so greedy, so selfish, and so ambitious that he wants to take it a step further and conquer the entire world. And now that you know why Shanks is so adamant on stopping Blackbeard, how will their story and fight play out? I can see Shanks telling the Straw Hats about Blackbeard's goals and ambitions after we see him when Luffy visits Elbath. In fact, I can see Elbath being the location of the final war, or at least the beginning of it, since Elbath is located in War Land. And if red-haired Shanks has the final row pony glyph, it might be a scenario where Blackbeard is finally forced to confront him head on. I can see Blackbeard versus Shanks playing out where Shanks overwhelms him with his hockey, but this might also be where we finally see Blackbeard's awakenings in true power. I do think Blackbeard has strong hockey, not on the level of Shanks and Luffy, but respectable since he was able to scar Shanks before his devil fruits and Shanks hypes up his willpower, which is essentially hockey. I think Blackbeard will have strong hockey, but not to their level because he relies too much on other ways of doing things, which in turn means that he hasn't 
trained up his hockey to the extent they have. It would be pretty cool from a narrative perspective if Shanks was able to scar Blackbeard in their fight. Blackbeard is a Logia, so it would be tough, but paying back the scar that Blackbeard gave him all those years ago would be a cool twist. It's also interesting to see if Blackbeard can combine his two Devil Fruit attacks into one, because this attack would be insanely powerful and possibly Blackbeard's strongest move. And going more into how Blackbeard and Shanks are opposites, Blackbeard is slow, greasy, and fat, and Shanks is what I call the fastest character in all of One Piece. I mean seriously, after chapter 1079, I don't want to hear any more Lucky Roo is faster, or Kizaru is the fastest, or Sanji. Can we just accept that God King Shanks is the fastest character in the entire story? Despite Shanks being so overwhelmingly fast, I think in the back of our minds we understand that it won't really matter. I mean, Blackbeard having his darkness devil fruit can potentially distort speed with gravity altering black holes. When he was facing Law, he took one of the biggest hits and with his devil fruit the damage was multiplied but he still got back up and fought even more. And this might be why Blackbeard hates fighting strong opponents and why he seems like a coward. He's not afraid in the sense that he'll lose but he's afraid from the insane PTSD and absurd pain that he feels being amplified every time he fights. Think about Zoro in that nothing happened moment but Blackbeard's getting hit with this every single time. I think somehow Blackbeard will disprove Kaido's philosophy that hockey is supreme because for a while now everyone's accepting this as a fact but if anyone could show us otherwise it would be Blackbeard since he has multiple devil fruits. I wouldn't be surprised if Blackbeard ends up killing Shanks or if Shanks sacrifices himself in their fight stopping Blackbeard from destroying the world completely. And this brings me to Blackbeard awakening Pluton. He could command San Juan Wolf to pull Pluton out of Wano or he could use the Gouda Gouda Nomi to push it out by shifting the tectonic plates. And everything from here on out is just how I imagine this entire situation playing out. Once Pluton is in the hands of Blackbeard he would start off by one shotting a random island similar to the Dead Star scene in Star Wars and then you'd see him laughing like a crazy madman with a terrifying <laughs> Blackbeard will aim straight for the world government after flexing his new power, and this might be where we see Frankie return to Water 7 and create the new anti-Pluton. After all, the original was created in Water 7, so it's only right. But all of this is going on, Blackbeard will continue to face off against the combined efforts of Marines, world government, and anyone standing in his way as he makes a charge towards Mary Joa. Blackbeard will use the Gouda Gouda Nomi to split the earth. He will launch tsunamis at the world government and use the darkness fruit to engulf the entire island of Mary Joa into dark darkness as he conquers the holy land. If Whitebeard had the power to destroy the world, Blackbeard has the balls to actually do it. And this moment during Marine Fort where Sengoku says this might be foreshadowing. Because Whitebeard has control and was a way more reasonable person, but Blackbeard is completely insane and his ambition completely surpasses Whitebeard's goals. He'll test his strength to the fullest capabilities, using the Gouda Gouda Nomi's full power on display and pure destruction, while Pluton is simultaneously wrecking havoc. Blackbeard will be destroying continents with one hand and devouring the world into darkness with the other. And it even makes me wonder, could he potentially split the red line apart? And how much force would it take as he does this legendary feat? No one can stop him until the red haired pirates finally show up and slow him down enough for Frankie and the Straws to arrive with the anti-Pluton. Blackbeard's Pluton launches a giant laser beam which is enough to take out an island, but Shanks manages to somehow slice through this insane immense power destroying the blast completely. This takes a severe amount of energy in hockey but eventually after blocking these island feeded attacks, Blackbeard joins the battle as Shanks is getting in the way of his ambitions. Now Shanks and the Red Hair Pirates are facing Blackbeard, Pluton, and the Blackbeard Pirates all together. And while they fight for a while and are on even terms, eventually Blackbeard comes in and gets Pluton to launch another attack at the islands while they're fighting and Shanks has to leap in at the last second sacrificing his entire body. Blackbeard finally puts a nail in the coffin and finishes off Shanks as the Red Hair Pirate is now dead. <laughs> While all hope seems lost, the Straw Hats finally arrive and it's too late. Luffy now prepares for their final battle, which will determine the true king of the pirates. He's enraged by seeing Shanks on the ground, and he sends Frankie and his crew to deal with Pluton and the other Blackbeard pirates. In the beginning, Luffy is running across the platforms, but Blackbeard uses the Gouda Gouda Nomi to destroy any type of footing he has, so Luffy jumps into gear 4 Bowman and begins soaring around, landing huge punches, clashing with Blackbeard's Gouda Gouda Nomi infused quake punches and splitting the heavens. 
heavens. The force is so large that they both fly back, and Blackbeard begins laughing with a crazed laugh once again, and brings up how this fight is destined just like the one with Days. Remembering his dead brother, and now which Shanks dying to Blackbeard, Luffy takes his fight against this evil monster more seriously than ever. This funny Joy Boy persona turns into a terrifying smile that worries Blackbeard. It's his first time seeing it in person. Gear 5. Luffy more than anyone does not play around when it comes to his friends, so this will make Blackbeard Luffy's best fight from a narrative perspective, as it's Luffy's most personal battle as he was responsible for Shanks' death, the man who inspired Luffy to become a pirate in the first place. Blackbeard would unleash the full darkness upon the world, and I also think Blackbeard would create a solar eclipse during his fight, symbolizing him swallowing up the sun god or the world's hope. But while all this seems lost, and it seems as Blackbeard has devoured Luffy in darkness, Luffy's Gear 5 sun god emerges, and finishes finishes off Blackbeard with the full combined force of an attack that is as hot as the sun, a punch so powerful that it is charged with more congruous hockey than a badgering gun. Luffy yells, Shanks was my friend, as his fist is oozing with advanced hockey and the multiplied force and pain is so much that Blackbeard is knocked out, becoming unresponsive due to the pure shock. The battlefield is completely destroyed due to Blackbeard and the war going on between the two Plutons, and as everything is crumbling, Luffy escapes with the Straw Hats and the surviving Red Hair Pirates. Frankie finally launches a final attack against Pluton and the Blackbeard Pirates, and they begin to sink into the ocean, becoming the first ever time we see a character die from a devil fruit drowning. The Rock's Pirates are the equivalent to the Avengers assembling, a dream team of some of the most powerful pirates the entire One Piece story has ever seen. Whitebeard, Big Mom, Young Kaido, and their insane captain with the ambition to conquer the world, Rocks D. Zebek. But how strong were the Rocks Pirates actually? I've been researching the Rocks Pirates for the last week and what I've uncovered is insane. In order to explain the Rock's pirate strength, I need to first start by explaining what I call the Rock's philosophy theory. You see, the Rock's pirates were known for being so chaotic, so aggressive, and so hostile. According to Sengoku, the Rocks were even known for fighting each other. Essentially, if any petty argument or disagreement came up, everything was resolved with hands. This was a brutal, aggressive, and violent culture they created, but I believe this is the key to the Rock's pirate strength. When you throw a completely insane individuals like Big Mom, Shiki, Kaido all in the same room, there's only so much time before they start fighting. Whitebeard even backs up Sengoku's statements when he meets Odin in Wano saying, you're not the type of person who has served someone else, and I know what happens when you get people like that together in a group, as he's hesitant to allow Odin to join his crew because of how he lived as a rocks pirate. Another character who fits into this is Kaido, because you know Kaido, he has that complete survival of the fittest mentality, someone who as a child was being used as a super soldier fighting against entire armies. Kaido is someone who loves fighting strong opponents and we see this in his fight against Luffy and how big their smiles both become. So of course this would be Kaido's mentality, but it makes you question why Rox wanted to recruit Kaido. Obviously for his strength, but what if also because Kaido's philosophy matches up so perfectly with the Rox philosophy? I think you can see where I'm going with this. Rox intentionally wanted to spark and create a culture around his crew where the crew would be constantly fighting, constantly attempting to take each other's lives. Rox these a bit created the toughest and most brutal crew because in order to survive here and in order to take over the world, they would need insanely tough individuals who are prepared for anything. Now the key to the Rock's philosophy and why it's so important is because I'm about to prove why Rock's Dizabek had the greatest hockey the One Piece world has ever seen. Even more powerful than Kaido, Shanks, Whitebeard, and even Roger. Rayleigh reveals the greatest truth about hockey and confirms to Luffy that although he trained Luffy to the best of his abilities in hockey, it only truly blossoms in the extreme conditions of a real battle. Think about how Luffy learned Future Sight. He saw Katakuri use it relentlessly and was forced through sheer willpower to learn it for the survival of his crew. Without this highly intensive fight against the Donut Eating Mochi Man, Luffy's hockey would have never surpassed its limits. We also see this once again later on with Kaido as he is one shot. It hits so hard, but he comes back again and again, and while facing Kaido soaring through the sky, he steadily keeps growing stronger. It's almost like Luffy's hockey kept getting stronger every time he got back up. And if you've ever seen Dragon Ball, you'll like this reference as we've seen hockey work in a Zenkai boost like state more and more throughout the post time scheme, continuously exceeds its limits even more. He unlocked advanced conqueror's techniques in battle as he was forced to facing against a Yonko Kaido. And the final proof of this is the fact that ever since the beginning of the post time skip, Luffy wanted to go straight after Kaido and the rest of Yonko. We even know how excited Luffy is by fighting, but 
he knows the tree code that is facing off against stronger enemies that exceed him entirely, facing off against the true hockey masters. And this is why I believe Luffy is so eager and excited to finally take down Big Mom, Kaido, and of course Shanks by confronting them head on. Now with all of this, let's apply a bet to the Rocks Pirates because I believe that by fighting to the death constantly, the Rocks Pirates bloom their hockey to an insane and rapid growth. From Future Sight to Conqueror's Coding, from Rio to Unbreakable Ornament, this constant fighting is actually the most terrifying thing about the crew. This is an insane way of life, a truly monstrous willpower is needed to be the captain of this crew. But I imagine Rocks would have had to fight Whitebeard and Big Mom at one point as he gains their absolute respect by bringing them into his crew. And it's because of this that you can only imagine how powerful Rocks the Zebex hockey was. And I will be breaking this down later in the video. But with this in mind, we can finally answer the question, how strong were the Rocks pirates actually? And we're going to be focusing on the Rocks during the God Valley incident as this was obviously their peak strength. But first, if you've liked any of these videos, subscribe if you have not already. Hit that bell like Luffy and Skype here to be notified every time we upload. We have a few massive theories coming soon. We have even more massive power scaling videos like this for every crew, every character, and you're not gonna wanna miss any. Let's start out with Prime Big Mom. Big Mom is one of the most underrated villains in the entire series, but in her prime, she was even more terrifying. At her peak, she was close to strength in comparison to the strongest man, Whitebeard, and the pirate king, Goldie Roger. With her devil fruit, she could create giant armies of homies, endlessly regenerate with their soul snatching, and Big Mom is like a terrifying horror boss battle. And for all you sickos saying, I let Prime Big Mom suck my soul, you need to chill, man. Big Mom is big, but she's surprisingly quick too. But we've seen younger Big Mom and she was a lot more slim, so I'm guessing she was much faster than she is in her old age. The fact that Big Mom can create fire and lightning gods and fight with them is insane, but when it comes to Big Mom at God Valley, she would have been much stronger than she is right now because physically, Big Mom is the definition of a superhuman. Hockey-wise, like I explained, there's no doubt that her hockey would have bloomed, but in the end, I believe Big Mom was the third strongest Rocks crew member after Rocks and Whitebeard. During this prime, she would have been on par with the likes of someone like Sengoku, one of the strongest and most terrifying pirates, and most likely the strongest female pirate that has ever lived. Remember, Big Mom was taking out giants when she was only a child, an absolute menace. In her fight with Kid and Law, Kid slaps a magnet on her head, slams her into a metal tower, and Big Mom rips it out fighting against the magnetic force and uses the tower as a shield. Now imagine what ridiculous willpower and physical toughness she would have had 38 years ago. Big Mom's biggest weakness though has to come from how absurdly stupid and mentally unstable she is. I'd like to give her the benefit of the doubt and say that this has gotten worse as a byproduct of her age, but we can't rule this out completely since there's a great chance that Big Mom has always been mentally insane and childlike and just dumb. You're so stupid, you're stupid. Next up we have Golden Lion Shiki and I'm guessing a lot of you believe that Golden Lion Shiki was even stronger than Big Mom but honestly I have him a little bit behind Big Mom. Shiki's devil fruit allowed him to fly as he could levitate himself or other objects after he's touched them. He had insane ambition to take over the world and he went absolutely berserk on the marines after he found out about Roger's execution. Shiki is a weird one, he's so insane but he almost feels like a Dragon Ball villain. You can't take him too seriously he's almost comedically evil. He seems to be somewhat cool with Roger and Whitebeard years after the God Valley incident. And even though Garp and Sengoku had to take on Shiki together, it was impressive to see him fight against both. He's also the only person to break out of Impel Town alone, tearing his legs off with Shackled him and flying out the prison with his devil fruit. The willpower that this takes is what terrifies me the most about Shiki and it makes me believe that Shiki was a conquer hockey user. But with all this being said, how strong was he during his time with the Rocks crew? He's a hard one to gauge for sure since most of what we know about him came from his promo volume 0 for his movie Strong World. I actually watched Strong World for the first time last year and something that's not hard to gauge is Shiki's incredible dance moves. I want to say Shiki during the God Valley incident was one of the strongest members in the crew for sure. I would put him around the same strength as someone like Odin and remember that these pirates would still grow stronger later in life. So I believe that Shiki at this point was a top 10 strongest character in the One Piece world but just behind the top top tiers. I put him below Prime Big Mom but even being in the same tier the same sentence as someone as monstrous as Big Mom is a feat of its own. But you let me know in the comments if you disagree. Now what about Kaido? Kaido is a beast, pun intended, a survivor 
survivor of the legendary Oni race. He's massive, naturally tough, and born more powerful than most average humans by a long shot. When I look at young Kaido, I look at him like a young Luffy or Zoro. He's walking around 20 or 21 at that time, and he's being recruited to the Rocks specifically. This means that Rocks himself saw the potential in the Drunk Dragon. We also know that Kaido received his Dragon Devil Fruit that day at God Valley, which must have given him a significant boost. Even if he couldn't fully control it, as he probably couldn't immediately fly and levitate islands from the jump, he probably also couldn't use the hybrid form right away. But the skills, the durability, the toughness, and the overall strength is an instant boost. Hockey wise, Kaido must have been a monster despite his age and same for his raw fighting capability. If I have to give a range for Kaido's strength during this time, I'd say he was as strong as a post Wano Zoro during the God Valley incident. Not quite yet on the strength of a Yonko, but still impressive to say the least. While Kaido may not be as strong as the top members of the Rock's crew, he makes up for this as he could be utilized as one of the best fighters. There's only so many characters that are better at fighting from a raw talent perspective. I'd say that after Rocks, Big Mom, Shiki, and Whitebeard, it's likely that Kaido was the fifth strongest member of this crew. And just hearing that sounds absurd. Now what about the scientist of the crew, Miss Buckingham Stussy? Considering Stussy should have been the scientist of the crew, she shouldn't be very strong, right? Wrong. After seeing Stussy's clone and what she's capable of, she's made a mockery of CP0's Luchi and Kaku. Albeit this is a clone of the former Rocks pirate, but if Stussy was even remotely close to this strength, it just goes to show how deep the Rocks crew ran. To the point where even the scientist was a problem. Luchi couldn't even keep up with Stussy, that's how quick she was, and because of the lineage factor alterations that happens from Devil Fruits, it's likely that the original Stussy had this bat or vampire succubus devil fruit powers as well. I don't think her strength is anywhere near the top dogs of the crew like Big Mom or Whitebeard, but Stussy even being the 6th, 7th, or 8th member of the crew is a terrifying notion to consider. Because she is the first successful clone, I'm guessing Stussy doesn't have any insane modifications like the Seraph and Pacifista. And if this is true, this will make the OG Rocks members all the more impressive. Strength wise, she's higher than Luchi, so I'm going somewhere around maybe a little bit below the first Yonko commander range. It's tough to know if this was just a fluke, but I was very impressed with Whitebeard's baby mama. Up next, we have Captain John, Wang Ji, and Silver X. Captain John was a legendary treasure hunter, as his treasure is even known by Buggy and sought after decades later. Maintaining the respect of the Rocks and other members, it seems like Rocks specifically sought after powerful pirates so that he could overthrow the world government and become king of the world. We know that Captain John was a swordsman, and considering Mordia went after powerful corpses like Ors and Ryuma, I wouldn't be surprised if John was also as strong as Stussy, or maybe even stronger. Now when it comes to Wang Zhi, also known as Ochoku, and then we also have Silver Axe, I like to think that they are powerful as well. If there's a great chance these are the weaker members, but because of the Rock's philosophy, we have to assume that they're at least decently powerful. This gives them a little bit more respect and legendary status, however, not quite on the level of the top tiers. Considering we know Roger and Rayleigh were at God Valley, it makes you wonder, what about the rest of the Roger pirates? For example, if Scopper Gabin was already on Roger's crew at that time, I could see him being the perfect matchup for someone like Silver Axe since we see Gaban wielding dual axes during the Odin flashback. If this theory is true, then we have to put some respect on Silver Axe at the very least since we know that Gaban is a powerful member of the Pirate King stat crew. There's really nothing to go off when predicting how strong these three are, so this scenario is where once again I'm choosing to believe the hype. I'm fully buying in and I'm upscaling quite a bit due to how brutal and aggressive the crew was. They had to be at least decently powerful to gain the respect of Sengoku as he mentioned them during this chapter and the fight against Roger and Garb's combined efforts. As you can see, I've left the best for last. Well, the best too. But before we get to Whitebeard and Rocks, consider leaving a super thanks in the comments with your hottest One Piece takes for a chance to be featured in a future video. Our goal is to go full time on YouTube, so if you want to help us reach this goal, you can also check out our Patreon in the description. Thanks for all your constant support. Whitebeard or Edward Newgate is known as the world's strongest man. Physically, I would argue there's no one on his level. One thing we don't know is if Whitebeard already ate his devil fruit before he joined the Rocks Pirates. It's possible that he ate it after God Valley because believe it or not, Whitebeard wasn't even in his prime until a few years after the God Valley incident. So this means that he either ate his devil fruit, fought some insane battles against some of the most powerful pirates after they split up. I'm talking guys like Roger, Kaido, Sengoku, Big Mom, because there has to be something that pushed him into his peak, getting stronger before he finally started his crew. I can see it going both ways, but one reason I actually believe Whitebeard already had his devil fruit while he was with the Rocks Pirates is because we know
know God Valley disappeared and on this channel if you watch our ultimate God Valley theory, we make the case for Whitebeard launching God Valley into the sky with his devil fruit like a knock up stream. Now of course, it's all speculation but if anyone could do it, it would be a younger Whitebeard with a fruit that gives him the power to destroy the world. I believe Whitebeard was essentially Rox de Zebek's right hand man, the first commander of the Rox pirates, the second strongest at that time and the core of the crew who kept everything together. He would have had to be strong to face off against Big Mom, Kaido, Shiki, and even Zebek on a regular basis. And with how crazy Rox de Zebek seems, there's no doubt in my mind that these pirates were going on absurd missions which would lead to fighting against powerful marines like Sengoku and Garp. We also know Rox was Roger's greatest enemy which means that these guys would have already been facing against Roger and Rayleigh many times while the crew was still intact. But aside from superhuman strength, Whitebeard is also respectively fast and one of the greatest fighters in One Piece. He's mature, focused, a true warrior. In Marineford, we saw how calm, how collected he was as a true leader in the middle of a war. And I think this makes Whitebeard the strongest first commander that we've ever seen, even stronger than guys like Ben Beckman, Sabo, and Zoro. What puts Whitebeard over the edge is the insane fact that he was a rival to Goldie Roger and Strength. He had a 5 billion berry bounty, and Whitebeard is known as the world's strongest. If we consider that this guy also has ridiculous hockey clashing with Roger and a willpower that makes him a conqueror, we know that Whitebeard was an absolute monster, even if he wasn't at his peak strength yet. Now, if we give him that devil fruit, it's a truly terrifying opponent that only the most powerful characters even stand a chance against. You have to imagine that he was definitely fighting up against Roger, Garp, and Rayleigh, and hell, I'll even throw him Bogart just for fun. <laughs> At this time, I like to say that he was definitely a top 5 strongest characters in the entire One Piece world, only behind his captain and Monkey D. Garp. He was also on the same level as the future pirate king, Gold D. Roger. Now, if Whitebeard, Big Mom, Kaido, Shiki, and everyone else on the same crew isn't already hype enough, it's finally time to look towards the man who had the ambition, the respect and authority, the raw power to rein in these absolute beasts, the monstrous pirates into one combined goal to conquer the world. Essentially, this is the man who was the biggest conqueror of them all. It's finally time to break down how strong was Rox de Zebek. <laughs> always wanted to make this video. The God Valley Rocks Pirates chapter is my single favorite chapter in the entire series. I remember yelling out in excitement at the mere thought of the crew, but the star at the center of this event was definitely Rocks de Zebek. The first thing to consider is that Rocks de Zebek had to be, he had to be at least on par with Prime Beard and Prime Roger. And the reason I say this is because as the captain, we know that Rocks had to be even stronger than Whitebeard at God Valley. And since Whitebeard didn't even reach his prime until years later, we can assume that Rox was around that peak Whitebeard strength already. We don't know much about Rox as his name has been lost to history, only remembered by the Great Ones. How old was he? What race was he? Did he have a devil fruit? These are the questions and answers that we need as this information would be valuable to be way more precise with his strength. You see, I could sit here and try to convince you that Rox de Zebek was a Lunarian who cut off his wings because of his Jolly Roger showing a flame or demon horn, and the fact that all three Rox members in Wano are the only characters to show knowledge on Lunarians until Egghead. But the fact that I don't even have to do this is what shows how respected Rox de Zebek is. We all just fully accept that no matter how how the explanation Rox is quite simply built different. You can see how tall he is in comparison to Big Mom, Kaido, and Whitebeard, which makes me think that he was a lot closer to Shanks or Garp size. And we know he had a sword when he fought at God Valley and he had to be strong in hockey. But you see, this is where I have my hottest take of the video because I believe that Rox de Zebek is even stronger than Prime Whitebeard and Prime Roger due to the fact that I believe that Zebek had the most unbelievably powerful hockey, a willpower so terrifyingly unmovable. I think that by the end of the series, the only character who will surpass Rox in hockey will be Luffy. In One Piece, ambition is somewhat symmetrical to power and potential. Now, I'm not saying that Rox de Zebek was leagues ahead of Roger or leagues ahead of Whitebeard. I'm saying they're all on the same tier, but if I had to pick, I'd pick Rox de Zebek. He was someone who wanted to go directly at the world government like an insane war general and going directly at the world government is some Luffy level energy. Luffy has shown this in Ina's lobby but imagine if you really pissed off Luffy. I mean he was ready to charge into Mary Joa until Zoro stopped him but Rox de Zebek is just going straight at these guys. There's no doubt in my mind that Zebek's hockey had to be ahead of his crew because otherwise these insane big moms, shikis, and even whitebeards might fight him and overthrow him. Rox had the confidence to bring this crew together 
together. He had the confidence to earn all their respect. And he had the confidence to challenge the world. And sure, yeah, he could have shown his crew some cool treasure. But ultimately, this crew was built on the foundation of strength. I mean, Kaido purely respects strength. Whatever we saw Shanks do at Wano, Rox had that type of power. The power that can be felt from the opposite coast of the island. Also, being Roger's greatest enemy, in my opinion, this implies that he was always stronger than Roger while they were both alive. I mean, maybe, and I'll give credit to Garp here because I think it's possible that Garp was on par with Rox during God Valley. Because to be fair, he is one of the main stars of this show just as much as Rox was. But personally, I have Rox ahead of Garp. And so I'm not saying that Rox needs a big, is leagues ahead of Whitebeard and Rox. Roger, but it's just a matter of having to pick between these legends is always going to be a close call. But at the end of the day, it's no fun unless we pick one over the other. Is it possible that Rox had a busted devil fruit as well? Maybe a Logia or maybe a mythical zone? It's unclear. However, if Rox did all of this while still being able to swim, that's even more impressive. And even if he did have a good devil fruit, it makes him all the more broken of a fighter. I actually do think that he could have a unique devil fruit that we haven't even seen yet since the Yonkos that derived from this crew and even Shiki all had amazing powerful fruits. I mean Kaido's devil fruit is my favorite fruit in the entire series and he ate it during this time at God Valley with the crew. If I had to choose a fruit for Zebek, imagine if he was the previous owner of the Yami Yami Nomi before Blackbeard. With the parallels between the two, that would be absolutely insane. On their own, the Rocks Pirates are already extremely powerful, but as a unit there's almost no one except a team up from Roger, Rayleigh, Garp, and of course Bogart that could take on these monsters. Imagine Shiki flying around levitating multiple marine battleships and chucking them across the ocean. Then you have Whitebeard taking out fleas left and right with his tsunamis. Meanwhile, Kaido is turning into a giant dragon and blasting away hordes of enemies. With all these conquerors, you can imagine any fodder being brought to their knees with a powerful presence alone. I think the fact that Rox is known as Roger's first and greatest enemy backs up the idea that the crew had battles even before God Valley. Let's say we put the Rox pirates up against other pirates. It's crazy to think that at some point Roger could have lost to Zabeg, Rayleigh could have lost to Whitebeard, and Gaban would have lost to Shiki or Big Mom even before the God Valley incident. And this is why the Marines needed to join forces with one of the most renowned pirate crews. Normally, Zabeg alone is enough to cause insane damage, but adding these other pirates is simply overkill. If anyone had the chance to take over the world, it was definitely Roxy Zabeg. And with a gold this grand, it's only fitting. He put together a legit super team. The one factor that could have limited the full potential of the Rocks pirates is ironically what makes them strong, their bonding culture as a crew. But so many pirates that hate each other and are constantly at odds fighting, it's tough to know if in the end this strengthened or threatened their chemistry. Was it a love-hate relationship or did they just hate each other's guts completely? Obviously from Whitebeard's perspective, it's clear that he had grown tired of this nonsense. But then there's other examples like Big Mom and Kaido who have a very close bond in their youth. Big Mom even goes out of her way to go and look for Kaido after God Valley. They have a very brother sister like bond but putting their differences aside when they came together i believe the rocks pirates are the single most powerful pirate crew ever assembled and i don't know if there will ever be another crew to match the notoriety of the rocks that is except one crew that i think we all know has a shot at it and that is luffy and the straw hat pirates justice change shape depending on where you stand and that's what makes kuzan such an interesting character as he's written in a way where we always question where he truly stands. Kuzan is One Piece's most compelling character and by the end of this video I can guarantee that you'll agree. We'll start out by analyzing this character in depth and going into many theories just to get some answers on this mysterious Iceman. What are his intentions, goals, and motivations? What is Kuzan's role in the overarching story of One Piece? Is he truly a pirate or a marine undercover? Kuzan has a fascinating story here as someone who went from a marine admiral to a member of the evil Blackbeard Pirates. Today we'll be answering all of this and so much more because I've spent the last two weeks researching and rereading every chapter involving Kuzan and scouring the internet for any glimpse of clues to help us better understand a character. And through this process, I came across many shocking revelations leading me to believe that no one really truly understands Kuzan. For example, I think I finally solved what Kuzan's dream is, leading us to better understand his character as a whole. I also believe that Kuzan has the will of D. And I believe that Kuzan manipulated the entire Enos Lobby Buster Call event, essentially making this guy responsible for the destruction of one of the most important military bases while he was still a marine admiral. And finally, we'll be looking at Kuzan's dynamics to Garp and more importantly, Blackbeard. With Garp and Blackbeard saving Kuzan just like Luffy has saved many of his own crewmates from their lowest moments ever. This video will change
gains your entire perspective on Kuzan, and I am so excited. But first, before we jump in, make sure you leave a like to support us. It really helps us get this video out to as many people as possible. So where does Kuzan's heart lie within the massive world of One Piece? Is Kuzan a pirate or a marine? But what if I told you that the answer to this question is that Kuzan is the only character in One Piece who is truly both? Now, I know that sounds like a cop-out answer, but by the end of the video, you'll understand what I mean. And there's actually a really interesting and compelling reason to why I believe this. Kuzan began his career as a marine, idolizing the greatest marine to ever live, Prime Gar. It's like Kobe coming into the league idolizing Michael Jordan, which is ironic because we all know who the true pink mamba is. Oh yeah, the guy whose name is literally Kobe. But you have to imagine what Garp's impact must have been on the marines at that time. This was someone who was up there with Goldie Roger on the opposite spectrum, but someone who carries the same respect and influence on the entire world. Garp is One Piece's version of a true superhero, a Superman, All Might, or Mr. Incredible-like figure. So it only makes sense that coming up as a young marine, Kuzan would look up to Garp as this one figure would drive his passion into another level. We even see in volume 0, a younger Kuzan fawning over Prime Garp, who just turned down the admiral position saying you're so cool garp -san. It's important to acknowledge the impact that Garp had on Kuzan because it's where his entire journey starts. In chapter 1081, we find out that Kuzan sees Kobe as his replacement, the new golden child of the marines, replacing him as Garp's protege who would carry on his will through the marines. And Kuzan even explains how Garp's influence on him is the entire reason for his actions leaving the marines and joining the Blackbeard Pirates. But to understand this, we need to first understand Garp's sense of justice, because Kuzan is referencing what I believe is Garp's free justice. I eventually want to make an entire video on Garp's character, but for now we'll only focus on his importance and influence on Kuzan's character. In a weird way, despite being the greatest marine ever, Garp is essentially the closest thing a marine could ever become to a pirate. And so it makes sense that his apprentice would actually become a pirate, taking this lesson of freedom a step further. Garp truly values the marines as an organization, but he values freedom overall, his own free will, the free will of others. And this is where he runs into issues, as he's someone who's known for acting on his own. Like in this situation, for example, going to Hachinosu to save Kobe, he speaks his mind out loud for everyone to hear. As we see him trashing the celestial dragons in front of Steli. <laughs> And Garp just simply does not obey orders when he doesn't want to. For example, as we saw in Water 7, when he doesn't capture Luffy and tells Sengoku straight up to his face that he chose not to because it's his grandson. Garp is someone who simply does as he pleases, an uncontrollable giga chat force of justice. He also hates Celestial Dragons, who takes away people's freedom as they have many slaves to do their bidding and force women that they find beautiful into slavery. At the end of the day, this freedom over all nature had a huge impact on Kuzan's upbringing as he learned from the go. Combining this with the fact that this very nature led to the most respected marine in the entire organization's history and resulted in a powerful legend capable of battling the most powerful pirate in existence like Zebek, Roger, and Whitebeard. And it's understandable to see what Kuzan means when he says, I love that about you, which is why I live the way I do now, referencing Garp's free nature to live in the moment and do what he feels right, regardless of the consequences or societal pressure. But another interesting thing about Garp's lesson that Kuzan did not follow, unlike this free will, is that Garp says that he taught Kuzan that way Wavering is a sign of weakness, and this hits hard, literally as Garp palms Kuzan's face like he's Vince Carter and dumps his face into the ground with a blue hole. But also on a more personal level, as Kuzan is clearly someone who's extremely conflicted and always been a wavering character, which we're about to dive into next. Once a marine prodigy, and now the 10 Titanic captain of Blackbeard's pirates, there's a very gray area within Kuzan's morality at this moment, as I believe Garp saying this to him senses that even Kuzan is unsure of his own actions joining the crew that's so evil and twisted. In the One Piece world, there's a societal pressure and outlook of the never-ending war between a marine and a pirate. They're both kind of similar. They both have good and bad people within the two categories. They both sail the seas and fight each other. And they're both conquering different islands and setting up bases. But to be a pirate is a direct sign of war against the world as a whole. It's a symbol of rebellion, hoisting a Jolly Roger to say, I don't want or need any part of the world government strength. So once again, seeing a former Admiral Naokiji becoming a captain for a Yonko crew is quite the dichotomy when we look at how opposing these two ranks are. And another thing about Kuzan deciding to join Blackbeard Pirates is that it would be one thing to join the Straw Hats. But going on the completely opposite spectrum, the Blackbeard Pirates are irredeemable villains. You might think, why would Kuzan want to join the smelliest pirate crew in the seas? But I think I can convince you that Blackbeard is actually the perfect choice and makes perfect sense for Kuzan's character, which we'll get into by the very end. But first, I want to look at the incident that changed Kuzan's entire perspective and worldview. The moment that began this wavering 
conflicting ideology within him, and that is, of course, the Ohara Incident. But before we jump into the importance of the Ohara Incident, subscribe if you're not already. If you enjoy One Piece theories, analysis, and power scaling, this is the channel for you. I'm currently working on a massive Wano review video going through the entire arc, so if that interests you, hit that bell like Luffy and Scott P so you don't miss out when we finally upload the video. The Ohara Incident was the moment where Kuzan began to question his entire ideology and life as a Marine. His big questions being planted here, which would eventually sprout and spiral into his betrayal of the Marines. While it's technically a law, yet a corrupt one and unfair one to not research certain topics like ancient pony glyphs, the Oharans did indeed commit this crime. And to Kuzan at the time, he understood this. While a buster call still seemed a bit over the top, there was still at least a reason for taking out the scholars and branding them as criminals who went directly against the law. But where everything went too far is when his former Marine ally and the other buster called Vice Admirals began killing innocent lives who had nothing to do with the crimes of the Oharans. Instead of seeking justice through evidence in punishing crimes, Sakazuki begins targeting harmless innocent women and children. He slaughters innocent lives, essentially committing a certain G word that YouTube demonetizes. Wait a minute! He was watching in real time the horrifying extinction of the Oharans. Kuzan, while looking at the destruction and chaos surrounding him, this extreme action of Sakazuki, all he could really think of was, this is way too much, it's going too far. This is not justice. The Ohara incident is where Kuzan began to completely lose his mind. It's that moment where he began to question what is right and what is wrong, and whether he was fighting alongside good or evil. The Ohara incident was the moment where the Marines failed their prodigy as he could never see the organization the same way after. I mean, just look at the shock and disgust on Kuzan's face. Oda does a great job of showing the emotion of shock through facial expression, and that's exactly what's drawn here. His entire reality and perception of justice just completely shifted. It completely flipped dramatically to the point where he allowed Nico Robin to escape, attempting to make up for the disgusting actions of Sakazuki. And this view of absolute and thorough justice. The irony of all of it is that Kuzan's justice was once a fired up and burning justice as his spirit burned with passion for the Marines. But the psychological and moral question within Kuzan that's constantly evolving over time is what makes him so interesting. Someone who started as a typical garb stand, but slowly forming into someone who holds a nasty view of the marines in his heart. Kuzan goes against his orders of capturing and defeating the fugitive and traitor Jack Gordy Sao, and then again with Nico Robin, allowing them to survive simply because Sao was his friend, and he bluffs and puts up a great facade. I think one reason why so many people believe Kuzan is not actually a Blackbeard pirate is because he's so great at acting. He seems to flip flop so much, and Oda wrote a character where it's so hard to know where he really lies. And I think it's so impressive how Oda puzzled the entire One Piece fan base and to never really knowing what's going on with Kuzan's character. One more thing I do want to quickly mention regarding the Ohara incident is that about a year before it was confirmed, I released an entire video predicting why Kuzan saved Sal and why Sal was still alive after the Ohara incident. This was essentially confirmed during the Egghead arc. The reasoning I had was that Oda never confirmed him to be dead or alive. And since we saw his friend use the Ice Time Capsule attack, my theory was that he preserved his body cryogenically. I mean, if Kuzan was going to help Nico Robin survive, it only makes sense that he would do the same for his own friend. And I've seen some people be even upset about this, as it's essentially another fake out death, which Oda has become infamous for. But I think in the case of this fake out, it still enhanced Nico Robin's backstory, making it a much more tragic and traumatic situation as she watches Sal get frozen alive when he shows up in front of her during the long ring arc, as she remembers how terrifying of a man he can be. Robin's belief of Sal's death still impacted her character character development to become the person she is, and it still makes her smiling with the Straw Hat Pirate so rewarding, as Robin being happy just hits different due to her relationship with Sal. Sal being alive 30 years later didn't take away all the pain and tragedy that Robin had to go through for all those years, making her into the cold-hearted and morbid woman we know and love today. But the main reason why I love Sal surviving, aside from it making sense with the clues Oda left us, is how much more interesting and compelling it is for Kuzan's character. Because this moment turning against the world government's orders for the first time, Time does arguably more for Kuzan's character than even Nico Robin, as this was the first moment that we can clearly see Kuzan begin to defy and turn against the so-called justice, a small step which would eventually become something much, much bigger. Right before this, Kuzan says, justice changes shape depending on where one stands, basically saying that everyone has their own view on morality and what justice is, depending on their own values and their own personal experience. And Kuzan continues by saying, that is why I won't judge your justice, but if you're going to interfere with our work, 
work, I cannot ignore that. I really like this mentality once again, saying that he won't judge Sal's views on what's right and wrong. He won't judge your justice, but if you stand in our way, it's hands. A simple man who doesn't want problems, but isn't afraid to get physical if you do want problems. We also saw he allowed Nico, Robin, and Luffy to live. But once Luffy came at him interrupting the Marines' justice, he was ready to fight. There's also a lot of irony in Kuzan being burning justice at the time of the Ohara incident, as Sakazuki is the one burning Ohara down to a crisp. And it's also ironic since Kuzan is the Ice Man. But this will also be the last day that Kuzan will follow this burning or fired up justice, as he would do a complete 180 as he would now represent lazy justice. Now when I look at Kuzan's lazy justice, it does seem that Kuzan is using this as an excuse to live how he wants while still working for the Marines. It gives him a bit more freedom, and we could also view this as a representation of Kuzan simply becoming lazier over time, as he continued to keep losing faith in the Marines. The more he questioned the Marines justice, the lazier or more disobedient he would become. It's obviously not completely true laziness at its core of his personality or nature, as we saw from one time he was burning justice, which is the complete opposite, showing us a time when Kuzan was fully bought into the Marines, and he had this burning spirit, showing no signs of laziness, especially when it came to justice. Another line that I really liked from the Ohara incident was when Kuzan tells Robin, sometimes the idea of justice can turn people mad, as it seems he's referring to a few different things here. First, Kuzan is obviously referring to himself as he continues his statement by explaining how and why he'll help Robin to escape from the island. It's once again reinforcing that this incident truly drove this dude to lose his mind, and seeking justice pushed him to question his entire ideology and do something that seems crazy to the other marines at the Buster Call, since he's helping Robin and they're blowing up her island. But then the other two people who are obviously gone mad through seeking justice is everyone that's helping in the Ohara incident, everyone partaking in this event, but specifically owning in on Sakazuki, as he's clearly the most unhinged lunatic craving justice, salivating for the pure extreme form of absolute and thorough justice, driving him to not only eradicate only evil criminals, but even potential criminals. And this idea that we should destroy evil at its very root, no matter if you have to attack innocent lives or your own friends and allies, as long as it's all in the name of justice, as long as we never give evil a chance to rise, and those who are innocent are worth losing in the crossfire. This is obviously a very insane take on justice, but paralleling Kuzan to Sakazuki, this quote of justice turning people mad is poetic in the end, as it's justice that ultimately drives both these characters to crazy actions. Another little detail I want to point out that's actually hilarious is how stupid these marines are. I mean, Kuzan just walks over, creates an ice path for Nico Robin to follow as she escapes, and then you have even one of the marines say, hey, it's almost like our rudder is frozen. We couldn't move the ship when we try to go after the girl escaping from the frozen ice pad. Why you literally have an ice man sitting right next to you. This guy can freeze an entire lake and just froze a vice admiral. Like, bruh, you know, I always found this comically stupid behavior from the random fodder marines just so damn funny. And then Saint Goku's just dead silent in his office sitting there listening to this. Just staring at Kuzan like, it was obviously you, buddy. You helped her escape. But you know what? I'll let it slide. Because at the end of the day, it is an innocent little girl. I mean, of course, me, the Golden Buddha, has a soft spot for children. And Kuzan and Sengoku are basically just side-eyeing each other, staying silent as possible, like, don't say a word. But yeah, these Marines, they're just straight dummies. We know that Kuzan owed Garp a great favor or debt, which he brought up multiple times during a post time skit. The first time he mentions this is in chapter 319, where he tells Luffy, You're just like your gramps, you're wild and have no self control. I owed a great favor to your grandfather from a long time ago. I came to see you and Nico Robin. And then again in chapter 566 during Marine Fort, where he brings it up to Luffy once again, saying, I owed your grandfather a great debt, but you leave me no choice. You chose this path. And now stay with me because you'll understand why I'm connecting Ohara to this favor soon enough. But what could this favor or lifelong debt be? Well, I have two answers actually. The first obvious fact is that Kuzan simply respects Garp and has personal connection to him, which is why he doesn't want to harm Luffy as Garp is someone close to him, and therefore so is Luffy. But after chapter 1087, it seems this debt that he owes Garp would simply be the death of Garp taking in Kuzan and training him. Because after all, we see Garp very begrudgingly take him under his wing and train him even though he never even wanted to. 
We even see Gar barking at him like the dog that he is, telling him to F off and stop trying to steal his precious freedom. But over time, we see Garb finally respect Kuzan and train side by side with a young marine who looked up to him. And training with Garb was obviously a key factor in Kuzan becoming a person that he is now. Being able to go head to head against someone as ruthless and powerful as Sakazuki in a 10 day battle for Fleet Admiral and also molding his character traits as well. His favorite that he owes Garb could simply be him wanting to repeat Garb in some way for taking him under his wing when Garb didn't want to. And I also love the character development for Garb's character through Kuzan as we see he becomes older and wiser as he values the youth and potential of Kobe and the future marines, training them and telling them to sacrifice an old man for the young child. But it's very likely that Kuzan was the one who gave Garb the different perspective on the youth in the first place, as Garb saw Kuzan bloom, becoming an admiral and skyrocketing through the ring after his direct influence. But despite this maybe being the obvious answer, I actually think the death and favor is a lot deeper than just this. Because so far in the One Piece story, we've only seen Kuzan bring up this death during the pre time skip. And you would think that while fighting Garb, this would be brought up specifically at least once by Kuzan and not just in this little vague training flashback way. And so I think it goes deeper into Kuzan's wavering nature as the reason this favor was never brought up in the post time skip is because it has a bigger significance to Kuzan as a marine and doesn't really hold the same weight anymore as a pirate. Alright, so let's jump balls deep into this favor and why it may have been so important to Kuzan while he was still a marine and why it ties back to the Ohara incident because that day marked the moment that Kuzan began to question everything. He is questioning why am I a marine? Is the justice I'm fighting for really righteous? And so Kuzan's faith in the marines had dwindled but this is where Garb comes in. I explained earlier the many reasons that Kuzan looked up to Garb and I believe that somehow Garb single-handedly restored Kuzan's faith in the marines. I believe Garb through being this giga chad all my like character saved him. I mean after all he is the hero and what kind of hero would he be if he couldn't save Kuzan his own protege. So that is the favor and death that Kuzan speaks of. The ultimate favor being that without Garb being this role model and ultimate example of what a marine is, Kuzan may have left the marines a long long time ago. Thinking back to when we see Kuzan meet Luffy, of course he allows him to survive. Not only has Luffy joined up with Robin, but he's also the grandson of the man who saved him from his lowest moments of self-doubt. Like Vegapunk said to Dragon, not everyone in the marines is bad. There's some good people, and I'm sure he was referencing Garb here as we know Garb is his father. In this corrupted and horrible organization who's committed atrocities and despicable acts, it's people like Garb who hold up a precedent of greatness, a standard of hope and true justice within the organization. And so I do believe that Garb saved Kuzan from fully losing faith in the marines. Garb obviously couldn't save him in the end and it was only temporary, but for that time when Kuzan remained a marine, it was the most valuable thing. And this is why Kuzan doesn't bring it up when they face in the post time skip because now Kuzan is like Darth Vader, someone who Garb seemingly saved and ultimately Kuzan would join the darkness of the Blackbeard pirates in his lowest moments. It would be almost disrespectful to Garb to bring this up now, as it would be like spitting in the face of Garb as the hero. And so it's even more interesting when you consider that Luffy is just like a spitting image of Garb who's a pirate version of him. And so maybe Luffy also impacted Kuzan to say, maybe not all pirates are really that evil. Alright, so what I'm going to explain now is a deep theory regarding Kuzan, which will absolutely blow your mind. Because once I put these pieces together, I was shocked at how crazy this theory actually is. You see, I believe that Kuzan pulled the strings to manipulate the destruction of Ina's lobby. Now, I know some of you might think that Luffy is a terrorist thanks to Hassan. Luffy is a terrorist. But I think we might have to take a look at Kuzan's actions because this dude has some explaining to do. And the main point of this entire theory that I want you to keep in the back of your mind is that it coexists with this entire analysis because I believe that Kuzan was already planning on becoming a pirate, already betraying the Marines, even years before the post time skip. I think it was something that was lingering in his head for a while and I think this theory proves that. So we find out from Spandom that Kuzan was the one who gave him the golden snail, which when used gives the power to enact a buster call. Right off the bat, that's really suspicious because why on earth would you trust this guy the with the power to initiate that? a buster call? But what if I told you that Kuzan manipulated Spandom into his plan of blowing up Ina's lobby, one of the top three most important military bases? You see, Kuzan knew about Spandom's power tripping tendencies, his unhinged nature. So playing 4D chess, Kuzan was essentially able to trick Spandom into doing his dirty work while keeping his own hands 100% clean. I don't know if this classifies as terrorism, but it's definitely Kuzan betraying his own government and causing mayhem and destruction on the judicial island. And now let me lay out the evidence because it goes deep. If we go back to the end of Long Ring, Kuzan acknowledges Luffy and the Straw Hat crew nearing Water 7. In chapter 321, Kuzan says, oh my, they'll be close to headquarters, referencing the Straw Hats going to Water 7. So what if Kuzan went to Ina's lobby at their Long Ring and gave Spanum the Golden Snail, or did 
anything a possibility that Luffy would charge into Ina's lobby to save Nico Robin. Spandit may have told him about his plan to bring her back to Ina's lobby and have her finally captured. And what's absolutely mind blowing about all of this is that we would eventually see in chapter 382, Spandit say that the wind began blowing my way. Right when I was running out of patience and about to take drastic measures of my own, that was when I got good news from Admiral Aokiji. Nico Robin was on a pirate ship heading to Water 7. To calm myself down, I had a coffee and then planned out the entire thing, including approval for a buster call. We would then find out that only an admiral or higher could approve the golden snail and have authority over the buster call. So essentially, it was Kuzan who allowed Spanum to have this power. Now you might say, maybe Kuzan just wanted to give Spanum the buster call so that Luffy and Robin could be defeated without bearing their responsibilities since he's lazy and they're still dangerous criminals. But we know for a fact that isn't really true. We already know Kuzan's true feelings on Robin, Luffy, and the Straw Hats because right before Water 7 and towards the very end, we see Kuzan allow Robin and Luffy to escape both times. The first time was at Long Ring and then again at the very end of Water 7, we see Kuzan talking to Robin and letting them escape. Kuzan says, I never expected the Straw Hats would defeat CP9. I had intended Ina's lobby to be the end of Ohara. And somehow this all gets even more crazy because one thing that you may not remember is that Kuzan was there at Ina's lobby the entire time and he never helped the Marines even once. As the Straw Hats escape the Buster Call and defeat CP9 in chapter 439, they're escaping the remaining Marines at Ina's lobby. In chapter 439, we see Kuzan on his ice bike and one Marine says, Aokiji, I didn't know you were here. And Kuzan's silent as he has no excuse for the fact that he just witnessed an entire Buster Call, an entire field operation and he didn't even help them at all. He could have taken the entire Straw Hat crew on his own and he didn't even move a finger. And Kuzan doesn't even look upset. He's not disappointed in the Marines taking a huge out. He isn't upset at the judicial island being up in flames. No, instead, Kuzan with an emotionless stare says, looking at this fleet and the island, it's obvious for us. The incident was a complete and utter defeat. Instead of going after the Straw Hats, Kuzan allows Robin to escape once again, honoring Sao and Ohara. So was Kuzan just straight capping when he said that he was ready for Robin? Robin to die there at Ohara? Or was he there just in case that he needed to save her once again? I mean, who knows, but I really do think that it was Kuzan who took advantage of Spandam who even described himself as someone extremely desperate. Someone at the breaking point who was ready to take a drastic action and make insane calls like Buster calling his own military base. And taking advantage of someone this down bad and crazy, Kuzan through the shadows manipulated the world government into destroying in his lobby and didn't even help the marines once throughout the entire event. He just sat there, watching and enjoy the entire show. And when you put this entire idea into context, it changes your entire perspective of the Water 7 arc. This makes the ending of Ina's lobby even more poetic and compelling because the entire story of Robin and Kuzan began with the moment the Admiral began to question the world government organization as a whole, as they witnessed the previous Buster Call with Ohara burning into flames. Now all of this is also insane when you consider the context of Kuzan being someone who would end up betraying the Marines and becoming a pirate of the Blackbeard Pirates. But what I love about this theory is that if it's true, it shows that Kuzan's fall into piracy and betrayal of the Marines started way before. It shows that his heart was always swaying and wavering. And going back to the mystery of the favor being how Garb was the last remaining faith that he had in the Marines, it's also just a perfect ending to the entire Water 7 saga with Kuzan catching a ride with Garb, who represents the good and faith he has in the Marines after he just schemed up a disastrous loss for the entire organization. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you why I believe Kuzan has the will of D, and it will lead us into his relationship with Black which is extremely important to his character. But first, if you want to support us directly, the best way is by liking the video. But if you want to go above and beyond, you can leave a super thanks donation in the comments. It all goes back into the channel to give you the best possible videos. We use all the money made through super thanks to pay for editors, thumbnails, and we're very grateful as donations like these allow us to do YouTube full time and to make big videos like this on a more consistent basis. So, is it possible that Kuzan has the will of D? Could Kuzan be someone who follows the checker fate as the go to say speculate that Sabo is a D member as well. Well, I've been promoting the theory that Kuzan has the will of D for years now, and it's a very similar reason to why the Gorose believe that for Sabo. Because we see that Kuzan is tied by fate to Marshall D. Teach, Monkey D. Garp, and Jaguar D. Sal. So we can apply the exact same logic that the Gorose used for Sabo on Kuzan. It would make sense for Kuzan to be a D member as someone who never fully bought into the ways of the corrupt world government. Someone who has these personal connections and bonds to the will of D members. And with Kuzan Kuzan's full name never being revealed, it makes you wonder if Kuzan is Marshall D. Kuzan, a long lost cousin of Blackbeard, or maybe another family name completely. It's also possible if Kuzan is simply someone who follows the checkered fate that he could become a D member through Blackbeard or Garp, as it 
seems that Lily became one and maybe even Sabo. We've dropped a video on this channel previously where Wizard of Wars goes into why he believes that Kuzan is related to Marshall D. Teach. So I'll leave a link to that video in the description. It goes into the connection of how they both have an interest in the pony glyphs and Ohara. But Blackbeard being someone who Oda describes as a history buff, someone intrigued in the ancient world, as Oda even once stated that if Blackbeard existed in our world, he'd be an archaeologist. And of course, when you think of archaeology in One Piece, you think of Ohara. So let's go back to chapter 699 now. This is the chapter where Kuzan shows up at Punk Hazard and saves his friend Smoker from Doflamingo. In this chapter, Dofi asks Kuzan, where do you stand? Just what are you now? He's no simple wanderer. Only a man who's made up his mind about something can make a face like that. Okay, so I know Dofi isn't the most trustworthy source since he's completely insane, but I like to think that Oda is using Dofi's many connections and a very smart evil mind to hint that Kuzan has truly set his mind on the Blackbeard Pirates. If we assume that Dofi is correct, and this means that Kuzan has finally made up his mind and believes that he can achieve his goals and dreams by working with the Blackbeard Pirates. In other words, Blackbeard convinced Kuzan to join his crew by explaining how similarly to Luffy's crewmates all having their own goals, by joining together they'll help each other achieve their dreams. For example, like with Nico Robin, by joining Luffy she can now reach Laugh Tale and discover the One Piece, the Pony Glyphs, and the Void Century. And same with Nami's dream of circumnavigating the entire world and mapping it. So Blackbeard is saying chasing our dreams. That is what it means to be a pirate. And if you join us, we'll help each other achieve what we all see. So when Dofi says only a man who's made up his mind can make a face like that, I think Kuzan genuinely is a Blackbeard pirate because I know he's drunk, but speaking to Blackbeard, this is the first time we ever seen Kuzan really genuinely laugh, revealing his goofy laugh to be a da ha ha. I know it's hard to imagine, but similarly to Luffy, Blackbeard does have this charisma, this certain charm about him, cheering up Kuzan after he's mourning his loss in a sad state. When you think of true pirates in One Piece, Luffy, Blackbeard, and Roger come to mind. Blackbeard defines what it means to be a pirate and so it's hard to ignore Blackbeard's ambition and boldness inviting a former admiral to his crew. Similar to how Luffy says we don't care about the past to Kuzan when defending Robin as this backstabbing criminal at long range. And now jumping back to Bunk Hazard real quick, Kuzan tells Smoker I never thought the world government was the end all be all. Oda also establishes that Kuzan and Smoker are close friends and that they trust each other as he brings up how Smoker told him about Luffy and the Straw Hats being the ones who actually saved Alabasta and not the Marines. So we have to assume that Kuzan isn't lying here and being 100% genuine with his old marine friend. Kuzan goes on and says, you don't have to be affiliated to the marines to accomplish things in the world. And there are some things that you can only see when you remain independent. I think this goes into Kuzan's curiosity that he's always had for researching pony glyphs ever since Ohara. What about this mysterious indestructible rock with the mysterious language and message strikes so much fear into the world government that they have to burn down Ohara and demonize pony glyph research? Kuzan is telling Smoker he chose this path specifically specifically because he has goals, aspirations, and dreams of his own, just like Blackbeard said to him when convincing him to join his crew. As a pirate teaming up with Blackbeard, together they can search the entire world for pony glyphs and other historical mysteries. And I do think it's one reason for him wanting to join the Blackbeard pirates, but I also think he has one main goal, one much bigger and more specific to his character. Kuzan believes that justice changes depending on where you stand. And so I believe Kuzan's dream was to become Fleet Admiral and change the Marines as a whole, which represent justice. Okay, so I know this sounds crazy since many people think that Kuzan didn't even want to be Fleet Admiral in the first place. But I don't think it's that straightforward. The main argument people have for this is because Kuzan is lazy so he wouldn't want to deal with all the politics and paperwork like Naruto dealing with the tedious tax when he becomes Hokage. But as I've explained earlier, Kuzan isn't necessarily pure laziness. He instead uses laziness as an excuse to do as he pleases and avoids doing orders that he disagrees with. Kuzan was so mentally broken by his defeat from Sakazuki, drinking away the pain. And mind you, this was one full year after his loss to Sakazuki at Punk Hazard, showing us that Kuzan's been in a full state of mourning for a full year. And sure, yeah, he's upset because he lost a leg, he's upset because he lost to his rival in the Marines, he's upset that Akainu is the one that gets to lead the Marines despite being a complete extremist. But most of all, I believe Kuzan is so heartbroken because he lost his chance to seize his own dream after working all these years as Garp's golden child. Garp was someone who never wanted to even be an admiral, and Kuzan while admiring this was someone with great goals and ambitions to move up the ring 
Lightning says he was already an admiral. The thing I find really interesting is that when Jinbei was telling Luffy the story about Kuzan and Sakazuki's 10 day battle at Punk Hazard, he says, As you know, Kuzan tends to be a lazy man, but in this instance, he was furious and opposed the idea of Akainu becoming fleet admiral. And basically, Sengoku and I'm assuming also Garp are nominating and pushing for Kuzan to become fleet admiral. But there was another side within the government who wanted Sakazuki, and we know they were both passionate about this fight because they both fundamentally believed that they could make a serious change to the Marines and the type of justice by gaining the highest authority within the Marines. Jinbei continues on to say, under Sakazuki, the Marines have become more powerful and determined than ever before. So there is this element of change and influence that the fleet admiral has on the Marines as Akainu's Marines are way more aggressive than Sengoku. It was Akainu who decided to go into charge into the New World and set up their base in the New World. And there is some pushback that Kuzan and Sakazuki may have not have foreseen. For example, like the Godose being the ultimate head of the world government and having even more control and say than Akainu and Kuzan expected. We see this when Akainu begins an argument with the Godose over power and they just straight up bully Akainu saying we're the big bosses, we pull the strings from the shadows, we control what the world government does. We control everything at the end of the day. But in a more idealistic view, I do think that Kuzan and Akainu did believe at some point that they could change the entire marines. And I also love how Jinbei is telling Luffy this story of the two admirals and he concludes Sakazuki's story by becoming fleet admiral. But then slides in the Blackbeard Pirates right after, foreshadowing all the way back then that Kuzan was now a member of the Blackbeard Pirates as this was how Kuzan's story ended. I mean, Jinbei even says, who knows where Kuzan is now and how he feels, before giving us the answer in the very next page. Ah, I see. Now, the reason I needed to explain all of this about Kuzan and Sakazuki's dreams and why they were both always wanting to become Fleet Admiral is because it's important to Blackbeard and Kuzan and their agenda coming together. We know Blackbeard wants to make Hachinosu a pirate kingdom, but a pirate kingdom under the world government. I've explained in many videos why I believe Blackbeard and Luffy share the same dream to create a pirate kingdom. In chapter 1080, Kobe replies to Blackbeard saying, that's ridiculous. You know the world government would never allow it, a kingdom of criminals and pirates? But Blackbeard replies with, now don't don't go trampling on a man's dream. And so assuming this really is Blackbeard's dream, we have to also think about what Shanks told Whitebeard about Blackbeard's endless ambition and how he is someone who's never satisfied, someone who's always seeking more. I believe this pirate kingdom is simply a stepping stone, making him king of the pirates as he will be the king of Pirate Island, really cheating his way into that title. But Blackbeard will eventually strive for something even greater, which is the king of the entire world. I already explained in the previous video how Blackbeard will conquer the world and strive for the throne, similarly paralleling Rocksteed's ability if Luffy is a parallel to Roger. And Wizard of Wars also predicted that Blackbeard's ambition is to be an actual ruler of a kingdom in a previous video on our channel. And now we know that it's definitely true, contrasting to Luffy who just wants to be the freest man. And so assuming Blackbeard achieves his goal, this aligns alongside Kuzan as if Blackbeard conquered the entire world government, he would have a powerful army of marines under his rulership. But this is where Kuzan comes in, because if Kuzan's greatest dream is to become a fleet admiral, if he helps Blackbeard overthrow the world government as a pirate, Blackbeard would then put Kuzan in charge of his new military, these new marines, making Kuzan able to mold the marines to his liking. Instead of the Godose and Emu at the top, the Blackbeard pirates will take their place as the ultimate rulers of the world. But since Kuzan is on good terms with his captain, he more likely to shape the marines to his ideal version. Now of course, Blackbeard is someone who's betrayed people before, attacking Whitebeard and then Thatch, his former crewmate and his former father who adopted him. So Kuzan really does need to be careful as it's possible Blackbeard could just backstab Kuzan in the end. But I think this is how how Kuzan and Blackbeard's dreams coexist and why he was convinced to join Teach as they can help each other both achieve their ultimate agendas, creating this new empire of pirates and learning the truth of the world's biggest secrets and mysteries that the world government has always kept hidden, like the One Piece, the Void Century, and discovering the pony glyphs. And so I hope you can finally understand why I love Kuzan so much, why I think he's really the most compelling character in One Piece. And as we see him fighting Garp in this final finale of the Hachinosu event, it almost seems like he's crying and freezing his tears as he stabs Garp with his ice spear. But as the Vader of the One Piece world, a failed chosen one, someone who's been convinced to join evil pirates, it's also possible that Kuzan's the one who backstabs Teach in the end and redeems himself. So is Kuzan a marine? Is he a pirate? I hope you now understand why I say that Kuzan is the only character in One Piece who is genuinely bold. If you made it to the end of this video and you're somehow still in the mood for even more One Piece theories, click right here for my best theory video where we discovered Oda's secret favorite anime which inspired One Piece. And after watching this anime myself, I was able to solve the Void Century, the Ancient Kingdom mysteries, and so much more.